Well, hello and welcome to the OTR Visual Radio Show. I'm Mr. H and I'll be your host for this compilation. Today we're featuring a special compilation. It's a little different than most of the shows. It's Ranger Bill. Now this was a Christian radio program produced in the 1950s and it was made by Moody Radio. Myron Kennedy stars as Ranger Bill, follows the adventures of Bill, Stumpy Jenkins, Grey Wolf, and Henry Scott. Bill is a forest ranger in the city of Naughty Pine, fighting the enemies of nature. And he does all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Now, this is a fun show for families, especially if you have kids that you want to introduce to old time radio. It's got a lot of action and teaches good Bible and moral lessons. But just before we get into the action, I want to mention that Hearth and Home Entertainment is not an ad supported channel. While YouTube is free, it does take a lot of time and money to keep a channel like this going. So we really appreciate your support help keep us on YouTube. If you would, take a minute to check out the links in the description below. Check out coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. And many of you have asked about using PayPal and coffee.com. The first option would be the best for you. Another great way you can support the channel is to check out the Hearth and Home Shop on Etsy. I've got a link for that down below as well. There you'll find a great assortment of old time radio themed goodies and maybe a Bigfoot shirt or two. Now, without any further ado, let's get on with the program. It's time to sit back and relax and enjoy Ranger Bill. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Fellows and girls, have you ever been tested or challenged because of your stand for Christ? Do you think you could stand up under real persecution fire? Of course, that's a question that can only be answered by each individual. It's a question that Ted Sloan had to answer. Could he take all the ribbing and ridicule that was handed to him because he made a solid stand for the Lord? Or would he collapse under it and ruin his witness? Listen to the story... If the Lord is for us, who can be against us? Right now, Ted's at Ranger headquarters visiting Henry. Ted is home on furlough from the Army. He and Henry are talking over old times together. Let's drop over and find out what the two young fellows are chatting about. Boy, oh boy, you sure look sharp in your uniform, Ted. <laughs> well, Henry, I... I can't wear Sloppy Joe's sweaters anymore like I used to. Well, how does it feel to be home? Oh, just wonderful. Nice to walk around all the old places again and think of the good old days. Hey, Bill, you're just in time. Look who's here. Well, as I live and breathe, Ted Sloan. How are you, Ted? <laughs> just fine, Bill. How's yourself? Oh, great. How's army life? Oh, it's so-and-so. Some of it's good and some not so good. <laughs> That's the way I found it, too, Ted. Oh, didn't know you were in the service, Bill. Yeah, almost four years. <laughs> That's funny. I took it for granted that you were always a ranger, I guess. Well, Bill was a Navy medic, Ted. He spent a lot of time on detached duty with the Marines. Well, how about that? A fellow learns something new every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Ted. Say, I've got to unsaddle Storm and bed him down for the night. I'll be back to chin with you fellas in about 15 minutes. Hey, Bill. Hmm? What do you say I call Mom and find out if she's got an extra plate for supper tonight? Yeah, good idea, Henry. You get the car out while I take care of Storm, will you? Then we'll spend the evening around the fire and swap stories. Boy, I'm for that 100%. Be just like old times. Ah, now for my favorite chair by the fire. Put on my slippers and relax. Yeah, me too. Well, grab an easy chair, Ted. <laughs> Got it all picked out already, Henry. Oh. Well, did you have a rough day on the trail, Bill? Oh, it wasn't too bad. Snow's not deep enough yet. Storm threw a shoe and I had to stop at the line and fix it. <laughs> Old Storm can wear the head off of a horseshoe nail quicker than any horse I've ever snored. Yeah, he really pounds them all right, pal. Well, the whole wide world to talk about. Here we sit. I got something to talk about, fellas. Oh, yeah? Hmm? What? 
Me? You? Yes. Bill, when I find out you were in the service, I, I think it was an answer to prayer. Mm, is that right, Ted? In what way? Because I need some spiritual counseling. Well, Ted, what's happened? Yeah, you were always pretty solid spiritually, Ted. Yes, I was, Henry, until I went in the army. Oh? Don't blame the service for decreasing your spiritual power, Ted. That's up to you. I don't know, as I agree with you, Bill. Why not? Well, the persecution and the ribbing I get is pretty hard to take, especially after it goes on for some time. Well, I went through a lot of the same persecution and ribbing myself, Tim. You did? Sure. How can any Christian expect to escape? The Lord was persecuted and made the butt of many jokes, even when he died on the cross. So were the disciples and apostles and the great leaders of the church. Well, I understand all that, but I guess I'm not as strong as they were. Ah, but you have the Lord's strength to draw from, Ted. Not your own. You know, as Paul wrote to young Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I don't think the Lord would test you beyond what you're able to stand, Ted. That's right. What you need is a Christian buddy in the army to have fellowship with. Christians strengthen each other in times of testing. It's all very well for you fellows to quote scripture and give counsel, but you're not going through the same thing I am. Ah, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have blown up like that. That's all right, Tim. Let's get down to specifics, huh? Well, what exactly is your trouble? It's this way. If only my sergeant would lay off just once in a while. That's all I ask. Yeah, I got a tough sergeant, huh? <laughs> tough. That's not the word for it. I had somewhat the same experience. You did? Mm hmm. What did you do? Want to hear about it? Sure. Tell me about it, Bill. It, it might help me. All right. Let me begin at the beginning. We were in the shooting war, hot and heavy, as I finished college. After some deliberation as to which branch of the service I wanted to enter, I picked the Navy. They decided I'd better talk it over with my father. When I got home, I went into the library to have a chat with Dad. He was expecting it. Among other things, had this advice for me. Well, son, in the service, you're going to be tested and tried because of your stand for Christ. But no matter how tough the ridicule gets... Don't be another Peter. Don't deny your Lord. Remember, son, the persecution that you might go through is only a little of what the Lord endured. Be strong in him. Trust the Lord to give you all the strength you need. Thanks, Dad. I'll try. <laughs> Dad was killed in a forest fire six months later. But his words kept ringing in my ears, as they do to this very day. Dad was right. In about a week, I was on my way to boot camp. What a terrific change in my life that was. But with the Lord's help, I was able to make some kind of mature adjustment to Navy life. Those first weeks were almost nightmarish. There wasn't one minute you could call your own. All right, you land lovers, hit the deck. Oh, Come on, rise and shine. Oh, Come on, oh, Mac, roll out of this sack. You're not home now. Stone. Yeah. Tompkins. Yeah. Rakowski. Yeah. Yantis. Yeah. Zimmerman. Yeah. All right, let's go to breakfast. Change. <laughs> Company! Ha! You men will go to the barber shop four at a time. Regulation haircut is half an inch, no longer. Company! Ha! Starting with the first column, you go in single file and get your uniforms. Ha! 
first couple of days were so rough that I was sound asleep before my head ever touched my mattress cover. After about a week, the pace slowed down a little, and I decided it was time to get back into my habitual routine of having devotions before going to bed. I'll never forget the first time the fellas noticed me sitting on the edge of my bunk reading my Bible. Uh, what are you reading, Bill? Yeah, let me see. Hey, Stoney, take it easy. That's my Bible. Watch it. You'll tear the pages. Bible? Yeah. Huh. Anything funny about that? <laughs> I read it every night at home, and I'm going to do it here. Uh, how about that? A Bible, huh? Hey, will you give me that Bible back, Stoney, or do I have to... Ah, uh, here it is. How about preaching a sermon for us, yeah. huh? Yeah, maybe I'll take the chaplain's place on Sunday morning. <laughs> All right, don't act so innocent. I can hear the racket for a mile. Who started it? I did, Boats. You did, Jefferson? How come? I decided to get back into my habit of reading my Bible before hitting the sack. The fellas are kind of... Kidding me. Yeah, it's All right, knock it off. Right, look. look, if Jefferson wants to read his Bible, what business is that of yours? One more sound out of your lovers and you'll walk post with a full sea bag. Is that understood? All right, lights out. There's taps. I was used to ridicule because I went through quite a bit of it in college. However, the Lord strengthened me because I knelt down to pray as taps were blowing and not one word was said. Not that it would have made any difference. Eventually, I received my final orders as a Navy medic assigned to the Marine base at New River, North Carolina. New River was cut right out of the heart of the Carolina swamp. I'll never forget the moment I stepped off the bus in front of the main gate. I was with Bert Marshall. Oh, what in the world do you suppose this place is, Bill? <laughs> Training ground for the Fleet Marine Force, Bert. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> guess we might as well walk in. Yeah, there's nothing else we can do right now. Let's ask the sergeant where we go. You mean that bulldog marine standing over there? No, he's probably not as tough as he looks. Bark is worse than his bite. Maybe so, Bill. Well, let's find out. Hey, Sarge! Yeah? What do you want, swap jockeys? Where can we find A Company Medical Battalion? Right where it always is. Use your feet like the Marines do. Well, we're new here, Sarge. This is a big place. We'd appreciate some direction. I've been walking since the first day in the Marine Corps, and you can do the same. Sir. Listen, Sergeant, we asked you a civil question. We expect a civil answer. You don't have to pull your rank on us. Ah, a scrappy swab, yeah? Well, follow your nose down this street to the first corner. Turn left. There's a big sign. You can't miss it. Thanks, Sergeant. Let's go, Bert. <laughs> That fellow was my platoon sergeant. Only I didn't know it then. We reported in at A Company Medical Battalion headquarters. I was assigned to B Company and Bert was sent to C Company. The sergeant's name was Clarence Donovan. The fellows called him Buck. The next morning, I ran into Buck. He came into the sick bay for treatment of a deep scratch he got from a shelf. Well, if it ain't the pill pusher I met on the road. Yeah, I'm the fella. What can I do for you, Sarge? Uh, guess, Mom, and a shell case. Have you got any bug killer? Sure, lots of it. Yeah, let's take a look. Okay, but take it easy. It's kind of tender. Yeah, I guess it would be all right. Uh, hold still now. It'll only take a minute. Is that stuff going to burn? Oh, it'll bite some. Won't kill you. Hold still now. Sting? Ah, it's got to be worse than that to make me holler. That's okay. I'll tape this gauze pad on. You'll be all set. Say, is that a Bible I see sitting over there on your bunk, Swabby? Huh? Oh, yeah. 
Why? Don't tell me you're one of them religious birds. I'm not a religious bird. I'm a Christian. <laughs> I suppose you think you get to heaven by reading your Bible. The only way I know of getting to heaven, Sarge, is through the saving power of Christ. Huh? Huh. Say, you should have been a preacher. <laughs> How do you figure that? Because no Sunday school teacher ought to be in the Marines. This is a man's outfit. Well, if you think I'm not a man, I'll gladly put the gloves on with you or meet you any other way you want. Hmm. Tough, huh? Well, it's my guess that in about a week you'll be asking for a transfer. Huh? How come? Because I don't want no religious lilies in my platoons. And who's a religious lily? You! And everybody like you. Now you'll find out about that. I sure will. I don't like the way you work, Jefferson. Before I get through with you, you'll be so tired, you won't be able to see straight. To say nothing about reading the, the good book. <laughs> this is a man's outfit, see? They were no idle threats. I trained right with the Marines. Did everything they did. Crawled in the mud. Got my mouth full of sand more than once. Fired the same weapons. But more than that, I got some personalized attention from Sergeant Donner. What's the matter with you, Jefferson? You couldn't hit the side of a barn with a cannon. Well, I only missed the bullseye twice. That ain't good enough. Not for a preacher. You stay here until you hit it every time. Hey, Swabby. Come back here and climb this wall, you hear? Right, climbed it twice already. You did, eh? Sunday school boys have to climb it three times. Let me see your rifle, Jefferson. It's clean, isn't it? Yeah. But it ain't clean enough, see? Clean it again. Bill, the fellows have teased you a lot about your being a Christian, but, well, deep down in our hearts, we respect and admire you. Thanks, Cliff. I appreciate your kind remarks. Well, that is no, Bill. You never complain when you have to get up in the middle of the night to take care of us when we're sick. Well, thanks to you, too, Monty. Why all the flowers? I'm only doing my job. Well, that's just it. You're doing a good job, and we're sick and tired of watching the Sarge push you around. Yeah, the way he takes after you is criminal. You ought to turn him into the old man. Well, I appreciate how you feel, fellas, but I don't think turning him into the major would help. And I wouldn't do it anyway. Well, it's up to you, but... We think you should turn him in. If you don't, maybe somebody else will. The compliments the fellas paid me was the Lord's way of bolstering my strength. And Monty and Cliff weren't joking about turning Buck in to the company commander. The next afternoon, Sergeant Donovan was dressed down severely by Major Parks. And I mean the Major Red Buck, the riot act. Sergeant Donovan, I expect you to train these men, not bulldoze them. Yes, sir. I could take all your stripes off your shirt for what you've been doing. You know that. I was only acting in the best interest of the Marine Corps, sir. Is that what you learned in non-commissioned officer school? Did they teach you to persecute those under your command? I'm not persecuting anybody, Major Parks. You'd better not let me catch you doing it, or I'll break you to a private in the laundry platoon. Understand? Yes, sir. Now get back to your duties and don't let this happen again. Yes, sir. Jefferson, I want to talk to you. Certainly, Buck. What's on your mind? Plenty. Not only are you a religious lily, but you're a stool pigeon, too. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. But whatever it is, say it so I'll understand. You don't have the courage to fight like a man. You went to the old man and told him I was picking on you, didn't you? You feeling all right, Buck? Anything I have to say to you, I'll say to your face, not behind your back. Don't lie to me, Jefferson. 
You went to the major and told him I was persecuting you. That's not true. You must have. I just got read off by him. I fight my own battle, Sergeant Donovan. And don't call me a liar. Christians don't lie. <laughs> yeah, you make pretty speeches, don't you? You should have been a preacher. Get this straight, you pill pusher. Nobody goes to the old man and squeals behind my back and gets away with it. I'll get you for this, and legally, too. <laughs> There was one thing about the sergeant, he always meant what he said, and he was out to get me. Buck had a natural talent for making life miserable for somebody else. He changed his tactics, of course, because he knew that the officers and men were watching him closely. He went underground with his persecution. But in a hundred small ways, I felt the pressure. Jefferson, your order for medical supplies got lost. Too bad. I got some mail here for you, preacher. It's a little late. Got mislaid somehow. You ordered some new clothes? That's funny. I never got your order. Sure, you ain't an overnight pass, Jefferson. But you know something? I don't have any more. Fortunately, this didn't last more than a week. Orders came from the regimental command that maneuvers would start the following day. Buck was too busy getting ready for them to think up new ways to make my existence a problem. It was five o'clock on a Tuesday morning. We moved out into the Carolina backcountry to hold simulated battle maneuvers. Buck took his platoon out on the left bank to outmaneuver the make-believe army. Bert and I were ordered to stay at the command post, where we'd be centrally located to take care of make-believe wounded coming from the front line in our sector. At 8 o'clock, the artillery batteries opened up from the rear and laid a creepy barrage that moved ahead of the line. This is our first maneuver under live fire, Bert. What do you think of it? Oh, I think this. I'm glad I'm not the enemy. Listen to those howitzers blast. Yeah. Buck and his boys are flagging right behind that stuff. I don't imagine they're feeling any too chipper. I hope none of those shells fall short. Right. I'd give anything to be with the boys. I don't like being this far away. The barrage is lifting! All right, you guys, let's move out! Marty, take your squad along this trail! Cliff, take the trail to the right! Sandy, your squad follows me, understand? Roger. All set, Buck. I'm right behind you, sir. All right, move! Twenty feet between each man! We meet the company scouts a thousand yards from here! Let's go, Sandy! Watch out for snakes, you guys! This swampland is full of them. Yeah, keep your eyes open. You better give that log a kick before you step over it, son. I know what I'm doing. I can smell a rattler a mile away. Okay, okay. It's your funeral, not mine. Hey, Sarge, the log. Uh, the rattler got me. Oh. Look, Parson, get Jefferson. The Sarge needs help. Okay, I'm on my way. Make it on a double. Don't move or talk, Buck. Just lie quietly till Bill gets you. I've got a tourniquet on. That'll keep the poison from crawling up your leg. Don't release that tourniquet till I tell you, Sandy. Okay, Bill. It's been on 15 minutes. I could stay another five. Even ten if necessary. We can't let the poison circulate through his body. His leg's swelling up fast. No wonder. Buck, I'm going to make some X cuts in the puncture holes with my scalpel. Okay, good. Don't move or wiggle. Just grit your teeth. Here it goes. 
That's one of them. Number two. I'll pull all the poisonous blood out of his leg I can with this suction cup. Hey, Monty, let me know when five minutes are up. Then we'll release the tourniquet so gangrene won't set in. Tourniquet's been open for five minutes, Bill. Okay, snub it tight, Monty. Right. We're taking Buck back to the CP so we can get him to the hospital from there. Well, it's too dark to travel, isn't it? We've got to do it. A buck may die by morning. He's got to have some anti-venom serum injected. But that trail's dangerous at night. Yeah, you can't go now, Bill. No use talking, fellas. Buck's got to go back. Now, a couple of you will put him across my shoulders. I won't let you do it, Bill. I'm in command now that Buck's out of the picture. Well, I appreciate your warnings, Cliff, but... The man is sick and needs medical attention. In this case, my word goes. All right, Bill. I'm going with you. Monty, you're in command while I'm gone. Put him across my shoulders, fellas. That's it. There he goes. There he goes. All right. Okay. Cliff, you break the trail and keep tabs on the time. We'll have to release this tourniquet every 20 minutes. Let me take Buck for a while, will you, Bill? I'm doing all right, Cliff. I'll have to stop and release the tourniquet in a few minutes. Watch your step along the edge of this mock, Bill. I see it, Cliff. Here, let me smell you off, Bill. You can't keep this up forever. Okay, Cliff. We're less than a quarter of a mile to go. I'll make it. There's the post ahead, Bill. Good. We'll put the sergeant in the ambulance and double time into the hospital. Jefferson, front and center. Pharmacist Mate Jefferson reporting, Major Parks. Bill Jefferson, I am this day making part of your record a citation for bravery above and beyond the call of duty and a commendation for excellent performance of duty. I'm also recommending to the senior medical officer that you be promoted. Bill, the doctors tell me that your brave action saved Sergeant Donovan's life. I want to tell you before all these men that I'm proud to have you in my command. Well, I... I... Thank you, Major Parks. And Sergeant Donovan here has asked permission to say a few words to you. Bill, the Major's given me permission to apologize to you before our company for the way I've acted toward you. And thank you for saving my life. How you ever carried me for a mile and a half is more than I'll ever know. You're a far better man than I am. I'm a crude guy, Bill, but as a Marine, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Well, thanks, Buck. I never held anything against you, and I don't now. But I'd like you to understand one thing. Yeah? What's that? Remember how you made me work out two or three times more than the other fellas? <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit it, but I remember. Well, if it hadn't been for all those extra workouts, I'd never have been in shape to carry you the way I did. <laughs> Boy, that was wonderful the way things worked out, wasn't it, Bill? I say it was, Ted. All the time, Buck thought he was hurting you, but what actually really happened was that Buck annoyingly carried out the Lord's plan for him. Well, you hit the nail right on the head, as usual, pal. Well, Ted, 
Does my experience help you in your problem? <laughs> Bill, you, you don't know how much. The Lord knew I needed help, and he sent me home to hear this experience of yours. You mean you're not discouraged anymore, Ted? Oh, I'll say I'm not. If Bill could go through all that and come out on top, then I know I can see my problem through. Perhaps you won't always be able to come home and be encouraged, Ted. What do you do then? But that doesn't worry me now. How come? I know the Lord will always be with me, just like he was with you. I really know now what my whole trouble's been. Yeah? What's that, Ted? I tried to go along in my own power. But from now on, I'm trusting the Lord. Yes, boys and girls, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Maybe that's God's answer to your problem, too. Hope so. See you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. You know, fellows and girls, sometimes we think that mother and dad are just a bit stuffy with their advice and counsel. We even feel that our parents try to take the fun out of life. Well, that's not true. What mom and dad tell us is for our own good. Life would be so much better if we'd listen to what older folks tell us. This is the story about two young fellows who wouldn't listen to experienced advice, and it almost cost them... <laughs> well, say, I'm almost giving the story away. Stick around for a breathtaking story. The End of the Road. Hey, Bill, here's a telegram for you. I came past the Western Union office on the way up here, and Sid stuck it in my hand as I went by. Oh, thanks, pal. Hmm, I wonder what's up. Yeah, maybe his uncle left him his old swayback mule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for his Model T Ford. Uh, bad news, fellas. Well, how bad? My old friend Nathaniel Norton is sending his son Bart and a friend of his out here for a couple of months on a vacation. Uh-oh. And what kind of rascals are these young whippersnappers, Bill? Well, I guess they're well-behaved as far as that goes, Tommy. Well, then we haven't anything to worry about. Perhaps not, but I don't like being responsible for his son and friend. No, I'll keep my eye on them, Bill. Oh, thanks, pal. We've got lots of trail work to do in the next couple of weeks. Uh, when are these youngsters coming, Bill? Tonight. We'll meet them at the station. There's two young tender feet, Sonny. Yeah. They're coming toward us. Yeah, he must be Bart Norton and his friend. Excuse me, sir. Are you Bill Jefferson? Yes. You must be Bartholomew Norton. Yes, I am. Just call me Bart. And this is my friend Jeff Murdoch. How do you do? <laughs> Fine, thank you. I'd like you to meet Henry Scott and Stumpy Jenkins. Oh, hi, Henry. Hi, hey, hey, Stumpy. Hi, Bart. Our station wagon just outside the depot. We'll give you a hand with your luggage. This is a wonderful place you have here, Mr. Jefferson. Thanks, Bart. Uh, just call me Bill. I've never been in a ranger's office before. Oh, is that right? Well, I hope we'll see a lot of you in the next few weeks, Jeff. Say, uh, did you ever see a hoop snake, Sonny? No, Stumpy. What do they look like? Well, uh, they're big, long snakes. They grab a hold of their tail with their mouth and roll down the road like a hoop. 
Oh, go on, Stumpy. That's not true. It ain't, huh? Where do you think they get the name Hoop Snake from? Well, maybe you're right. Sure, that's just like the snake we got out here that milks cows. It's called the milk snake. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not going to swallow that one. <laughs> Why don't you guys lay off? Why, it's like the yarn about the left-handed monkey wrench. Monkey wrench? What in the world are we coming to? I've heard of a cow ranch and a sheep ranch. Never heard of a monkey ranch before. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> All joking aside, though, Bill, I've never seen a left-handed monkey ranch. You haven't? Why, they've got one down at Pete's garage. Can we go look at it? Why, sure. The garage is just a block down the street. Come on, Bart. I want to see that ranch. We'll be back in a few minutes, fellas. <laughs> you got your nerve, Bill Jefferson. If I had to pull that, you'd have turned blue in the face. Well, old timer, it's like you said. We're trying to harden up their tender feet. <laughs> yeah. We'll pick them up at the garage in a couple of minutes and head for home. It's almost supper time. It sure is peaceful and quiet out here. And I could sit on the porch all night and listen to the crickets and Katie Dids. Yeah. The Lord sure knew what he was doing when he created the earth. He knew that man needed time to rest so they'd be fresh for a new day. That's right, sonny. Say, uh, I hope you ain't got no hard feelings about that left-handed monkey wrench. And the hoop snake and the milk snake. <laughs> we had to initiate you fellas into the ways of the West. But Stumpy's right. We hope you haven't taken offense. Oh, no, Bill, we haven't. We expected to have tricks pulled on us. Yeah, this is milder than we expected. Well, I think it's time we hit the hay, fellas. Now, why don't you sleep here tonight, Stumpy? Uh, twist my arm, will you? <laughs> How about Mom's wheat cakes for breakfast? That does it! I'm staying! <laughs> Let's have our devotions and then turn in. In the morning, we'll saddle up for a long trip on the trail. Easy, Tom. Easy, boy. Uh, Bart, Jeff, I'm leaving Henry here to entertain you. Well, we appreciate that, Bill. Just one thing I didn't mention, Bart. Yeah? Your father said in his wire to me that you're not to do any mountain climbing. What? That's right. But that's what we wanted to do most of all. Well, what's Dad thinking about? He's thinking about your safety, Bart. I must say I agree with him. So remember, no mountain climbing. Oh, Okay. Now, you can use one of our cars to take the fellas around, Henry. Oh, fine, Bill. I'll take them sightseeing. When you'll be back? In about ten days. Fellas, we've seen about all there is to see around Naughty Pine. We sure appreciate how you've taken us around, Henry. That's right. You've been a swell host. <laughs> oh, forget it, fellas. I'm glad to do it. When will Bill be back, Henry? Oh, about Wednesday, I imagine, Jeff. We'll have to dig up something to keep us busy for a few days. Well, I won't be able to help you for a day or so. I have some work to do over at headquarters. <laughs> Jeff, I'm bored stiff. Henry's got work to do, and here we sit. Yeah, what'll we do? Go mountain climbing. What? What? Your dad'll scalp you for oh, that. Oh, dad won't care as long as we're careful. Oh, don't take me wrong, Bart. 
I'm all for it, but... But nothing, Jeff. As long as we're careful, who'll care? Yeah. Maybe you're right. When will we start? How about right now? Okay, let's go. Oh, you got to this ledge without any trouble, Jeff. Yeah, but it scares me when I look down. What? We've been climbing almost straight up. Never look down when you're climbing. Uh, what do you say we start again? Yeah. Yeah, we can't stay on this ledge. Right. Uh, say, Jeff, what do we do if a strong wind comes up? Oh, don't worry. I got my pick set. I'll go first. Okay. Here goes. Got the pick set again, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, come ahead, Bart. Uh, uh, Jeff, hang on, the pick's uh, slipping. Bart. Jeff, are you all right? No, Bart. I, I think my ankle's broken. Bill, Stumpy. We'll head back to Naughty Pine right now. Let's go, Storm. Hey, Matilde! <laughs> Plenty good to see you fellows again. <laughs> Got kind of lonesome on the northern boundary, didn't it? Uh, long time not see anybody. <laughs> Maybe you started talking to yourself, eh, Sonny? Uh, not quite. Hey, get out of here, fellas. The rock slide's hey. starting. Come on, Storm. Let's go, Matilde! Hey, where's the rock slide, Sonny? Oh, Storm Boy. He's the king. It's all right, fella. Oh. I don't know where the rock slide is, old timer. He's the king. It sure sound like rock slide start. I wonder where those large stones came from and why. There, answer. Up on ledge on side of mountain, huh? Great Scott, how'd those men get up there? You'd have to be a monkey to scale that mountain. You have to be monkey with magnets in feet. That's straight up, 500 feet. There's two of them up there, as far as I can make out. Let's go back to town and get some rescue gear. Come on, Storm. Get him hey, up let's go, boy. Come on. Get him up. Come on, kill him. Rangers are leaving. What do we do now? Oh, maybe they've gone for help. No, yeah, oh, sure. Uh, why didn't I think of that? They know we're up here. Oh. They'll be back, I, mean, I hope. Oh. Oh, oh, I'm sorry I got you into this mess, Jeff. You couldn't help it. The rock gave way. Mm, perhaps. But if I'd listened to my dad's advice, we oh. wouldn't be in this mess. Bill warned us, too. Well, what's the use of... Crying over spilt milk. And even if you weren't hurt, we couldn't climb down with the wind blowing up the way it is. That's right, Bart. All we can do is wait and hope. Yeah, and pray. There's Henry in front of the office. He looks worried. Uh, we find out what's wrong in a minute. Something's out by the look on his face. Oh, Storm. Okay. Oh, Easy, Henry. Henry, what's the matter? It's Bart and Jeff. They've been gone all day. You know where they went? No, I left them at the house when I came over here to do some work. Mom says they took off about an hour after I left. Bill, you think maybe they fell us up on ledge? I don't know, Grey Wolf. I'm going to find out. How you figure to do that, young feller? With a helicopter. Bring cop 
after a closer to mountain, Bill. Okay. Hold on, though. I gotta be careful of downdrafts. Hey, Bill, what are we gonna do if those crazy guys did climb onto the ledge? Get them off, pal. Can you see them now, Grey Wolf? All right. Get dark now. Hard see through glasses. Use the landing spotlight on the copter. I'll shine it on the ledge, Grey Wolf. How's that? Huh. Oh, I see plenty of good now. Can you tell who they are yet? Hmm. You're right, Bill. That part and Jeff on ledge. Jeff, that must have been Bill and Henry and the other rangers in the copter. Yeah. Well, now they know we're up here. Hey, oh. Jeff, you're shivering. I'm getting cold, Bart. I think I've got a fever. And Jeff, I guess it's no use to tell you how sorry I am about getting you into this mess. Your ankle looks worse all the time. And that's all right, Bart. You couldn't help it. Here, put my shirt on. What'll you do to keep warm? I can move around. You can't. You'll need your shirt. The, the wind's getting colder. No, you take it. Bill will get us off here soon. Sure, but how's he going to do it? Nobody can climb up here in this wind. These boxes look like they'll take a beating. There's plenty of rope around them, Henry. Okay, Bill. Uh, we got everything in boxes they need. Food, blankets, first aid kits... Waterproof canvas. Fine. Let's take off, then. Everybody aboard? Go ahead. I'll close the door. Take her away, Sonny. You man the spotlight. Grey Wolf, Stumpy, you fellas man the winch and lower the supplies. Okay, Bill. Uh, me do, Bill. Bring the copter closer, Bill. Shine the light on the side of the mountain above us. There. How's that? That's fine, Henry. I won't be able to get much closer because of that overhanging part of the mountain. Huh, that bad. What do you mean, Grey Wolf? You're not able to lower supplies on ledge. We're too far away from ledge. We ain't got nothing but thin air to drop these here supplies on now, young feller. Well, I can't move any closer to the mountain. A sudden gusts of wind could push us toward the rock and smash the propeller blades to bits. Well, how are we going to get the supplies to Bart and Jeff then? Try swinging the cable back and forth like a pendulum. Perhaps you can get them on the ledge that way. Ah, uh, maybe that good idea. We try it. I'll lay on the floor and reach through the winch hole and swing the cable. Uh, you lower away, Grey Wolf. Huh. You say one lower. All right, lower away. I got the box and cable swinging. Let the copter down a little, Bill. It might help. Okay. That enough? Yeah, that's good. Oh, it ain't no use. We can't get close enough to the ledge. I'll take in the cable, fellas. I've got a better idea. We'll go back to the airport and rig it up. Bill, what's your idea to get those supplies on the ledge? We'll take this rifle and make a weighted plug that's just a hair smaller than the rifle barrel. Well, I get it. You're going to do the same thing as the lifesavers do on the coast. Exactly, pal. We'll tie a thin and light rope to the weighted plug. Stumpy, you can fire it at the ledge. As soon as the line falls on the ledge, then Bart and Jeff can haul in the thin line. Say, it's all right. On the end of the thin line, we'll tie a heavier line. When the lads get the heavier line, we can put the regular line on the end of that. When they pull third line in, 
Then we can send supplies. Right. Henry, is the power megaphone on board? Yes, it is, Bill. All right, let's go, fellas. Bart, you're freezing. Here, take your shirt back. No, 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 that's what I'm doing. I'll just move over out a little. Watch out for the edge of the ledge. Hey, here comes the helicopter again. There's the spotlight. Unless we're going to try something else to get those boxes to us. Bart, Jeff, listen closely. We've got supplies here for you. Food and blankets. We're going to fire a weighted plug at the ledge. On the end of the plug is a lifeline. When you get your hands on the lifeline, start pulling until you get a heavy line on the ledge. Stay right where you are and don't move around. When you hear the plug hit, then try to grab the line. Did you hear that, Jeff? We're going to get supplies. Yes. Well, thank the Lord for that. Boy, I'm so hungry I could eat rocks. Okay, fellas. Keep your heads down and don't move. Here it comes. There it is. Get it, Bart. I got it. I got it. Start pulling it in, Bart. Oh, you won't have to be hungry and cold now. They've got the last box. Good work, boys. Henry, tell them we'll be back in the morning to get them off the ledge. Bart, Jeff... We'll be back in the morning to get you off the ledge. Just take it easy until we get to you. Don't worry. We'll get you off. I hope you ain't bragging, young fella. That's going to be plenty tough climb. Well, let's go back home and get some rest. We'll find out how tough a climb that is in the morning. Ready, Grey Wolf? Uh, me ready now, Bill. Stumpy, Henry, you fellas just hold tight here until we find out if we can climb this mountain or not. Okay, Bill. We won't run off and leave you. Uh, Grey Wolf, I think we ought to climb parallel to each other. Uh, that good idea. Then it won't be dangerous from loose rocks. Yeah. All right, let's climb. Me got first solid hold with pick. <coughs> uh, now me... Climb wall like fly. I hope we can say the same thing when we're 400 feet up. Let's rest a while, Gray Wolf. Uh, that's funny, good idea. How far are we? Uh, let me say about a third of way up. I think that's about right. Boy, this wind is terrible. Uh, it tears right off mountainside. Let's call it a halt, Dre. Uh, yes, it, it no use to fool ourselves. Uh, Jeff and Bart must have climbed this with little or no wind in effect. Well, let's back down. Uh, it all gets steeper as we climb. It's suicide to go higher. Take it easy, climbing down. We have to take it some other way to get Jeff and Bart off that ledge. Boy, am I glad to see you fellas with two feet on terra firma. That's right, Bill. Great Wolf. We can see the wind push you around on the side of the mountain up there. Yeah, the wind's up there is savage, all right. Bart and Jeff must have climbed up when the wind was fairly still. Nobody be able to climb up or down to rescue Bart and Jeff. Well, how are we going to get them off, then? I wish I knew. They can't stay up there forever, Bill. If we can't get supplies to them... I mean, we can get supplies to them. Why can't we get them off the ledge? Well, getting them on the ledge is one thing, but 
Getting them off is another, Henry. Boxes of supplies and people are two different things. Hey, wait a minute. I've got it. What you said was right, pal. If we got the supplies on, why can't we get the lads off? Sure. Why not? Well, how can we do it, Bill? I'll explain on the way to the airport. Let's get a helicopter and get busy. Are we going to set this up just like we did for the boxes? Yeah, it's exactly the same, with one change. What change is that, Bill? Use the cable as much as possible. It'll take the strain better on the winch. Put the heavy rope on the end of the cable. It'll work fine. There's a stout eye spliced on the end. I'm going to bring the copter in as close as I can. Do you think it would be better to wait until the winds died down, Bill? No, pal. Probably won't be another windless day in this canyon for months. Yeah, I guess you're right, Bill. Stand by the power megaphone, Henry. I'm going to hug the mountain. Okay, I'm ready. Only don't hug it to death. We're going to try something again, Bart. I wonder what it'll be this time. Bart, Jim, listen closely. We're going to take you off the land just like we put the supplies on. Now trust us. This is the only way we can do it. Be sure and tie the rope securely around your chest. Here comes the shot. Jeff, they're going to swing us off the ledge like a pendulum. It'll work. It has to. There it is, Bart. Gra- grab it. I've got it. Pull a thin line until you get the heavy line over to the ledge. Tie the heavy line securely around your chest. When you're ready, wave your arm. Then Bill will raise you off the ledge with a helicopter. Do just exactly as we say. Your life depends on it. Don't worry, we will. Okay, Jeff. Raise your arms and I'll get this rope around you. That feels good and tight. I'll hang on to the rope, too. No set? Yeah, I guess so. Go ahead. Give him the signal. Take him away! Here I go! Here comes the end of the cable. Uh, me stop, winch. Us pull, Jeff. Rest of way now. Yeah, let's lift together. Here he comes. Boy, am I glad to see you fellows. We're glad to see you. You said it, Bill. You all right, Jeff? I've got a bad ankle. I'll make Jeff comfortable, fellas. Then we'll get Bart off the cliff the same way with this flying banana. How's it feel to be safe and sound, Bart? It feels wonderful, Bill. You tell him, Bart. There's one thing I want to tell Bill and the rest of the fellas. Now, uh, what might that be, sonny? Oh, I'm awfully ashamed of myself for getting Jeff and myself into this mess. Well, did you learn something from it, Bart? Boy, and how. I'm going to wire Dad that I won't do any more mountain climbing and no more disobedience. Oh? When did you decide that? When I was dangling 500 feet in the air on the end of a rope. I guess that's as good a place as any to learn to be obedient, Bart. Well, fellas and girls, I think Bart found that his dad and I knew just a little more than he did. Only it almost cost him his life and the life of his best friend to learn that lesson. I hope it doesn't take you that long to find out. See you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill!
Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. You're hearing the terrible sounds of someone wrecking a house. Only the house isn't supposed to be wrecked, and there's going to be great anger when the owner finds it out. This isn't the only home that's been wrecked either by this vandal, nor will it be the last. You know, this is one vandal that can't be blamed for the damage he's done. (laughs) You'll probably think I've got holes in my head when I say that, but it's true. This is not the fault of the wrecker, but it's the fault of the one who owns the place being wrecked. Well, enough riddles for now. Let's get on with the story, The Marauder of Goose Lake. Hello, Jesse. Give me Martin Harbinger's place in Naughty Pine. Yep. Where you sure I'll wait? (laughs) Don't have much choice, I guess. Thank you, Jesse. Hello. Yep, this is old Abner. Hey, you'd better come out here and take a look at your place, Martin. What's wrong? Why, it looks like a cyclone hit it. I don't know. Yep, I'll see you later. Goodbye. I better look around here and see how many more places have been broken into and wrecked around Goose Lake. What a mess. What a miserable mess. It really is a mess, ain't it, Martin? That's the understatement of the year. Flour and sugar all over the floor. Canned goods spilled out. Part of the wall torn away. Well, whoever did this sure wanted to cause a lot of damage. Yeah, it looks like they were after food. Well, maybe. But I'd say they wanted to destroy property and make work for me. How many other summer homes have been broken into? Yeah, about half a dozen or so. We'd better notify the owners and then see what can be done about this. I've already called the others, Martin. They're on the way out here now. Fine. Let's go meet them. Boy, what a job that house wrecker did on my place. Well, it looks like your place is the last one so far, Rudy. Yeah, but what's to stop more homes from being damaged? Nothing. Especially since we don't know who did it. I wouldn't say that your remark is exactly true, Rudy. Yeah. You mean to tell us you know who did this? Well, sure. Where does uh, that right? Right? No, no, no. Don't get so all fired up about it. Well, who did it? Tell us so we can have him arrested. You aren't going to have this fellow arrested, Sonny. <laughs> that fellow that wrecked your homes... He's a bear. A bear? bear. 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 Maybe we can't have him arrested, but we sure can get the rangers in on this. They got a lot of nerve letting bears run loose that will do this kind of damage. Let's go in town and tell Bill Jefferson a thing or two. Yeah, I'd like to give him a piece of my mind. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's get in our cars and head for town. Okay, let's go. Let's get out. Hundreds of dollars worth of damage done to our homes, and you sit there with I told you so look on your face. What kind of ranger are you, anyhow? We pay taxes for protection, and all you do is sit there and smile. Well, maybe you don't know it, mister, but we pay your salary, and if you don't give us satisfaction, we'll go to your superiors. You got a lot of crust letting bears run loose close to civilized areas and letting them do damage. I got half a mind to bring suit against the government for this. What's the matter with this ranger, fellas? He doesn't seem to be the least bit concerned. Maybe he hasn't got his hearing aid turned in right. Well, the feller doesn't need a hearing aid the way you fellers beller. You sound like a couple of young bulls on spring pasture. 
Maybe you fellers would cool off and sit down like gentlemen. You might get some place with Bill. Are you gentlemen through running off at the mouth? Yeah, I've said all I want to say. All right. Have a seat. Now, you fellas come in here and fly off the handle. I let you blow because when a man's all worked up, it's good for him to get it off his chest, even if he's wrong. Are you saying we're wrong? I am. Uh, how do you figure that? Come with me. Every year we put up signs telling you people not to leave food in your summer home. Yeah, I'll say there's signs. Why, the letters are a foot high, black on white. Every year you folks suffer damage because you think you're smarter than the rangers. And twice as wise as the bears. Ah, that bad thinking. We know bears smell food a mile off. And they have many ways to break in house. That's right. Each year you fellas build stronger storage rooms because you're too lazy to haul your foodstuffs back to town. And each year you come to us and cry your eyes out because of your own stupidity. And frankly, I'm getting sick and tired of it. That's why I sit here with the I told you so attitude. Because you don't seem to be able to get it through your thick heads that bears are very capable house wreckers. <laughs> it's telling them, Sonny. I'm sick and tired of their annual complaints, too. Especially when they won't cooperate with us. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. You mean to sit there and tell us you're not going to do anything about this? Yeah, what's what going you, on? What do you, what do you want what's me to do? Take each bear by the hand and spank him? Because when he's hungry, he goes out looking for food? All right, I'll admit we're wrong. But the damage has never been as extensive as this year. Our places are shambles. Looks like a whole army of bears moved in. Say, now you've told me something worth listening to. Right. What do you mean? He's got to explain. We'll be out this afternoon. Then I'll be better able to tell you what I meant. Well, that'll be fine. We appreciate your help. And, well, I might add that we were wrong to come storming in here the way we did. You read us the riot act, and, well, we deserved it. Good day, sir. Yeah, bye, bye Major. Major. Good day, gentlemen. Oh, boy. Did you read them off, Bill? <laughs> I'll say he did. But they got what they had coming. They pulled this same sort of thing for the last five years. We can't do it all. I was beginning to think they expected us to move their food for them. Uh, maybe now they do something about this and follow advice. Well, I hope so. I'm always willing to do all I can and then some to help out, but not if they don't want to help themselves. You know, a lot of Christians are like these folks. Well, how do you mean? A lot of Christians expect the Lord to answer their prayers and work miracles when they won't even lift a finger themselves. The Lord will do the impossible, but he expects us to do all that we can. Ah, well, not right. Yep. That's like the fellow that was hungry and was offered the makings of a couple of sandwiches. He turned the fixings down... Because he himself had to make the sandwiches. So he went hungry. Well, fellas, we'd better get into the car and hop out to Goose Lake. The days are getting shorter and it'll be dark soon. Oh, I not like what I think. I don't like what I'm thinking either, young feller. Yeah, those aren't black bear tracks. They're grizzly. You're right there, pal. If I follow Stumpy's and Gray Wolf's line of conversation correctly, they've got a special grizzly in mind. Not old Joe. Yep. Well, how can you tell for sure? Look at print of right front paw. Oh, it's not a normal print. By that, I mean a full print. It's sort of stubby, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. He got that mangled paw in a trap many years ago. Also, he's got a slightly deformed left rear paw. Yeah, it's old Joe, all right. We can't get away from that fact. Suffering catfish? Why, he's worked his way back here after we put him in exile out in the wilderness mountains two years ago. Yep. 
He sure did. <laughs> He's a shrewd bear and a tough one, all right. I've never seen a grizzly as big as he is. Here come the goose like wildcats. <laughs> Henry, mind your tongue. Yep. Well, it's the truth anyway, sonny. Well, what'd you find out, Bill? Plenty. Yeah. Well, is it one bear or more than one? It's only one. But he's the largest grizzly alive. Grizzly. Great grizzly. day in the morning. Now I know we need protection. That's, That's sure. right. And we're going to give it to you. This particular bear is an old acquaintance. He means we know him from a long way off. You don't get close to a grizzly except at the zoo. Well, why didn't you shoot him before? Roy, that's the easy way out. We shoot animals only as a last resort. They have as much right to live as we do. Remember, this country was his home. The white men invaded and encroached on his privacy. That's why we exiled him two years ago. We didn't think he'd come back. But you can never underestimate the power of a grizzly or his intelligence. And that great truth, they have almost human mind. Well, then he's no match for us. I might tackle a black bear, fight a rifle, but not a grizzly. That's smart thinking. It's even smarter to leave bears to experienced men. <laughs> you can have him. He's too big for us. <laughs> well, let's beat it, men, and let the rangers alone. I wish you success. Now what? Let's get to the car and... Break out our high-powered rifles. But you said we weren't going to shoot old Joe. We're not. But we're going to be ready in case he attacks us. Are we going to get that close? Not as long as my legs are working right, we ain't. My rifle's ready for action. I've got 20 rounds in my belt. Good, Henry. The safety on? <laughs> Natch. <laughs> yeah, it's short for yes, in case you don't know it, young fella. <laughs> well, my rifle's set. Uh, mine too. Now I'll stick to old Betsy here. She's handled grizzlies before and done a fine job. Okay, Stumpy. Now here's the plan of action. Yeah, we run as fast as we can and climb the nearest tree as soon as we spot <laughs> oh, old no. Joe. <laughs> no, Henry. No, not this time, pal. <laughs> Uh, Stumpy, Gray Wolf, you two fellas patrol this half of the lake shore from Johnson's Corners up to here. Henry and I'll take the other half of the shoreline on this side of the lake. What we do if we see Bear? Drive him off. Tomorrow we'll build a trap for the rascal and get him out of this part of the country. But it's too late for that today. Uh, that wise move. We go now. Uh, one more thing, fellas. What's that, Sonny? Don't hesitate to shoot to kill if the old warrior forces the issue. If old Joe wants to leave in a reasonably peaceful fashion, then we'll go along. If he wants to fight it out to the bitter end, then we'll see that he gets plenty of help. What I'm saying is that it's not worth anyone's getting hurt or killed. Don't take any chances. Okay, let's get started. See you later, fellas. Let's stop and park our bodies for a bit, huh? Okay. We've been walking for two hours now. Uh, seems less than that. Now, don't keep so tense, Henry. If we run into old Joe, he'll tell us. Uh, boy, I hope so. I need to rub noses with him. I have a feeling that we won't see him tonight at all. I hope you're right. What makes you think so? Oh, I don't know. I just feel that way. Old Joe is nobody's fool, you know. <laughs> you can say that again. Well, any bear who's lived as long as he has and has survived as many battles as that guy's come through ought to be wise as an owl. That's right. Well, come on, let's patrol back to the starting point again. For. Wolf, tell old Joe to look out for us. <laughs> you might not be far from the truth, 
Look at oh. that. It looked like old Joe took vacation tonight. He probably got his tummy full from last night's plundering and he's sound asleep. Why we walk our feet off watching for him. At midnight, we not see him. I think he not come. Yep. I think you're right, sonny. If he don't show up in a couple of more hours, then he ain't going to show up at all. It's almost two o'clock. We're almost back at the beginning again. Right. You think he's going to show up after this late? No, pal, I don't. We'll wait for Stompy and Gray Wolf to complete their patrol, and we'll head for home. Oh, boy. The old bed will feel mighty good. You say your place was ransacked last night, Horace? Uh, it sure was, Martin. Well, I thought the Rangers were patrolling the lake shore last night. Well, that's what they said they were going to do. I think the Rangers love the old grizzly. Yeah. They said he was an old friend. Let's get our rifles and take care of that old buzzard ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. What time we go out to set trap for old Joel? Well, we'll use the portable steel cage. And I'd say we'll leave about three o'clock this afternoon. I'm near it. Hello, Ranger headquarters. Henry Scott speaking. Henry, this is Abner. Let me talk to Bill. Sure, just a moment. Hey, Bill, it's for you, Abner. Thanks, pal. Hello, Abner. Hello, Bill. I got some hot news for you. Yeah? Yeah, the bear read at the other side of the lake last night. Oh, he didn't. Yep, sure as I'm a foot high. And another thing, the boys are going to take the law in their own hands. Huh? Tonight. When? That's tonight, right? Well, where? What time? About sunset at Martin Harbinger's place. They leave from there. Oh, well, thanks for calling, Abner. I'll be at the meeting at Martin's house tonight. Well, uh, all the men are here, Martin. We can start any time. Okay, men. Now, let's organize into groups before we start out. That's a good idea. Jefferson. Then you can hey, shoot at each other. Where did he, how did you oh, find out about this? I told the rangers, so you thick heads wouldn't shoot each other or get some of you killed by the bear. You wear grown men, you old wallers. Why don't you mind your own business? Now, just a minute, Martin. Let's not get mouthy. Abner's right. You'd all go out there in the dark, be jumpy as frogs on a hot stove. The first twig that moved or the first rabbit that ran, you'd all open up with your rifles. Somebody's going to get killed. Yep, they sure are. And what's more, you might tangle with old Joe. He'd surprise you, and then you might wound him. And believe me, mister, I'd rather clean out a rattlesnake's den with one hand than face a wounded grizzly. This here part of the country wouldn't be safe for man or beast until the wounded bear was killed. Well, you've heard the story from men who know what they're talking about. That's why I called them here. I didn't want any tragedies taking place. Why don't you fellas go home and stay inside until Bill and his rangers get this here old Joe caged up and out of this neck of the woods? That's the sensible thing to do. Yeah, I guess you're right again, Bill. I'm sorry we're giving you such a bad time. Oh, forget it, Roy. I can understand how you feel. But give us a little time, and we'll get rid of old Joe for you. But don't take this into your own hands, or someone's going to get hurt or killed. Uh, he's right. Let's go home, man. You said it, Martin, and stay home and mind your own business so these rangers can do their work. <laughs> The cage works just like a charm, Bill. Yeah, it's still an apple pie order. Ah, I set strong smelling bait inside. And then we ready for old Joe. I'm going over there in that scrub and sprinkle around some of this appetite powder. So the rascal will be able to pick up the scent. Okay, old timer. Oh, you forget rifle. Oh, it's too early for that. I won't need it. Uh, maybe. Uh, I set bait in cages and it all set. Good. You better erase our scent from around here, then go back to the truck and have a few sandwiches. 
before we settle down to trap our friend. Boy, those sandwiches sound good. Ah, uh, I erase scent in true Indian way. Grizzly not know we here. Can I watch you? Oh, sure, Henry. Well, I've seen you do it before. This time I want to pay real close attention. Ah, we start by no! putting some... Huh? Hey, Stumpy, what's wrong with Stumpy? Hey, here he comes running like the wind. And old Joe's right behind him. Shoot the bear! No, not shoot. Get away. Get back and give the bear room. Stumpy will be all right in the cage. Fire over his head into the ground. Try to try to Stumpy, hey, I thought we were supposed to catch an old bear, not an old walrus. I'll give you a walrus if I ever get out of here. Stumpy. Yeah, I'm sorry I messed things up. We had to move the cage. Oh, forget it, Stumpy. <laughs> it was worth it to see you run into it. That's, I'm glad the cage was there. You might have been hurt. Yeah, you can say that again. I shouldn't have foolishly gone off without my rifle. That old grizzly jumped me, and I had to take off like a scared rabbit. <laughs> I know it really isn't funny, but still it is. I'll never forget you running down that trail full blast with old Joe hot on your heels. And then the sight of seeing you inside that cage. <laughs> well, I guess it must have been a pretty comical sight, all right. But uh, you know what they say about my running inside the cage? No, what? Any port is good in time of storm. He's really looking the cage over. Yeah. Hope we got all the man sent off of it. Or he won't go in. Oh, he interested in the bait. He look inside cage now. Come on, big boy. Just walk in there five feet and your goose is cooked. He's going in. And now he stopped again. He's trying to get man sent. He's a wise one, that bear. He's going in further. Another foot and he'll step on that gate trigger. <laughs> We've got him! What we do now, Bill? We'll take him to the North Timber Ridge country in Randy Sims' seaplane. Oh, boy! Old Joe's going to have the experience of his life! <laughs> He's taking it pretty good so far. Well, I hope he enjoys the plane ride all the way. Won't take us long to get there. Old Joe have plenty to tell grandchildren now. <laughs> you said it. Not every grizzly gets a free plane ride to a new home. I don't know about him. He's beginning to pace his cage. Maybe he's gotten over his fright. Well, you fellas keep an eye on him. I'm going up to talk with Randy and pick out a suitable lake to land on. Okay, Bill. We'll keep old Joe company. Well, I think uh, Glass Lake's about the blessed place to sit down. We can get into shallow water there all right, and then you can let the bear out with comparative safety for us and him. That'll be fine, Randy. Hey... What's the matter with the plane? Oh, I don't know. It's never handled this way before. It ain't air pockets. <sighs> this is a new experience for me. Wow. Hey, Phil. Yeah? Hold Joe's on the warpath. He's trying to break over his cage. Hey, Wolf. Fix some food and put plenty of sedative in it. Ah, uh, quick. Stumpy, get your rifle ready. Maybe hey, we can get a rope on him to stop him from drawing the plane. Well, it might work. And again, it might only infuriate him. Here, food. If it's all right, I'd put it in case. No, I'll put it in. You and Henry drive him back with poles. Why well, don't get my arm torn get off? Back. Get back here. Come on. back. Put your okay. Back. Okay, I got the food inside. Come on. Now, give me the sedative. Here, you. I'll put it in his water. 
hard on weak corner of cage. Maybe we drive him back. No! He'll only get worse. He's getting that cage open. I'm gonna let him have it! No! The sedative's got to work very soon. Maybe that not soon enough. He's getting his head through the corner of that cage. No, Bill! Well, I guess so. Wait! <laughs> the sedative's working! Old Joe's going to sleep! Thank the Lord. We'll get down in the lake and wait until the sedative wears off. And we'll dump the old boy in shallow water and he'll be free again. Yeah, there goes the toughest passenger I ever had. But you know, I'm glad you didn't have to shoot him. Yeah, so am I, Randy. Now he can live in retirement. He won't be bothered by people anymore. Yeah, it was a lot of work. A couple of close calls. But it was worth it to see the majestic beast run free again. He's king of this country. Yeah. And the marauder of Goose Lake escapes those men who would kill him. Just because he acted like a normal bear. You know, I meant what I said in the story. To see old Joe free again did my heart good. The Lord made every animal for a purpose, and he made some of them to be free and wild. Just because man invaded the grizzly's land is no reason he should be killed. Well, see you again next week, boys and girls, for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! again. Our program today gives me, Ranger Bill, just a little time to talk to you moms and dads about our adventure stories and why we're on the air. We all know that every time a boy or girl listens to one of our programs, he gets some impression of the Christian life and the character of the people involved. So we must be constantly alert to guard the image that's presented, to make it realistic and truthful neither setting up false ivory tower heroes for fellas and gals to aspire to, or creating the impression that Christianity is an impossible goal in this day and age. We also try to present Christians as people, something which they are. The faults of a Christian don't have to be glossed over. He's human too. So we try to present to you, the listener, a story that from your point of view is a factual photograph of a way of life, namely the Christian way, and showing individuals living, seeing, understanding this way of life, or maybe missing it completely. Let's all be honest before God so that truth can survive, and our young people will turn out to be the good citizens and real Christians that we want them to be. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. 
Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Hot weather, little rain, dry forest. All this put together adds up to terrible danger. Forest fire, scavenger of forests, a roaring hungry monster consuming everything in its path. Bill has sounded the alert. The forest around Knotty Pine is tinder dry. All fire towers are carefully watching for the slightest wisp of smoke to curl up from the millions of acres of treetops. All eyes are watching, watching by day and by night. They're watching for fire. Listen to the story of the firebug. Stumpy, have you seen our copy of the Rangers magazine around here? Nope. There ain't no comics in it, no house, honey. <laughs> I'll give you comics. Grey Wolf, have you seen it? Mm, I not see it, Bill. Mm, there are plenty of good article in there on new diseases of trees. Yeah, that's why I want to find it. I wonder where it went. I'll answer it, fellas. Bill Jefferson speaking. What's that? Yes. Yes, we're on our way. Goodbye. Fire. Right. Let's go, boys. Where fire, Bill? South Forks. It ain't along the Red Valley freight tracks again, is it? Yeah, that's where it is. Stumpy, you're closest to the driver's seat. Hop in. Yep. I'll let her roll. There you go. Step on it, Stumpy. Maybe we can nip this one in the bud. Five minutes and woof. Ah, getting tired putting fire out along tracks. I am too, Grey Wolf. This is the fifth fire in three weeks. Well, Randolph Thompson's got to do something about those spark throwing locomotives of his. Yeah. We've got to get proof that his engines are throwing the sparks. How do you plan to get proof, Bill? I'll tell you how, Grey Wolf. You and I are going to camp out here and watch the iron firebugs throw sparks with our own eyes. As good way as any, Bill. All right, let's pick up our gear and go back to town. Right. Then Grey Wolf and I will get the horses and come back. I'm telling you, Randolph, we've got to do something about the stacks on our engines. They're throwing sparks like a torch. Listen to me, Scotty. I'm not spending one red cent on those steam locos. In a couple of months, we'll have our diesel engines, and then we can junk the iron horses. Yeah, but the rangers are going to get pretty sore when they find out how the fires are starting. Oh, that's all I've heard since the first fire. Rangers, rangers, look out for the rangers. I'm getting sick of hearing about them. They're federal officers, boss. You stick your neck out far enough, and the rangers will wrap a court order around it. Is that so? Let them try it. I'll run my freight trains when I want to and how I want to. Your job is to see that my trains stay on schedule. Okay, but don't say I didn't warn you. This easiest job I have for a long time, Bill. <laughs> I'll agree with that, Grey Wolf. And we'll stay camped here until one of Thompson's spark-throwing locomotives comes spouting along. How you plan to stop these fires? I'll ask Randolph Thompson to put spark arresters on his steam locomotives. Mm, I understand him plenty hard man to talk with. Yeah, I've heard that too, Grey Wolf. I know Thompson by sight only. 
I know he took over the Red Valley freight line from bankruptcy and made a going business of it. So he's plenty good. Sometimes these self-made men are hard to handle because they've had to work so hard to get where they are. Now, here comes the afternoon freight now. Maybe we hide back off right away. No, Gray Wolf, we'll stay right here. This right away is leased on government property. Look, Bill, engine throw plenty spark. Wow, I'll say. That's what I was hoping to see, Gray Wolf. That's our firebug. Back here again, Scotty. What is it now? I've got hot news for you, boss. Huh. I suppose you saw some rangers in your sleep last night. No, but the engineer on the three o'clock southbound saw them. What? Where? Along the right away. You sure? Sure as I'm a foot high. Not only that, but the conductor watched them from the caboose. So? And they followed them on horseback. They know what's causing the fires now, Randolph. All right, so they know. Let them make the first move. What? You heard what I said. Let them make the first move. Well, what you do about this is your business. But I know one thing for sure. What's that? If Bill Jefferson comes to see you, you'll know you've tangled with somebody. Yeah? Yeah, and take a tip from me. Don't rub his fur the wrong way. This feller Thompson's got a lot of equipment in his freight yard. And no wonder. He does quite a freight business, Stumpy. His line moves a terrific volume of freight, both north and south. On his north runs, he has to use double headers to get over the mountains. Bill, I uh, checked up on his schedule. He runs from six to eight trains in 24 hours, both ways. Oh, that makes plenty tight schedule for one track. Yeah, his engineers have to push the throttle pretty hard. That's why the old locomotives throw so many sparks. Now, this looks like the general office building right here. That's what the sign says, if you can read, Sonny. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if it was alive, I guess it'd bite me, huh? (laughs) Hey, what's the plan of attack, Bill? Well, Stumpy, you and Ralph find out how many old steam locomotives he's got. Those are the ones that throw so many sparks. The newer steam jobs don't do that. The Gray Wolf and I will go see Thompson. We'll meet you back here at the car. Okay, Bill. Come on, Stumpy. Let's go count iron horses. Look out! One of them don't rear up and kick your teeth out! <laughs> Stumpy, he sees something funny in everything. <laughs> Maybe we should have taken him into the lion's den with us. Now let's go pay an official visit on Randolph Thompson. <laughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. It isn't every railroad man who has a visit from the forest rangers. Uh, we're not here on a social call, Mr. Thompson. We're asking your cooperation in preventing a disastrous forest fire. I'll be glad to help as much as I can. Thank you. Now I'll get straight to the point. We've had five fires in the last three weeks along your right-of-way. It runs through the giant pines. Yeah, and... Uh... Did you put them out? Only quick action save whole forest from burning down. That would have been most uh, unfortunate to lose the giant pines. How does this affect me? This affects you directly, Mr. Thompson. Since you own the firebugs... What do you mean, I own the firebugs? You'd better be careful who you accuse, Bill Jefferson. I am being careful, very careful. That's why Grey Wolf and I camped along the right-of-way after the fire... To get absolute proof. You camped on my right away without permission. That's private property, in case you don't know it. It's private property leased from Uncle Sam, in case you've forgotten. You already forget? You and Colonel Anders signed papers that gave you permission to build railroad through giant pines. I built my road according to specifications. I don't know how you can accuse me of owning firebugs. 
Maybe you'd uh, care to explain. The firebugs we're talking about are the ancient steam locomotives you're using on the southbound line. They throw sparks like a welder's torch. Those ancient locos have always thrown sparks. How come they're so uh, suddenly dangerous? Simple. The forests have become tinder dry because of the heat and drought. Is that my fault? No, but it's everybody's job to be careful when so forest very dry. I suppose you want me to stop my freight trains until we get some rain. Thompson, all we're asking is your cooperation until we get rain. These evasive tactics only convince me that you know exactly what we're talking about. Isn't that so? Well, We know engineer on train see us standing alongside track. He must tell you by now. All right, what do you want me to do? I want you to put spark arresters on those old clunkers. Spark arresters? You want me to spend a lot of time and money putting spark arresters on some old locomotives that will be junked as soon as we get our diesels? Thompson, surely you're not comparing the cost of installing spark arrestor equipment with the value of the Giant Pine National Park. If you are, you're not the businessman I thought you were. Now, look here, Jefferson. I don't intend to put money on those old locomotives. Why can't you put your rangers on guard along the track until the dry spell ends? That's impossible. One fire needs all the men I have available. The rest of the men are busy watching the other forts. Well, gentlemen, I... I'll think it over. That's the most I can promise you. I want something more than a promise to think it over, Thompson. I want action. Your firebugs kindle another forest fire. I won't be so pleasant to deal with. That's a warning. I said I'd think it over, and that's the most I'll promise. Good day, gentlemen. Your visit with Randolph Thompson didn't bring much in the way of results, huh, Bill? No, Ralph. He was polite in a cold sort of way, but definitely uncooperative. Uh, he in for a big fall, maybe sooner than he thinks he come down from high horse. It seems to me we ought to teach that ornery critter a lesson. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do, Stumpy. What do you mean, Bill? I'm going to ask for a court order from Judge Deans. If the judge comes through, as I think he will... Thompson won't be able to move a single train south until it's equipped with a spark arrester. Here's your court order, Bill. All signed and sealed. Thanks, Judge Deems. I appreciate your cooperation. It's a matter of conscience with me. Randolph Thompson ought to be ashamed of himself for disregarding the safety of our national forest. Uh, what recourse do I have if he ignores this court order, Your Honor? Well, we've got a big jail here, Naughty Pine Bill. What I mean, Judge, is... Is this court order binding on his employees as well as the owner? That's right, Bill. The court order reads that during the dry spell, not one train is to move south unless it has a spark arrestor on its stack. Any person or persons who break the order may be arrested on the spot. Thanks, Judge. I won't serve this unless I have to. But I have made up my mind that Randolph Thompson isn't going to burn down the giant pines. Here's the situation. Until we get this thing straightened out, you'll have to patrol the railroad track constantly. That's the only way a disaster can be avoided. We'll keep our eyes open, Bill. Yeah, we do. Now, I realize you're not Superman, of course. So I've alerted Towers 3, 4, and 5 to keep a special watch, too. If a fire starts, send for help at once. We'll take care of things, Sonny. There ain't no fire going to eat up the giant pines if we can help it. That's good, old-timer. Now, you fellas had better get going. It's almost time for the early morning southbound to take off. I'm going to have a talk with Thompson again. Okay, Bill. Get him up, King. Hey, Turn get him up. Hey. Is 
Johnny, I'm depending on you to take care of things while I'm gone. I'll be back this evening on this freight. Now, I'll keep an eye on the whole operation, Randolph. Maybe you're convinced that Bill Jefferson means what he says, huh? <laughs> Why do you think I'm riding this caboose on the south run? Because you're afraid of Bill. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous, Scotty. But uh, I think he may have gone after a court order, so uh, I'm leaving. He can't serve it on me if I'm not here. That won't stop him. He'll serve it on you. Don't worry about that. Maybe so, but uh, this shipment of perishables and machinery has to go through, and uh, I'm going with it to make sure it does. Of course. You'd better get going pronto, because here comes a ranger car down the road now. Thanks for telling me. Here's the engineer's signal, and uh, I'm on my way. <laughs> Give the ranger my regards, will you, Scotty? Bye, boss! Randolph. You just missed him, Bill. He's in the caboose of the morning southbound. He is, huh? Well, that's the last train he's going to move south. What do you mean? This is a court order, Scotty. Judge Deem says it's binding on all employees of the Red Valley Line as well as the owner. But you have to serve it in person, don't you? No, I don't. Not the way it's worded. I'll leave the order with you, Scotty. I'll let Randolph get away with the train he's running through now, but no more, you understand? Bill, believe me, there won't be another drive wheel turn until this whole thing is settled. Good, Scotty. I wish your boss had the same cooperative spirit. Oh, when will he be back? Oh, probably around midnight. Why? I want to see him. Oh, big boy. Oh, that... Well, I guess the court order did the trick, Bill. Thompson hasn't let another train leave the yard since this morning. Uh, that's good news, Ralph. I didn't like to take such drastic action, but the man wouldn't listen to reason. If he ain't gonna run no more firebug trains, we might as well go home. Yeah, that's why he came out here. Let's call it a day and head for town. Uh, that's plenty of good idea. It's plenty hot and muggy out here. All right, engineer, let's get rolling back to Naughty Pine. Wouldn't advise it, Mr. Thompson. Don't like the looks of the crack in that left main piston rod. Oh? Won't it hold? Well, possibly. Hard to tell. I'd say no. We'll chance it anyway. Just reduce your speed going back. But, sir, it's not... I said get the train underway, do you hear me? That's an order. Okay, you're the boss. Give me the high sign when they get in the cab, will you? You bet. Scotty, what's the matter? I'm glad I ran into you. I was on my way over to your office. Yeah? Why are you so excited? I couldn't get a hold of Randolph at the other end of the South Run. What do we do now? Oh, just wait until he returns. It's all you can do. Do you think he'll bring the freight back here or return the other way? He said he was bringing the freight back. Okay. You'll just have to wait and be ready in case of trouble.
Sit still, fellas. I'll get it. Okay, Bill. Ranger headquarters, Bill speaking. Bill, this is Tom. I'm reporting a fire starting along the Red Valley tracks. Along the Red Valley tracks? Three miles below the pass. Thompson ran another train back from the south, huh? Did you notice it? Couldn't tell, Bill. The trees are too high and it's getting dark. Okay, Tom. We're on our way. Um, again? Yeah. We've got a fire to fight. Let's roll, boys. We'll take care of Thompson later. <laughs> Uh, this time, fire get good start. Get on both sides of track. Ralph, all for bulldozers and man. I'm not taking a chance on this getting away from us. Run away, Bill. It's a treetop fire. Our best attack is to knock down the burning trees on the railroad track. Let's get dynamite in the safety cases and stuff it under those trees. Right away, Sonny. Uh, I give you hands, Dumpy. Up here, Yellow That's right. Good as you can. That's it. That's right, bulldozers. I got the dynamite old ship, Bill. Fine, Stumpy. Ralph, set up flares on the tracks. Gray Wolf, let's get after those big trees and blow them down. Uh, I'm ready to go. We get going. Good thing they're not much wind. Fight the fuses, fellas. Let's get out of here. Okay. Come on, Stumpy! Light it! Get going! Let's go! Move faster, Shannon! I'm stepping on your heels! Dynamite blow any time now! Come on! Behind this big tree, fellas! Good job, fellas. It's a good thing we can use the railroad right away as a fire lane. Yep! Them trees fell right across the railroad tracks. And now Ralph's got the flares up now. Hey! Here comes Ralph like he's got a hot foot. Bill, Bill, look what's coming up the track. Great Scott, it's one of Thompson's big locomotives. And pulling flat cars loaded with men. Yeah, here comes the fella. And it isn't Thompson. No, that's Scotty. Uh, I got here as quickly as I could. About all the men I could get my hands on, including the yard crew. Oh, that's fine, Scotty. We'll need them. Gray Wolf, Stumpy, Ralph, divide the men and get after that fire. More help is on the way. Right, I'll be with you in a minute. Okay, so well, Bill, uh, I'm terribly sorry about this. I knew Randolph would get into trouble by not doing what he should. What do you mean, Scotty? His train standing on the sideway at the 10 mile grade. Yeah? He and the boys were looking at the drive wheels on the engine. Uh-huh. Something's wrong with the old clunker, but I didn't take time to find out. Well, now we've got real proof on Randolph. That's why I kept going. I'm trying to offset some of the damage he's done. How'd you know there was a fire? I could see it from the dispatcher's tower. Well, I'd better general this fire. Come on, Scotty. We'll get to work. We've got to save the giant pines. A little more hard work, and the fire will be out. Ralph, you better take some fresh men to replace your tired crew. Pass the word to Gray Wolf. Okay, uh, Bill. Bill, look! Yeah? The horse's train is backing down on us, out of control. Wait, Scott. Here I am, my train. The caboose on his train will smash into the black cars. Get the men back from the tracks. Pass the word. The trains are going to crash. Pass the word. Get back from the track. Get back from the track. Get back from the track. back, Bill. Yeah. Just in time, Stumpy. Here comes the place, and she's going to smash. Bill, the boss must be in the caboose. Then let's get him out. Oh. 
How's Thompson feeling now, Bill? Pretty good, Ralph. Me and the crew jumped from the caboose just before the trains crashed. Good. You got a nasty crack on the head, but the doc says he'll be okay. Well, I'm glad for that. There's been enough damage done. Look, he's waking up. What happened, Randolph? You able to tell us? Yeah. The piston rod broke, climbing the ten-mile grade. The rod damaged the air brakes, but we managed to back down the hill onto the siding and hold the train with hand brakes, but the hand brakes gave out. And then I decided to roll back down the valley and let the train stop by itself. But didn't you think about the fire? I'm afraid I didn't do much thinking. I didn't expect the tracks to be blocked. Oh, what a mess. Did you get the fire out? Yes, the fire's out, Randall. Uh, Scotty, have you got the piece of paper I gave you? Sure, right here in my jumper pocket. What piece of paper is that, Scotty? The court order Bill served. Oh. Well, Bill... Bill, go ahead and serve it. I, I deserve it and more. Randolph, I'm going to tell Judge Deems I didn't need it. I think the Lord sort of allowed circumstances to serve their own court order on you. Yes, that, that bump on the head knocked some cooperative spirit into me. And I appreciate your spirit, Bill. Thanks. Believe me, I'll, I'll do all I can to make restitution. Yippee! The giant pines is safe from them there firebugs! <laughs> Well, Bill and the boys, with the Lord's help, finally got Randolph into a cooperative mood, even though it took a bump on the head. Some folks do have to learn the hard way, don't they? We'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Up in the knotty pine country, there's a terribly deep gash in the earth's surface. This oversized ditch is called Dead Man's Gorge. It's 1,200 feet to the bottom of this monstrous chasm, and Uncle Sam's decided to build a new bridge over it. Ranger Bill is responsible for the construction of the bridge since it's on government land. Of course, we know that Bill's hired bridge builders and engineers to construct the steel giant. Right now, he and Gray Wolf and Stumpy are in the main construction shack talking to the top bridge-building boss, Stony Farwell. Here's the story. They called it the Jinx. Well, you're the best boss I've ever had. It's a real pleasure to work with you. Oh, thanks, Stony. I'm just here to see that things roll along on schedule. You're the man who's building the bridge. I not want your job for all tea in China, Stony. Why, Grey Wolf? How you know bridge going to stay up? Maybe first big win, knock it over. Yeah, you got a good point there, sonny. And I wouldn't want to be the feller to figure the stress and strains on that there bridge. Not the way the wind takes off down Dead Man's Gorge. Ah, it too bad if engineers not add two and two and get four. <laughs> yeah, you said it, sonny. That bridge out there would make a lot of pieces to pick up at the bottom. <laughs> Now you fellas are going to make me lose faith in my engineers if you keep on. Actually, all the engineering is checked and double-checked. Then a safety factor is added to be on the safe side. Uh, that's plenty a good idea. The bridge have to hold extra large fat man as well as extra skinny thin man. <laughs> <laughs> ah, great. Well, that was a good one. 
Yeah, you'll be catching up to my record if you keep that up, young feller. <laughs> I like you fellows who laugh at corny jokes. Well, gentlemen, we've got work to do. Uh, Stoney, how's the schedule coming along? Not so good, Bill. Hmm? What do you mean? Well, here, take a look at the schedule yourself. It'll explain better than I can. Mm. Thanks, Tony. Mm-hmm. Well, according to the schedule, you're a week behind. That's right, Bill. How come? I need a good general bridge foreman. Someone who really knows the fine points of getting things done. I just can't do it all myself. Well, is there such a man available? Yes. Who is he? Tom Ferris. Tom Ferris? <laughs> Been a long time since I've seen him. Is he the man we need? I'll say he is. Tom is the best in the field. Well, then, let's get him up here right away. Well, it's not as easy as all that, Bill. Oh? Is he employed now? That's the least of my worries. Stoney, will you stop beating around the bush? What's the matter with Tom Ferris? Well, I guess you have a right to know. The men call him... A jinx. It's mighty cold out on the bridge. The men get so chilled from the frosty wind and the cold steel that they're given a rest period every hour and a half. There's the stop work signal. The girder setters, the riveters, the bucket men, the structural foremen, the laborers stiffly climb down from the superstructure or up from the substructure, and head for the coffee shack. The half-frozen men try to get their blood circulating full steam to drive the cold out of their bodies. Ah, the fragrant aroma of good coffee sifts into their nostrils, and they quickly find their way to the coffee shack and the warm stove. Hey, fellas! What do you want to tell me? I heard a rumor that uh, Tom Ferris is coming to be boss of this job. Huh? What do you where do you hear of that, Tony? I went to buy Stoney's shark to get a bucket of rivets, and he and a Bill was talking about being late on the schedule. Yeah, yeah, go on. Well, Bill was giving Stoney the business about us uh, losing the weeks of time. Stoney, he ups and says, uh, Tom Ferris be brought in for top foreman. That's all I heard, Pedro. I ain't working for Tom. He's a jinx. That's all right, he's a jinx. Oh, what are you fellas talking about? That's right. I heard that Tom Ferris is the best top bridge foreman in the game. He gets things done. It's all right, Sandy. But as old time as no, when Tom's a boss in the job, there's always a lot of accidents. That's right, Sandy. You younger fellas don't know about the jinx that Tom carries with him. All the kinds of crazy accidents that happen. What are you talking about? Tom used to bring a jinx with him. There isn't such a thing as a jinx. That's superstitious nonsense. Maybe it's a what do you say, but I'm not going to work for Tom Ferris. I'd probably end up in the bottom of Dead Man's Gorge. That's right. <laughs> Stoney, what's all this here nonsense about Tom being a jinx? Don't you men know that there ain't no such thing? That's superstitious foolishness. Well, actually, it's not that Tom's a jinx, but the way he handles a man. They call it the jinx. What do you mean by that, Stoney? Well, let me tell you how Tom used to lead his men to accomplish outstanding construction records. All right. I'd appreciate some of the background on Tom. We've met several times, but this I didn't know. When I graduated from engineering school, I worked on the Mid-Mountain Bridge as a junior engineer. Tom was a top foreman on that job. Tom had a way of getting things done. He led his men, and they worked like Trojans and didn't know it. They wanted to beat the schedules. The Mid-Mountain Bridge was completed three weeks ahead of time. It was a clean spirit of competition. The riveters tried to catch up with the beam setters. The painters were pushing the riveters. The men were happy, and they were proud of their work. Building a bridge was more than a job to them. It, it was an art. And then Tom changed. He grew tense and impatient. He soon passed this tension and impatience on to his men. Ah, uh, not, not good. Men have accidents that way. You said it, Grey Wolf. Tom began needling the men into getting more work done instead of leading them. If the riveters were setting a thousand rivets a day, he'd needle or shame them into setting twelve hundred. Eh, somebody should have called him for that. Uh, Tom was young then, wasn't he, Stoney? 
Yes, he was, Bill. But he hasn't changed any with maturing age. Tom can get up and set rivets like a madman. And therefore, he thinks that the rest of the men should do the same. Not all men can work like Tom. That's right, Grey Wolf. But you can't tell Tom that. Now, that's strange. What's strange, young feller? Tom professed to be a Christian when I last talked to him. In fact, he was walking very close with the Lord. Well, maybe he did then, Bill. Well, that's changed now. Perhaps this change came because he's away from the Lord now. Ah, it could be. You might say he's no more than a human machine that's never satisfied with the amount of work done. He's lost his easygoing quality of leadership that makes his men want to work. We need Tom, don't we, Stoney? Yeah. Tom's the only answer to our getting back on schedule. But Tom won't do as much good since the men refuse to work for him. You're absolutely sure of that, Stoney? Absolutely. Then get Tom up here as fast as you can. Leave the rest to me. Okay. I'll go after him first thing in the morning. Oh, by the way, Bill. Hmm? Who's going to tell the men? You are. Fellas, quiet down. You all know by now that we're behind schedule. You also know that this can't go on. The only answer to our problem was to get the one foreman who could do the job. I think most of you know Tom Ferris. Yeah. Tom's going to be the general bridge foreman on this job starting as of now. We're all familiar with Tom's ability to get things done. Since our construction is... A week behind, we've asked Tom to help us bring the work up to schedule in a reasonable length of time. Tom, do you want to say anything to the fellows? Nothing more than I'm glad to be here. I know we'll all work together as a team and build this bridge ahead of schedule. And so what do you think, Tom? I ain't working for you. Not no more. You're a jinx. As you said it. Yeah, Pedro's right. I'm quitting too. Pedro, you know better than to talk like that. You've never had an accident on the job. That's a matter, Tom. I ain't no sticking around until I get one either. Well, that's yeah, right. That's right. Pedro's right. You're not. It's a long way to the bottom of the gorge. I'm not waiting till I'm on the bottom of looking up. I quit. What's the matter? Have you lost your nerve, Tony? When it comes to the work with you, I have. I'd rather be a live coward than a dead hero. You're a jinx, Tom, and you'll know it. All right, fellas, let's quiet down. Fellas, I think we're letting ourselves be influenced by a lot of things we've heard about Tom. Some of you have been on jobs with him before and seen some of the accidents. You say something at that time. I was seen of the accidents a lot, some. No doubt you have, Tony. But we must remember this. Your work is hazardous. Accidents occur 99 times out of 100 because somebody was careless. Carelessness such as not checking the scaffolding to make sure it's safe. Being in too much of a hurry. Ignoring warning bells and verbal warnings. There are dozens of ways a person can be careless. Sometimes they'll get away with it and sometimes they won't. I think he's got something there, fellas. Yeah, I think he's right. You're superstitious if you believe Tom's a jinx <clears throat> or that he's bringing a jinx with him. It's like stopping and turning back because a black cat crossed your path. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds absurd, but what you're accusing Tom of is the same basic thing, isn't it? You're right, Bill. I'll work for Tom. Now, what do you say makes the horse sense, Bill? I'll stick on a job. I want to be a stubborn mule, but the first accident that comes, I'm a leave here. Unless the accident's me. I'm glad you fellas are thinking straight. What do you say to Tom taking over first thing in the morning? coming behind you. Hey, Tommy! What the? 
You gotta rip it faster. The beam setters are getting way ahead of you. Those no. balls can't take too much strain. I don't know, Superman of us. I'm going as fast as I can. Don't give me the business, Tony. You're the best riveter in the country. Step it up, man, or those bull and bees will fall on your head. <laughs> You're holding up the other half of the suspension because you haven't got the footings blown out of the gorge wall. Your charges aren't heavy enough. Young phenomenon, Tom. If you make the charges bigger, it'll be pretty dangerous around here. Nonsense. Make the fuses longer and holler the warnings louder. Well, Bill, look at the way the work's getting done. Now, the end of next week will be a day ahead of schedule, thanks to you. <laughs> thanks to me? Yeah, you're the man who talked the men into working for Tom. Well, there wasn't anything to that, Tony. Tom's the man who's getting the men to produce the goods. And he's doing it without accidents. Boy, that man can sure hit the ball. You know, it's nothing short of a miracle the way the bridge is going up. Well, I'm certainly pleased the way things are going. But you know, Tom's not himself, Tony. He's tense. Too tense. He never relaxes, even when he's eating. Now he's not the Tom I knew five years ago. Estonia! Bill, it's an accident on the bridge! I assure you're all right, Jack. I'm okay, Tom. Really, I am. I think you'd better see the dog before... You have an accident, Jack? I don't know what happened yet, Stoney. Jack's bosun chair gave way and he fell 20 feet. Are you all right? Sure, boss. I'm okay. Well, you let the Jack doc check you over before you go back to work. Jack, is that the way you had your block and tackle tied to the superstructure? Yeah, that's right. I want to get this beam torched off before quitting time. I thought the rig would hold me. Well, you got a lot of nerve topping your rig like that. What's even worse is that Tom gets blamed for accidents that happen because of careless birds like you. I don't let this happen again or I'll fire you. You understand? Sure, boss. Sure, I understand. Now, you don't know how relieved I am that you pinned the accident right on Jack's carelessness in front of the men, Stoney. I'm glad I was able to, Tom, for your sake. Yeah. You don't know how this accident thing haunts me day and night. I don't even dream about the men having accidents. Hey, you better take it easy, young fella. You'll have a case of nerves. You can go around and hold men by hand. All you can do is tell them to be careful and watch for those who aren't. Uh, I don't know. I'm beginning to wonder if there isn't some truth about me being a jinx. Hey, Pedro. Hey, Pedro, the bridge is going up like a growing boy, huh? Yes, Tony, the bridge is she's a growing up much too fast. Well, pretty soon we have to change it from knee pens to long the bridges, huh? <laughs> All the time you make a joke, Pedro. Yeah, why not? Tommy says we's a one day ahead of schedule. All the men are proud of that. Huh, why shouldn't we be? Takes a good foreman and good men to do what we've done. Sandy, you're right. We do it without accident except for Jack fall down from the bosun ladder. And that was his own fault. Say, uh, you know something, fellas? I uh, know. What should we know, Pedro? I think Bill is right. There ain't no such a thing as a jinx. We all got to be careful and nobody's going to hurt. That's right, Pedro. It's a jinx that Tom is supposed to have, I think, is going to fall away and never come back. Tony's right. The jinx appears to be going far away, but I don't know about it not coming back. In the superstitious minds of the men, that is. Bad weather is descending over the knotty pine area, and Dead Man's Gorge is not excluded. Strong winds, rain turning to ice and snow. Add these up, and building a bridge becomes an almost impossible task. Tom slows the work down. All the men have to use safety belts as much of the time as possible. 
But in spite of the nasty weather, the construction must go on unless it gets so bitter cold the men would stick to the steel right through their clothing. Tom's worried and apprehensive. Then one after another, things begin to happen. Ease the beam down carefully, Max. This wind will wrap it right around that pier. I'm watching it, Tom. I said watch it, Max, or you're not cliff right off that setting joint. Hey, hey, do not knock him off. No, not yet. Keep your right lever a little. Pull the right lever. The wind's saying the beam right at cliff. Pull the right lever, Max. Oh, God, the wind's too strong. The wind's coming. <laughs> Get that bucket, Pedro, quick! I, I can't do it! Hey, I look out of below! Hot rivets! Let Run for our fellows! What's my leg look like, Tom? It's broken, Lefty. I thought so. Feels like it's been smashed to smithereens. <laughs> Let me see the rope burn you got, Sandy. Pretty, isn't it? If I hadn't slid down the rope, I'd have been right before that bolt snapped. Though he's not dead, Tony, he probably wishes he were the way he's smashed up. I'm sorry to hear about Louis. You're sorry? How do you think I feel? Oh, take it easy, Tom. That's easy to say. First Cliff, then the bucket of hot rivets burns half a dozen men, then Sandy and now Louis. Oh, I forgot Lefty with a smashed leg. I understand how you feel, Tom. What do you say we stop construction for the rest of the week? Maybe the We won't have to stop work. What? The boys just walked off the job. All except six. I see. The jinx again, huh? What do you think the men call it? Call me. Well, there's only one thing to do. Is there? Yes, I'm going to call Bill. Well, that's the whole story, Bill. You can see the six men on the bridge from here. Seven with Tom. Perhaps Tom should have stopped operations during this foul weather. Huh? Bill, we've got a contract with a penalty clause in it if we don't finish on schedule. Tom did slow down the pace of the work. He even gave the men extra rest periods and worked them in shifts several of the really nasty days. Our men are used to working in foul weather. That's part of the job. Yeah, that's right, Stoney. What do you think about it? Well... I know you'll blow a fuse when I say this. But I wonder if maybe there isn't something to this jinx business with Tom. Hmm? Now you too, Stoney? Well, what else can I think, Bill? Something's wrong with Tom. He radiates this deep-down trouble of his right into the men. I don't call a man a jinx who's fighting with himself. How are we going to find out what's bothering Tom? Perhaps I know what this trouble is. Do you really, Bill? I think so. Will you let me talk to Tom privately in your office? My office is yours. I'll send Tom in. Now, Tom, what's eating you? What do you mean, what's eating me? There's nothing wrong with me. Uh, there's nothing besides this terrible fear I've developed of accidents to my men. Tom, don't try to buffalo me. I've worked with men all my life, all kinds of men. I know them pretty well. What are you getting at, Bill? I've told you what was wrong with me. You only told me half the story, Tom. What do you mean? Why are you fighting with yourself? Why, uh... <clears throat> you well... told me a long time ago that you were a Christian, Tom. Can you still look me in the eye and say you're playing square with the Lord? Well, I... That is... Well, you see... Come on, talk like a man, Tom. Are you still letting the Lord run your life, or are you trying to do it on your own? Tom, if you straighten things out between you and the Lord, 
Then things will straighten out between you and your men. Well, Tom? All right, Bill. You win. What's the use of fighting the Lord any longer? You're right. I haven't been letting him help me build bridges. And I've been beating my head against a stone wall. You aren't telling me a thing, Tom. I knew that the first day you came on the job. You did? How? You aren't leading your men, Tom. You needle them into jealous competition with one another. They've contracted your restlessness and impatience. Oh, they do good work. But it's not the satisfying, high-quality work they could do. You see, Tom, a boss radiates his thoughts to his people. This happens faster by the boss's actions than his words. I never thought of it that way. Now that I do, I know you're right. Tom, are you ready to straighten things out between yourself and the Lord? Yeah, Bill. Let's have a good old-fashioned prayer meeting right here. Okay? Are you ready to go all the way with the Lord? Yes, Bill. The Lord's got to help me build bridges again, or... Or I'll never make it. Fellas, what I'm about to say may shock some of you, but I'm going to carry it out anyhow. <coughs> this morning and each morning after this, we're going to have prayer before we begin our day's work. Prayer? What do you? I know some of you don't like it. You can pray with me, or you can leave as you wish. In any event, I'm going to pray. If any of you want to leave, please do so now. There'll be no hard feelings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you keep us safe from accidents as we go out on the bridge today. Help each other. Hey, Sandy, it's good to see you. What's the news? Pedro, I hear good news from the grapevine. Tom's a changed man. Uh, I hear the same thing, Sandy. You did? Yeah, maybe I go back to work in the morning, eh? I left it. I just stopped by to tell you I go back to work for Tom. He's a different, like a night from a day. That's right, Tony. As soon as my leg mends, I'm going back too. Well, Tony, how about my old job? Can I have it back now that Tom's acting like a human being? Tom, I'd like to work for you again. Well, Tom, how are things going? Ah, uh, wonderfully well, Stumpy. The men are happy and they work together like real teammates. Yeah, the boys are bragging they'll finish the bridge a week ahead of time. Uh, you're much happier now, too, Tom. How can a help, fella help but be happy when he's in good fellowship with the Lord? Oh, say, uh, I'd better keep an eye on that batch of concrete the boys are going for. See you fellas later. Hey, Tony, don't you think a Macklewood sees the crater pretty close to painting scaffold? Oh, that's all right, Pedro. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't want him to work that close to me. Well, Max, he could have put a hook right in your pocket and not a scratch. Yeah? That's a pretty big hook. Oh, never your mind. Just set Tony some rivets, eh, Pedro? Okay. Hey, Sandy, throw some hot ones, eh? Here they come. I'll push him right here. We finish it to be my tooth sweet. Flatten the river to Tony. Watch that crate, Max! What are you trying to do? Knock me off of here! Hey, Josh, you got to put him out of right now. I'm sorry, Josh. I try to keep away from the scaffold. Oh, better. I'll take it off with Tom. I don't blame it, Josh, for being a sore. 
It's a long way down there. Well, that's another worry about that. Tony wants you to set the rivet so we can get some work done. Already she's a lunch time, Pedro. Well, let's quit the work, well, huh? You say, hey, hey, look out it, Josh! Uh, hey, the crane! Hey, uh, fuck you! Uh, You're gonna... I'm the no kind of look at Hey, fellas, look! Josh is okay! Hey, hey look at him, Tony! He's a oh, save! Oh, it's a great day. The Josh is a catch a rope and a hang on like a crazy. Hey, That was a close one, Bill. I'll say it was, Sandy. The rope saved the painter from a bad fall. Well, you know, Tony, just to when we think everything's going to be fine, then this happens. Uh, so what? The painter didn't have fallen, did he? He's a grab of the rope, he's a save, huh? Hey, that's right. That means a jinx, he's a broke. No, Pedro. That means that God has answered prayer. Yes, Bill, that was the Lord's answer to prayer, all right. He has strange ways of doing things sometimes. That is, they may be strange to us. But then the Lord's ways are always the best ways, aren't they? We'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. You know, there's one good point about winter. Despite the cold weather and the snow, winter gets rid of the pesky skeeters. Oh, the mosquito's a little fellow, all right, but I've never known such a little creature who can be such a big pest. Of course, there aren't any of the pint-sized buzz bombs around Naughty Pine now. They've all been frozen out. But in today's story, which takes place in the summer, our rangers are soon going to get their necks full of the pests as they're called to Central City a city in the heart of the Southern Forest District. What do you say we travel south ahead of the fellas and hear the story, Sleeping Death? Right now, Dr. Amos Midge stands outside a hospital room pondering the symptoms of one of his patients. He talks with his intern, who is completely puzzled as to what the diagnosis can possibly be. Dr. Midge, I'm stumped. I'd give a lot to know what's wrong with that man. I think you know, Doctor. Why don't you tell me? Yes, I know what it is. It's just that I can't believe it. It's a very unscientific remark. I know. It's the dread of an epidemic that I'm thinking about right now. This horrible disease is carried by our little friend, the mosquito. Mosquito, huh? I know it's not malaria. It couldn't be elephantitis, could it? No, it's not. It's sleeping sickness. It's 50 miles over to the town of Carter. It's there that Dr. Louis LaForge talks with an ambulance attendant in the emergency room of the general hospital. Both men have a grave look on their faces. Some more sleeping sickness, Dr. LaForge? Yes, Ben. It makes the fifth case you've brought in this week. It isn't even a week, just three days. Why are we finding it here in this area of the States? It certainly is rare, but not impossible. They had an outbreak in Indiana not so long ago. What's the cure? Profound question, my friend. The cause we know, but the cure we aren't sure of. Some respond, others do not. Those that don't just kind of sleep on and on like living dead.
Now let's take another trip to another hospital located to the west of Central City and look in on a staff meeting of the Morris Clinic and Research Foundation. Professor Joel Morris is presiding. <laughs> yes. Gentlemen, gentlemen, we must call a meeting of all the doctors within a hundred miles of our institution. It has to be determined at once the extent and the seriousness of this sleeping sickness. I hope our fears will not be substantiated. Believe me, I never hoped and prayed for anything in my life more than that this sleeping sickness be restricted to a few people. But we must find out. When do we plan to have the meeting? I'm calling the meeting for Saturday morning. Oh, it's short notice, but we can't afford the delay of a weekend. Our office staff will send special delivery letters to everyone at once and telephone the doctors living too far out. Gentlemen, gentlemen, there isn't any need to use valuable time in surveying further the number of sleeping sickness cases you're now treating as we're all very much aware that there's but one topic of conversation among us. I agree, Joel. I'd like the chair to appoint committees immediately so we can formulate plans to combat this epidemic. I'll second that. Very well, gentlemen. I I think that's a wise decision. Um, I would like to ask Doctors LaForge and Dr. Midge to join me on plans for mapping preventative measures. And Dr. Klondike... Paperwork is necessary to efficient planning, but it doesn't get the job of killing the disease carriers done. That's right, Lewis. But now we've an idea of the area over which the epidemic is spread. Our pencil efforts are ended. Now we're ready for action. Yes, and in record time. I'll call the mayor and the health commissioner and ask them to meet with us in half an hour. I only hope they have the man and equipment. According to the map we've drawn, we've taken in the counties involved, Mayor Peters, and we want to spray this whole area. That's a pretty big order, Dr. Mitch. You mean you can't do it, Mayor? We can do it, Dr. LaForge. It'll take a couple of weeks to cover the area you gentlemen have marked off. Two weeks? That's right. Gentlemen, the Mayor isn't telling stories. We have mosquito abatement equipment, but it's small scale. It takes us at least two weeks to spray the city under normal control measures, working the men eight hours a day. Commissioner, this is extremely urgent. We must spray this area at once. And not this area only. We've got to spray the whole country for 50 miles around and do it quickly. We need more equipment. We need it right now. The longer we wait to kill the pests, the more sleeping sickness cases will break out. Yes, this can't be an ordinary spraying job. Gentlemen, I know this is a serious problem. I'll be glad to work my men night and day and even hire more men to get the spraying done. But I can't make a promise of a sudden and efficient job. Mayor, uh, Commissioner, where can we get more equipment? Professor Morris, I suggest you ask the county and state authorities for help. In the meantime, we'll start spraying the city on a round-the-clock basis. Dr. Midge, I'll gladly give you all the help I can. But the county only has three spraying rigs. Any help you can give us will be valuable, Superintendent. Is it possible to get men and equipment from the surrounding counties? Yes, but their equipment is just as sparse as ours. There are several companies that do this kind of work, too. Fine. We'll get the authority, and then we'll get them spraying, too. Well, don't get too optimistic, Doctor. All the combined equipment we can lay our hands on will not be enough to do the job you need done. We're not equipped to handle an emergency such as this. I've been afraid of that. How long will it take to get the sprayers operating that you can get your hands on? We'll start operations in half an hour. Mr. Secretary, you must be joking. I wish I were, Dr. LaForge. The state hasn't any equipment for fogging. We leave that chore up to the county and local city governments. 
Uncle Sam takes care of the national parks. I'm sorry to hear this. We need equipment, and we need it badly. I'm sorry, too, Doctor. I wish I had a hundred pieces of equipment that I could rush to your area. Uh, Say, uh, why don't you contact the ranger boss in your area? Perhaps he can give you the help you need. I believe you have something there. If the ranger in charge can't help, he might know where we can get the help we need. Be sure and let me know if there's anything I can do. I'll inform the governor. I'm sure he'll be of the same mind. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Gentlemen, my committees laid all the facts before you. We're making headway, but it's not enough. The whole area within a 50-mile radius of Central City must be sprayed within a week. But who's going to create a miracle? The way we're going, it'll take a month, and every citizen in the area could have sleeping sickness by that time. Well, gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, we've been given the suggestion to call in the ranger in charge of the Southern Forestry District. The call is being placed to this gentleman now. I can't make any promises, but it's certainly worth a try. My committee and I will meet her before this time. Hello, Ranger Headquarters. Ralph Hodges speaking. Mr. Hodges, this is Professor Joel Morris. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. I wondered if you could come to my clinic right away. Yes, I can. Uh, May I ask why the invitation? Yes, you can. We've got a baby epidemic of sleeping sickness on our hands. We need your help to keep the baby from growing up. Mm, You don't say. Well, I'll be in your office in half an hour. Professor Morris, I'm uh, Ranger Ralph Hodges. Oh, I'm happy to see you made such good time, Mr. Hodges. I'd like you to meet my two colleagues, Doctors Midge and LaForge. Nice to meet you, Dr. Thank you. Sit down, Mr. Hodges, and uh, we'll bring you up to date on our problem. Thank you. As you may or may not know, sleeping sickness is carried by the mosquito. It's very rare for an area such as this, but the facts are that we have an epidemic on our hands. Now, uh, you'll notice that I'm not professor. Now that you know our problem, can you help us? You're our last hope. We're already using all the available equipment we can get for hundreds of miles around. Yes, gentlemen, I can help you. Oh, great. Thank you. What uh, kind of help can you give us? Well, I have two large truck rigs that can fog a thousand acres a day. Wonderful. And I have a fogging device rigged on a small plane. Oh, this is just what we need. How soon can you put your equipment into operation? As quickly as I can get back to headquarters and get my men and equipment back into town. Well, you can leave now if you wish. We can talk with you later after your men and equipment are working. Fine. I'll be on my way then. The sooner we get this plague under control, the better off we'll be. returns to headquarters, and within half an hour, the two large trucks and the plane are in operation. He puts his men to work using an efficient plan to cover the country between headquarters and Central City with a killing fog. However, all of the men and doctors haven't been trained like Ralph has. 
Soon chaos results from good intentions and sincere effort. Some parts of the terrain involved aren't being sprayed at all, and others have been sprayed two and three times by different crews. Professor Morris tries to direct the operation to the best of his ability, but his efforts are futile. He finds Ralph and tells him of the additional problem of lack of coordination and system. Ralph, what do you suggest we do to get all the men to work together? Professor, what we need is a general. This is an army of men, and they need a leader who knows how to handle this type of operation. You're right. But who will we get? There aren't any of us who have enough experience for such an operation as this. Wait a minute. Yes, Professor? I've got the band. Well, that's fine. Who is he? You. Oh, no, 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 not me. But I recommend Bill Jefferson of the Northwest Forest District, who could also bring in more equipment. Teletype, will you? Uh, I watch now. Bill, come quick. Yeah? What's up, Grey Wolf? It's a message from Ralph, sonny. He needs help. Great Scott, sleeping sickness. Ah, uh, that plenty bad stuff. What are we going to do, young feller? Stand around with our hands in our pockets? No, we're going to swing into action, old timer. Grey Wolf, will you answer the teletype? While Stumpy and I get the men in and ready to move out? Ah, uh, I do right away. Fine. All right, let's get to work, Stumpy. All right, fellas. Stumpy's going to see to it that you fellas get the trucks and flying boxcars and get you and your equipment flying south as soon as possible. You said it, Bill. Let's go, you young whippersnappers. We got a job to do. Now, Stumpy get trucks to Central City pretty fast. I'll say, Will. Even if he has to fly them there himself. Uh, I think you want us to fly two spray planes down to Central City. Well, that's right. We won't have a co-pilot, a radio man, but I think we'll make it all right. Uh, as long as two engines keep going like clock, we not have trouble. <laughs> that's what counts, all right, Grey Wolf. Well, let's get out to the airport. We'll let the flying boxcars take off first, because we'll be able to get there ahead of them anyhow. Time, all right. Our planes are ready. Let's take off. Uh, see you in Central City, Bill. Right. Push the throttle as wide open as you can. Professor Morris, uh, nine tenths of the area assigned to me is sprayed. We haven't got much more to do. Should be finished by uh, six o'clock this evening. Oh, that's good news, Ralph. Over and out. Say there, young feller. We're going to have to pack the boys home in the morning if we work right through the night. Will you have the job done by sunrise, Mr. Jenkins? Well, I don't know for certain. We can sure make it a good race. Anyhow, we'll be finished gassing the skeeters not later than eight in the morning. 
good work, Mr. Jenkins. See you in the morning. Bill, I have to hand it to you. You and your man have worked a miracle in getting this spraying job done. Thanks, Professor Morris. We're used to this type of work. It's just a matter of practice. Well, I don't agree, but have it your own way. Say, what about the planes you brought in? You haven't used them yet. We'll use them in the morning. I'm keeping them for the double dose. Also to spray the swamp and river areas. They've got the most powerful fogging equipment made today. They'll cover this whole country in several hours. We'll start while the dew is still on the ground. Gray Wolf's truck is pulling up in front. Let's see what he wants. Gray Wolf, you're sure fast. Uh, we not finished yet, Bill. Why not? Why'd you come back? There isn't any swamp where you fellas are supposed to be working. But there are men by name of Cy Boone. Huh? What's the matter with him? Cy Boone got his road barricaded. He's standing guard with rifle. Cy's biting off more than he can chew. How far did you go? Central City. And almost all area ten miles around has been sprayed. But this man keep us from finishing job. Professor Morris. Yes? I'm going to be gone for a while. Will you please take over any calls that may come in? All right. I can get you on the radio if I need you. Yes. I'll be out paying a call to Cy Boone. I want to get stumpy and then find out why Cy won't let us spray his land. Concern for other people. Well, there's always one like Cy Boone in every crowd. If we don't spray his place, the folks for a couple of miles around here will be in danger of catching that there sleeping death. Holy Grey Wolf, there's the roadblock that you told us about. What you do now? I'm going to remove the roadblock. Bring old Betsy along, Stumpy. <laughs> you don't think I leave my rifle behind, do you? Let's go! I'm watching the brush, but I don't see any signs of a human being yet. I didn't know the birds down here carried rifles. You see him yet? Nope. Shot came from my right. That one came from the same place. Keep walking. Give Grey Wolf time. Okay. But I ain't hankering to stop one of them there little... Good boy, Stumpy. Drop gun, you. Keep hands up. Walk out into road plenty quick. All right, you. Come on out before I come in and get you. You only got a busted hand. Good work, fellas. Now we can find out what this is all about. must be that big shot ranger boss they shipped in here. That's right, Boone. What's more, he's used to handling tough guys, so don't try any more shenanigans. Yeah, we'll just wait until my hand gets to feeling better. I wouldn't make any threats, Cy Boone. We don't scare from the likes of you. Now, what's the big idea of blockading your land so we can't spray it? That's my business, Ranger. You all just get up and get. This is private property. Now I say you ain't spraying, and that's what I mean. Oh, you plenty big fool. You catch sleeping sickness, and then you wish you let us fog. I ain't up to listen to any of your palaver. Now get! All right, let's go, fellas. He's within his legal right. Well, I do declare. A ranger with brains. Don't consider yourself the winner, Boone. I'm coming back with a court order. Cy Boone's place down there. When are we going to get the court order so he can spray his place? I sent Ralph over to the county seat to get it, Stumpy. He should be back by the time we get through spraying. I'd sure like to give Boone's land a dose from up here where it's safer. Hey! Somebody is shooting at us! You're not joking, old friend. I can see somebody standing in the yard down there shooting at us. I'm turning out. I hope Grey Wolf follows us. Yep, he sure is. Whoever's doing the shooting is crazy. I'd sure like to know why Cy Boom won't let us spray his land. Yeah, so would I. We'll find out just as soon as we get the court order in our hands. Yes, sir. Then if old Boone starts acting ornery, we'll put him in the pokey and let him cool off while we cover his place with fog. Operator, 
This is Professor Morris. Yes. Are you sure? Yes, the ranger just walked in the door. I'll ask them to investigate immediately. Goodbye. What's wrong, Professor? Why, the phone company just called and told me they've been getting calls for help from Cy Boone's place. Well, I say, just ignore it. No, Stumpy. Maybe he changed his mind. Let's go, fellas. Stumpy, you try to knock this apart with some of the tools from the car. Gray Wolf and I'll go on to the house. Okay. If I can break it up, I'll drive up. But don't count on it. We go now. Boone House, plenty of fire, and we run... Half mile now. Yeah. He's got a lot of land. House must be around the bend in the road up ahead. There it is. I can see roof through trees. Rangers. Oh, I'm sure glad you all got here. We could have gotten there sooner if it weren't for your miserable roadblock. What's happened? My wife and son are sick. Must have got what you were talking about. Guess you men were telling the truth. Now I've been a fool, and now how are we going to get him out? Forgot all about that roadblock. Um, we take a look at wife and son, and then we figure a way to get them out. Sure, sure, anything you say. Well, they're in bad shape, Boone. We've got to get them out of here quickly. Oh, what a fool I've been. Why didn't I let you spray my land? And this wouldn't have happened. How will you get them out, Bill? It'll get dark now. Maybe small plane land close by, but not in dark. We'll have to take them to the roadblock in Boone's car. Then transfer them to our car. All the handling won't do them much good, but can't be helped. Let's get them out of the car. Listen, Stumpy, get through roadblock. Gentlemen, <clears throat> gentlemen, we have good news for you. There's much to be thankful for. Sleeping sickness is well underway to being controlled. There were two new cases today, but there have been no deaths in the last two days. With the area now completely covered, we can rest more easily. And I know you'll want to give Mr. Bill Jefferson and his men a token of your appreciation. Mr. Jefferson, we of the medical profession and of the local government of this area, thank you for all you've done. Gentlemen, thank you for your generous applause. But I would remind you that your own leaders were big enough men to invite someone from the outside to come in, and that in itself is commendable. But I do want to add that the whole area accessible by roads has been covered by ground crews and a second dose by the fogging planes. Tell me what happened to Cy Boone's folks, Doctor. Well, they got under care just in time. Well, Doc, you could almost say it was a good thing that those people got sick so as we could get in and spray the land. 
That's what a man gets for being so stubborn. Well, actually, Mr. Jenkins, the mosquitoes probably did their job of infecting his folks even before the spraying started. Well, what do you know? And we're fortunate that we didn't run into lots of other folks with the same antiquated ideas. <laughs> Looks like it took sleeping sickness to wake him up. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. <laughs> Well, it hasn't snowed too much around Knotty Pine, but there's still plenty of snow on the ground for winter sports. And that's what we're doing right now, for Gray Wolf, Henry, and Stumpy and I are out on the steep mountain slopes skiing. Now, this is a slippery sport, if I do say so myself. In fact, you may burn out a brake lining trying to stop. Want to join us? And, uh, oh yes, the name of this story is The Hunted. How's it coming, fellas? Your barrel staves slick as a greased pig? I'll give you barrel staves. I want you to know I paid good money for these skis, and they're not doing bad. <laughs> you must be using some of that non-skid wax from the way I passed you up. <laughs> Just because you beat us down the last slope doesn't cut any ice, pal. There are lots of other slopes that may tell a different story, old boy. Uh, Henry, get off quicker start, so he beat us down slope. But we beat you on long run with many big trees and rocks in way. <laughs> Maybe this young whippersnapper is sort of looking for a race, huh? <laughs> I know a good ski run that'll take the breath out of any man. Uh, what are you talking about? There isn't a slope in these parts where I can't maneuver. Well, how about it, fellas? Should we send Henry down this special slope I'm talking about? Uh, I don't know, old-timer. It's kind of risky. Ah, come on. You know of an extra fine hill? Let me in on it. Okay, Henry. You'll be careful not take any unnecessary chances. I promise. Now let's get to that hill fast. Now, wait a minute. It'll have to be tomorrow. Tonight we camp and rest and get ready for the climb. Okay? Okay. Boy, this will be something special. Let's go. <laughs> you won't be so smart when you start taking the fastest ride of your life, young fella. Why, you will make grease lightning look like it's got the room it is. It didn't take us long to make camp, scare up some food, and turn in. I stacked the wood close to the fire then crawled into my sleeping bag. We had chosen a sheltered place, using a large corner of rock as a reflector for the heat from the campfire. Soon we were all sleeping the deep slumber of outdoor men. I don't know how long we slept until... was that? I wish I knew, Henry. I'd hate to tell you what it sounds like. Mm, that strange animal for this part of the country. At first, I thought it was a wildcat. That there critter ain't no wildcat. No, old friend. That's not a wildcat. It's not deep enough for a cougar. Yeah. Mountain lions have deeper voices than that. But it can't just the same. Ooh, that there sound put the shivers up and down my spine. I ain't scared to admit it. You and the rest of us, Stumpy. <laughs> I got duck bumps all over me. What in the world do you suppose that was? I wish I could answer your question for sure, Henry. I've not hear a sound like that before. This strange. It's more than strange. It's weird. 
There it is again. Say, fellas, is my hair standing straight up on my head? If it ain't, it should be. Yeah. Whatever it is, it seems to be gone now. I know one thing, fellas. <laughs> What's that? What? We'd better get back to town in the morning and forget about any private skiing we were going to have. And then we're coming back to this area and find out what animal made those horrible screams. <laughs> Hey, Jake. What's the matter with them there cattle? Nah, I don't know. Something spooking them, that's all. Nah, uh, that's for sure. Can't imagine what it is, though. Not much to spook cattle in the wintertime. Oh, it's probably some crazy notion they've gotten into their heads. Nah, uh, just the same. I'm going to take a look around the corral. Okay, I'll go with you. Wait till I load my smoke pole. Uh, I left my rifle back at the house. Uh, one's enough, I guess. Yeah, uh, let's take a gander and see what's spooking these critters. That's strange. We didn't see or hear a thing, and yet uh, the tenseness is gone. Yeah, yeah. Quieten down now. I wonder what frightened them. I don't know. It's mighty strange. Almost like a, a ghost, wouldn't you say? Well, whatever it was moved away when we came along. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the house and have some coffee. I'll get some of the boys out and we'll post guards, just in case this spooker ain't no ghost. Yeah, it's a good idea. Huh. Puzzle to me what scared those critters. Had to be something. Or was it really a ghost? And so that's what happened, Tom. Well, how about that? wonder what kind of an animal it could have been. It were no mountain lion, that's for sure. I've heard too many of them to be fooled. Well, I agree with you, Stumpy. You're best very strange. But it sure was a pussycat of some kind, eh? Yes, pal, it was a kitty, all right. But what kind and how big? What do you intend to do about it, Bill? I don't know, Tom. Not yet, anyway. Uh, anything coming here on the teletype or radio? Uh, not a thing out of the way, Bill. For all I know, everything's snug as a bug in a rug. Where could we find out if anything's going on that's unusual? Well, it seems to me that there's always a lot of palavering around the post office. Hey, that's a good idea, Stumpy. Let's walk down to the post office and see what we can hear. All of us, Bill? Tell you what, let's do this. Henry and Stumpy, you fellas go over to the drugstore and... Gray Wolf and I will go down to the post office. <laughs> I thought people were supposed to get their mail in the post office. And the size of this crowd, you think it was a fire sale? <laughs> if that's right, Bill, then post office go broke. <laughs> Say, hey, what two fellows over there on the other side of Lombie you so excited mm -hmm. about? Wave arms like crazy. I don't know. Let's amble over and find out. Sure. Yeah, you guys. It's the fourth straight night that our cattle have been acting spooky. Yeah, and we can't figure out what's the matter with them. Every time we make the rounds, whatever it is that's spooking them seems to disappear. Well, I never believed in ghosts, but I'm sure hankering after that idea now. Yeah, maybe it's a ghost of some mountain lion you shot while he was sleeping or something. <laughs> Go on and make fun, you guys. I just hope this ghost pays a visit to your corrals one of these nights. Yeah, and you can spend half the night chasing. Who are these cutters, Bill? And the Black Brothers, Gray Wolf. They own a small spread about ten miles west of town. What you do now, Bill? I've got an idea that maybe we ought to take a little trip out to the Black Brothers Ranch. You go talk to them? No, not yet. I don't want to scare them. Maybe we can pick up something on this working by ourselves. Come on, Skipper, old boy. It won't be long until we're home now. You've had a bad day with all this ice and snow. Easy now, Skipper. We'll cross the creek and go through the thicket. Then we'll only be a short way from home. 
And I'm going to put on your ice shoes first thing in the morning. Easy, Skipper. Easy, boy. What's the matter? Smell something? Oh, Skipper. Easy, big boy. Take it careful. No, you can't run on the slippery ground. Quit trying to take your head. All right, Skipper. Let's get out of here if that's the way you want it. But don't fall. I'm sure glad that moon is out so strong tonight. It's almost like working in daylight with the reflection from the snow. How come you're not letting the ranchers know we're out here? Oh, they get so excited that they think this is some threat to their cattle. That's right, old timer. Since the cattle are corralled and not grazing, well, we don't have too much to worry about as far as actual stock loss is concerned. Hey, Bill. Hmm? Look, tracks. Where, Henry? Right over here. Come on over, Grey Wolf, Stumpy. I don't see anything, Henry. Look down. See? Right here. They're kind of faint. Wind's blown snow over them. Oh, I see. That mean track is old. Um, maybe not too old to help, though, Grey Wolf. Henry, you've made a good find here. Those are good tracks. Uh, how old do you think they are, fellas? Well, I recollect they're uh, nine bit over a day old, uh, maybe just a day. Oh, I think so, too. Made last night. It's hard to tell when fine snow blow in on frozen tracks. But you're sure they're recent enough for us to work on, huh? Yep. I should say so, young fella. That's what I want to know. Now, the next question is, what kind of tracks are they? Well, they're definitely not cougar tracks. They're not wildcat or lynx tracks too big. I not know. They're bigger than cougar tracks. Fellas, do you remember when we were down in the southern part of Mexico on a survey for the government? We were advising the Mexicans in conservation of their natural forests and rangelands. Oh, I remember. I think of another thing. What's that, Grey Wolf? We have little experience down there that we never forget for a long time. <laughs> Hey, that must be getting ancient. That's right. And these tracks look just like those did, only bigger. That's what's bothering me, fellas. I think that we're looking for a jaguar. All right, Sid, we're doing the best we can. That cat's fast. One night he's here, next night he's 12 miles away. So what? My son was almost attacked riding his horse yesterday. How long is it going to take you fellas to get this killer? It'll take just as long as it takes us to get the cooperation of all the ranchers. I'm not going to run my man bow-legged just on the strength of a lot of spooking stories. Yeah? Well, seems to me you're not doing your job. Maybe you ought to call Colonel Anders on this. There's the phone, Sid. Won't cost you a cent either. Call Colonel Anders. He'll tell you the same thing I'm telling him. Oh, sure. One ranger tell a story, and the other back it up. I think you've overstayed your welcome, Sid. Okay, I'm gone. But you fellas had better get that cat or else. Yeah? Or else what? Or else maybe we'll get some new rangers. Boy, that's pretty hard to take. Ah, oh, forget it, Henry. He'll cool off after a while. Realize how ridiculous he sounded. We've got more important things to do. You got ideas, Bill? Yes, Grey Wolf. We've got to let people know about this jaguar. Then, if anyone sees the cat, they can call us, and we'll get a pattern of his operation. We'll use the map on the wall. Now that sounds good, Bill. If enough people see him, when do we start? Right away. Grey Wolf, you and Stumpy sort of circulate around the areas we think he's operating in right now, and see if you can pick up any fresh trails. Henry and I have another job to do. A job Paul Revere would have liked very much. Hello, Inky. Where's the boss? Oh, uh, he's out in the story. Can I help you? Yeah. I'd like you to run this story in pictures in your next edition of the paper. Sure, I'll be glad to. Hey, a jaguar on the loose, huh? Boy, this is one time I wish that I was a ranger. Maybe you'd better stick to printing, Inky. 
You'll live longer that way. See you later. Okay. Any time that we can help you. Thanks a lot. Where are we going now, Bill? Radio station, pal. Sure, we'll be glad to spot this on the air for you, Bill. That's fine. I'll appreciate it. How often do you want us to air it, Bill? Just as often as you can. This big cat is dangerous, and people have got to know. Well, that ought to hold his old map up on the wall. A couple more of these brads ought to do it. You know, I think this is a terrific idea, Bill. Well, we'll soon find out, pal. There we are. We'll use these colored pins to mark the location of the phone calls. Mark the time the cat was seen right alongside. We'll see if we can spot this old boy. Oh, hiya, Gray Wolf. Stop me. Hi. How are you? What'd you find out, fellas? Ah, uh, not much. One cold trail. Maybe one day old. Maybe half day. It was too old to help us any. Yeah, on the half a day start, that cat wouldn't be anywhere near there. Well, we're all set to put our plan into action. All we need now are some telephone calls. Well, Bill, it's getting late afternoon. Nobody's phoned us yet. Yeah. Well, about all we can do is wait. Bill? Yes, pal. What's on your mind? How come that jaguar hasn't made a killing yet? Animal, I mean. That's a good question, Henry. Probably because he hasn't figured out how to negotiate the corral fences. What do you mean? I mean the jaguar is a jungle cat. Used to stalking his prey close in, then jumping it from concealment. You mean under cover of the jungle? Uh Uh-huh. Until he figures out whether the fences are something to be feared or to be jumped, he won't make a killing in a corral. When he gets over that psychological barrier and makes a killing, his goose is cooked. Um, then we get him. Got him is right! But why? Well, it's this way, pal. Uh, I get phone. Hello, Forest Service. Uh, yes? That's mine. Forest Service, Yes. Don't you dare, Stubby. This is mine. Hello, Forest Service! Yes, sir. Thank you for calling. We will. I'm getting preacher's sore throat. Never did so much yakking in my life. Now, let's take a good look at this map and see what we've got. Well, we've got a lot more pins than I thought we'd have there for a while. Yeah. The picture's beginning to shape up. Ah, he's somewhere in Blue Canyon Valley country. Mm Mm-hmm. Now to go out and look for him. We're going to sit on the ridges and try to see this pussycat? Yes, pal. May sound unworkable, but it's the only thing we can do right now. He shouldn't be too hard to find if he shows himself at all. We'll move slowly along the ridges, and perhaps we can pick him up with our field classes. (laughs) Getting cold, pal? No. We're just thinking about that jaguar. Almost like meeting up with a real tiger. I'd say it's worse. We can't let down for a minute. I should say not. Well, let's move along, fellas. Maybe we'll get better results up a ways. Hold it, youngsters! You got something in your glass, old-timer? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, doing better in a minute. What do you see? Yep, it's him, all right. It's the big cat. Here, let me have him. Great Scott, Stumpy, you're right. There he is, as big as life. An almost big as tiger. Why? I wouldn't want that guy around the kitchen. Look at the size of his paws. Yeah. These high-powered glasses really bring them close up, don't they? Well, 
Here's where I finish off at their cat. Hold it, Stumpy. That's almost a mile. I don't think you'd score a good hit with the wind funneling down the canyon like it is. <laughs> well, maybe you're right, Bill. Although it's a great temptation. What are we going to do, Bill? There's only one thing to do now, pal. We're going to stalk that jaguar till we get him. Slowly, we make our way down the slippery canyon wall and head into the depths of the canyon floor, moving quietly, carefully. I'm taking the lead, with Henry following, and Stumpy with his sharpshooting rifle, finally Grey Wolf, who keeps watching the back trail to be sure we're not being stalked in turn by this treacherous jaguar. Hey, that guy's close. He's moved. Now he's picked up our scent. He's mad. Not, not good. He looked for a fight. What, do you attack a group of men like us, Bill? If a jaguar thinks he's cornered, he'll fight like a dozen grizzlies. Ordinarily, they try to stay away from human beings, but not this boy. I have a feeling he's aching for a scrap. That warning to us to get out. He maybe not tell us again. That's right, Grey Wolf. He probably won't make another sound. Now it's Hunter stalking Hunter. And I wasn't kidding. The big cat is hunting us at the same time we're hunting him. We're climbing upward toward the jaguar. At the same time, the jaguar is looking down on us. He has the advantage, knows it. But we can't see him. Though we sense that he's close by. Hold it here, fellas. He's right ahead of us. Mm, not right. How are we going to find out where? I'll go first. You fellas cover me. <laughs> That's risky business, young feller. You might have that kitty right on top of you in a minute. Well, we can't turn back now. Let's take it slow. Be careful when you walk. Okay. Let's move out. Henry, look out. You fall. The cat! The mouse! The cat! Get him, somebody! Uh, awful hard to hit a streak of grease lightning. Okay, friend. You won the first round. Maybe you won't be so fortunate in the second. I sure am sorry, Bill. I didn't mean to kick that gravel loose. Forget it, pal. As long as nobody was hurt. Anyway, I'm sure glad to get back to headquarters and rest my nerves a bit. That's why we came back, Henry. I thought we all needed a rest. But we'll get that fella yet. Ah, uh, we get good rest in own bed. Be ready for a fresh start in morning. That's the best idea I've heard all day. Yeah, boy, this chair is mighty comfortable. The fella could sure saw wood in this old... Something. <laughs> he looks sleepy, huh? <laughs> well, let's all do the same thing, fellas. And see what a new day brings us. Huh? Uh, uh, oh, telephone. What time is it? Sun's up. I'll get the phone. Ranger Bill speaking. Yeah? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. What time is it? It must be the middle of the night. Uh, oh, no. Can't be with the sun shining. It's 8 o'clock, Henry. 8 o'clock? Man, I slept half the day away. I'll say so. Now hit the deck, young fellow. We got work to do. What was that phone call about? The jaguar? Yeah. The big cat's finally cooked his goose. What do you mean? Has he made a kill? Got a yearling steer. And we'll trap him with it. I sure hope we catch him this time. So do I, pal. Let me warn you, this isn't going to be any pushover. This cat knows we're after him, and he's in the mood for a fight. Oh, I'm not right. We'd be careful when we get close. Jaguar might strike. Keep your finger on the trigger, too. This fellow's going to be extra dangerous because he's hungry. Better keep our voices down. Let's try to stay downwind with his kill. Look, there carcass of steer ahead of us. Yep. The jaguar's not there now, but he must be right close by somewhere. Shh. 
Let's be careful now. We can't afford to miss this time. Now, if we do, that big cat will head back to Mexico and we'll never see him. That's what I was hoping he'd do, Henry. I hate to destroy him, but we've got to protect the rancher's cattle and his family. Look, he come out of cave now, over on right. Boy, is he handsome. Look at that beautiful coat of fur he's got. Yeah, he's really winterized, all right. Wonder how long he's been up here. Hope the wind doesn't change. We're so close to him, he'd pick up our scent. <laughs> What'd you do that for? I think now he's the one who's spooky. Yep, I think you're right, young feller. He's got four rangers on his mind. You're not feeling too happy about it. Uh, he's got big grouch on. Are we close enough to shoot? Yes, Henry. The... Hey, hey, watch it, fellas. The wind's changed. He's got our scent. Let's get him, fellas, before he gets away. <laughs> Why, did you see that? Talk about speed. That kid, he's got a jet beat a mile. Yeah, and I think he's wounded. He jumped aside with our rifle shots, but not enough. Let's go after him. I must be in there. Uh, he and Barn, all right. Yeah, this is the end of the trail, all right. Look at those blood marks. He's wounded pretty bad, youngster. Don't think he's got long for this world. That's right, Stumpy. So, let's go inside the barn and get him. This is a tough spot. What's waiting us on the inside? Is it a weak animal, gasping his strength away because of his wounds? Or is he still strong and ready to do battle with all comers? I carefully ease myself into the barn, stand just inside the door. I'm waiting for my eyes to get adjusted to the dimmer light inside the building. Now Henry slips in beside me. Grey Wolf and Stumpy slide in the other side of the door. We're now divided two and two. Our fingers tighten down in our triggers. Every shadow, every stall is a dangerous spot. This is no joke. Where is that cat? Take it easy, pal. Don't let your nerves get the best of you. Just keep watching and waiting. It'll happen soon enough. Yes, it'll happen soon enough. But when? When will this bundle of muscle and claw burst out on us like a cyclone? Grey Wolf and Stumpy edge along the opposite wall while we move to and watch, watch, watch. And wait. Where is that cat? There he is in a stall by the corner! Get him! Come on, Adam! Well, it's all over, fellas. There he is. He fought a good fight to the end. I'm not a bit happy about killing him. Yes, there are some things we have to do that aren't enjoyable at all. Not everything in life is pleasant, that's for sure. But what a scrap. That jaguar sure gave us a battle. Well, we'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Say, have you ever read the story, The Penalty of Command? Well, if you haven't, I'll give you a brief idea what it's about. The main theme of the story is to show the price that a boss has to pay because he's a leader of men. 
You know, a lot of folks think that a boss has an easy job. Well, it isn't so. The leader has more strain mentally than those who work under him. Sometimes he has to make decisions that he knows will make him unpopular. But it's a right decision and for the good of all concerned. That's what happens in the story, Stumpy Gets 30 Days. Bill and his rangers are moving the most dangerous animals in the world. These are the American bison. Heavy snows have made foraging in the upper pastures almost impossible. Young stock are suffering the most as they flounder shoulder high in the snow. Yes, the rangers have supplemental feeding stations for the buffalo, but the animals also need pasture so they can forage and get exercise. Let's join the fellows as they ride herd on these ornery critters. Bill, Stumpy's getting a pretty bad time from a young bull. Yeah, I noticed that, pal. I wouldn't worry about it. The old timer can take care of himself. I sure hope so. By the way that bull keeps charging and worrying Stumpy's horse, I don't know. He's trying to move away from him, but that critter keeps following. Oh, he's really got a chip on his shoulder. I'll keep an eye on him. Hey, Gray Wolf and Tom are having trouble with their side of the herd. Let's go. Hey, yo, Stumpy. Come on, boy. Let's get out of here. Think you and Tom can hold them now, Grey Wolf? Ah, uh, we do. Thanks for help. They not try and break away again. I hope not. Keep a close eye on them. They're in an ugly mood. Uh, I watch them close. Bill, we're stumpy, huh? Well, I don't know. Should be over on the other side of the herd. I haven't seen him for several minutes. Grey Wolf, take charge of the herd. Let's go find Stumpy, pal. Get your rifle ready. Stumpy's in real trouble. The young buffalo bull finally made a full charge and gored the old-timer's horse. The horse went down, with the old fellow being thrown from his saddle. Before he could get up, the bull gored him and then rolled on his chest. Stumpy's horse, Maud, is frantically trying to help her master. Now the bull is getting ready for another charge. The wounded man and horse make a desperate effort to protect themselves as the beast turns and charges at full speed. Then suddenly... Bill, thank the Lord you got here. I, Bill, I, uh, he's in bad shape. Uh, yeah, you said it. Henry, ride like the wind to the chuck wagon and call for a helicopter on the radio. Then tell Grey Wolf to stop the herd and bed him down. I'll stay here. Bill, do you think he's... Well, he's hurt pretty bad, huh? Yeah. You standing here doesn't help. Get moving. Yes, sir. Up best... Come on, girl. Easy does it, boys. Every bone around his chest has been crushed. We're watching ourselves, Bill. Sit him down slowly now and slide the stretcher. There we are. That's good. Okay, fellas, take off. Hey, aren't you coming with us? No, I gotta help the fellas get the buffalo herd under lock and key. We'll get to the hospital as quickly as we can. Get going now. Yes, sir. <whistles> yes, yeah, Storm, there goes our old friend. I hope he pulls through this one. Badly injured. Come on, Storm. Let's join the boys. We'll have to take it easy, big boy. Old Maud isn't able to run any races. Come on. Let's go. Come on, old girl. We'll take you where it's safe and warm. Have the fellas got the gates open, Grey Wolf? Uh, not right, Bill. 
Maybe we hold back now so animals not drive too hard and break fence down. Yeah, pass the word. Uh, I do plenty so. Henry, lay off. Okay, Bill. Well, what's up? I just told the boys to hold back. The bison can drift through the gates and not crash into the fence. Oh, how long before we can go to the hospital? Right away. Here comes Gray Wolf. Get okay kiddo, go now. Common boys lock herd inside fence. Everything plenty quiet after animals settle down in new home. Now, that's fine, Gray Wolf. I'll breathe a lot easier now with those ornery rascals locked up. Why didn't you go in the helicopter with Stumpy? We could have handled the herd. I didn't want to take any chances with the buffalo as spooky as they've been. Being short two hands might have caused another accident. One's enough. Well, let's ride for Naughty Pine. I'm sorry, fellas. I, I don't know any more than I did an hour ago. Well, we understand, Doc. How long before the crisis? Yeah, perhaps an hour, a day, a week. Uh, I can't tell. He's very seriously hurt. That buffalo did an awful job on the old-timer. Uh, we stay here until we know one way or other. Make yourselves comfortable in the room across the hall. It's empty. Thanks, Doc. Uh, Bill. Uh, yes, Doc. By old sound medical reasoning, the old-timer should have cashed in before he got here. Undoubtedly, his clean outdoor life is helping him fight. I I don't know. There are a lot of things about this case I just don't understand. But I think you fellas have been doing a lot of praying for your old friend, right? Yeah, we have. From the moment it happened, we've all been praying one continuous silent prayer. Whatever is thy decision, we shall humbly accept it, because your wisdom is perfect. Lord, the plea of our hearts is that Stumpy be healed and returned to a normal life. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Almighty God, help our friend. Give him strength to fight and fight to live. God, if you want him to come home, then we obey your wish. But we want that he live. Raise him up if it be your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, in Jesus' name, we ask that you help the doctors to bring Stumpy out of this. Yes, we've ribbed the old-timer about his age and his jokes and about a lot of things. But really, Lord, we love him. We need his bright and happy outlook on life to lift us up when the going's rough. Please, Lord, if it be thy will... Raise him up to be strong and healthy again. Amen. 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 It's seven hours since we talked to the doc. All they do is run in and out of Stumpy's room with all kinds of gadgets. It must look like a medical supply store in there. But nothing's happened. The old timer doesn't get worse and he doesn't get better. How long's this going on? Take it easy, pal. Seems like only several minutes to the people who are fighting for Stumpy's life. We must be patient. I know it's hard, but we're used to difficult jobs. Yeah, you said it. Hey, here come Doc. Hey, he's smiling. It's all over, huh, Doc? And you won. No, Bill. We won. All of us working together as a team won the battle. Huh? We did all the work with the patient. But you fellas prayed. <laughs> can't make any of your corny jokes because I'll climb the wall if I try to laugh. <laughs> He's recovering all right. Right off his ornery nature sticks up. <laughs> We're very happy to be sitting here talking with you, old friend. Well, you can say that again. Boy, Stumpy, you sure gave us a scare. Ah, uh, you hurt plenty bad. You fellas don't know how happy I am to know I've got real praying friends. What do you mean? Don't try to pull the wool over my eyes, sonny. 
And every once in a while I came to, but I didn't open my eyes. I heard the doctor and nurses whisper about how close to death I was. You fellers ain't fooling me none, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. It warms my old ticker to know I got real friends who stick through thick and thin. Uh, but what friends for, Stumpy? Christian friends no good unless they pray for one another. Well, I'll never forget this. Oh, sure. <clears throat> well, our time is up, fellas. Um, we'll see you again tomorrow, Stumpy. Yeah, it'll be fine. So long, oh, Stumpy. Goodbye, Stumpy. So long, Stumpy. See ya. Say, hey, Bill. Yes, old timer. How's Maud? What happened to her? Ah, oh, she's all right. The gore she got was only a graze. The impact knocked it down. I've got her resting and taking it easy. It's fine. She's a wonderful horse. She tried to help me by fighting off that old bull. I know, Stumpy. Maud'll go on record as one of the great horses of the ranger service. We won't forget her heroic deed. That's good news, Sonny. Well, I'll sleep all right now. Come in, Bill. You want to talk to me about Stumpy, Doc? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, Bill, I, I don't know quite how to say this, but... Well, I'm not satisfied with the old-timer's progress. No, oh, he's, he's healing all right. His chest is slowly correcting the crush it took. Yeah, I understand, Doc. Uh, you mean you're of the same opinion? Mm -hmm. I've noticed for several weeks now. His morale is good, but not aggressive. I agree. He doesn't have a defeatist attitude. I'd, I'd rather call it, well, a... Uh, I don't know just exactly what I would call it, unless it would be to say that he, he acts like a tired old man dreaming about retiring. Mm -hmm. I think you hit the nail right on the head, Doc. He's fighting to get well, but the old spark is gone. Sort of like a patched inner tube that's afraid of another blowout. <laughs> Very aptly put. But how can we get the spark back? I don't know. It's a shame to let it go out or even just smolder. Say, Doc, let me take him home with me. Perhaps some good home cooking and homey surroundings will help him. Stumpy, you're sure getting your old appetite back. Yep, I sure am, sonny. Of course, that ornery varmint had to go and sit on my stomach and flatten it out, but I keep <laughs> stuffing it best I can. That'll put it back into capacity shape. Especially with Mom's delicious cooking. <laughs> oh, Stumpy. Man, <laughs> Stumpy, the way you talk, you'd think Mom was the only good cook alive. Here, Bill, have some more meat. Oh, thanks, Henry. I think I will. Say, old-timer, how about walking down to the office with us? Uh, Henry will drive you back. Yeah, how about it, Stumpy? Well, I'd like to, Sonny, but once around the block and a little puttering in the backyard's about all I can handle right now. Bill, what's wrong with Stumpy? I don't know, pal. I wonder the same thing. He act like old man, tired old man. Yeah, that's about it. And his morale is high. He isn't sour about his accident. He just acts plain tired. He not old timer we once know. Stumpy never let age make him old. He always young in mind and heart. Yeah, you're right. You fellas go on into the office. I'm going to stop in here and see the doc. Okay, Bill. Let us know what he says. I will. See you in an hour or so. Hello, Bill. How's our old friend? That's what I came to see you about, Doc. You busy? Nope. Be right there. Yeah, I didn't get much sleep last night. Yeah, that's the life of a doctor. <laughs> Guess you've lost many a night's sleep, too, huh, Bill? Yeah, lots of... Stumpy isn't making much progress, is he? Other than recovery. No, I'm afraid not. Doc, are you sure he's physically all right? Yes, yes. I I've x-rayed him from head to foot. and He's getting several different shots to build up his general health. 
Takes enough pills to choke a cow. He's doing fine. But will he completely recover with his mental attitude the way it is? Well, it's hard to say. My opinion that he won't. He'll baby himself and then, well, that's not what I want. He's got to stretch his muscles, put in some hard work, repair the damage done to them. I don't mean he should climb a mountain first thing in the morning, but it eventually should come to that. Bill, his full recovery depends on proper exercise and circulatory stimulation. Stimulation given with liver and iron shots doesn't take the place of the real thing. Well, then moderate exercise increasing to hard work won't hurt him, huh? It'll do him a world of good. If he doesn't, he'll be an invalid the rest of his life. He has to be willing to feel his pulse pounding in his blood vessels. Well, I'll keep trying. Maybe in a few weeks he'll change his mind. Well, I hope so. If he doesn't, you'd better buy him a nice rocking chair. Have you got more papers to file, Bill? Uh, yes, pal. Uh, here's a fistful. That ought to do it. Sure appreciate your help. <laughs> well, that's okay. I get a kick out of filing papers, especially when I have to look for them again when they're filed in the wrong folder. Ah, well, there we are. That's finished. What are you working so hard at? You've been writing out half a dozen forms there. Oh, hello, Gray Wolf. Everything all right out in the barn? Uh, horses have enough food and water for the rest of day now. Well, I'm glad you're here, Gray Wolf, because I have something to tell both of you before I tell Stumpy. Oh, what is it, Bill? Uh, that sound important. It is. Henry, you wanted to know why I've been so busy with these papers. Yeah, I was just curious. These are Stumpy's retirement papers. Bill, you're joking. Am I? I've worked on them for three hours. Call that a joke? But, but why? I asked the same question, Bill. Why? Why? That's obvious, isn't it? He's a tired old man and no longer of any use to the Forest Service. You mean you're going to put him out to pasture just like that? No warning? No chance to recover? Just throw him out? If he can snap out of it by the time the papers come back from Washington, I can stop his retirement. How long would that be? Thirty days. That sounds like a jail sentence. This will kill the old-timer. I suppose you think this is a barrel of fun for me. You tell old-timer soon? Yes. I'm going home now and tell him. Stumpy, I wish somebody else could tell you this, but I have to because I'm your boss. These papers I have in my hand... What kind of legal papers are those, sonny? They're your retirement papers, Stumpy. I know you won't believe me when I tell you I'm your friend, and I'm sorry it has to be this way. So, you're putting me out to pasture just like an old horse, eh? Papers won't be back for 30 days. My signature clinches your career. If you can improve yourself by the time the papers return, I won't sign them. You figure I'm a tired old man and I ain't going to get well, eh? I don't know the answer to that, Stumpy. You're the only one who does. Is that right? Well, young fella, I'll show you that you can't throw me out of the Forest Service. In 30 days, I'll be running road races up to the tops of the mountains. What do you think I am, some old billy goat that can't eat tin cans anymore? You give me 30 days just like a judge, Now I'll make you eat those papers. Henry, Grey Wolf, I don't want to argue about Stumpy. The die is cast, and that's the way it's going to stay. Bill, I heard you pray for Stumpy to get well. I heard you plead with the Lord for his recovery. Why? So you could throw him out like an old coat? Maybe it would have been better if he died. At least you would have had the pleasure of breaking his heart. Henry, you're talking out of line. Is that so? Well, I've got plenty to say, and I'm going to say it right here and now. Why do you have to throw the old timer out? Can't you keep him around and give him easy jobs? Bill, you're killing him by inches, and I think it's a dirty trick. Uh, I agree with Henry. All men work hard many years, and his faithful friend. 
That not mean anything to you? Why you not let Buffalo beat your chest flat and stick horn into stomach? Then we see how fast you recover. Fine reward, old friend, get. Bill, you wrong. All wrong. I've been wrong before, Grey Wolf. But my decision still goes until I'm proved wrong. Hey, what are you fellas doing here? You're not off duty. Well, the forest ain't gonna burn down with all the snow out there. That's beside the point. You're not off duty. We're taking time off to tell you we think Stumpy's getting a dirty deal. That's yeah, right, it sure is. What's gotten into you, Bill? You just can't give the old timer the boot like this. Yeah, Tom, it. Paul, the rest of you, listen to me. I'm giving Stumpy a fair chance. Also, I'm actually doing him a favor. He's not fit for active duty. According to regulations, he can't retire for two years. But he'll get full retirement pay. You won't have to pay it to him long. He'll die of a broken heart. Yeah. You know the Forest Service is his whole life. Everything. It's a cheap trick, Bill. A cheap trick. Yeah, sure. cheap trick. All your words and arguments won't change my mind. I'm still the boss here, and what I say goes. Come on, fellas. You can't talk to him. That's right. yeah, let's I go. think I'll put in for a transfer. Yeah, yeah, let's get out of here. See ya. I've got an idea how we can beat Bill at his own game. Oh, that good. I have idea, too. We put heads together. Let's move Stumpy back to his own house. Then you and I will take turns helping him get back on his feet. The other fellows will help, too. Oh, that's plenty of good idea. And now I tell you a secret. Huh? I have same idea. So I make phone call to doctor. He say old friend can take all the exercise he can get. A little at first, and then more. Doc say it only way old-timer get back on feet. You think it's a good idea? Mm, it only way to help Stumpy. Wonderful. Let's get started then. 30 days isn't a very long time, unless you're sitting it out in jail. Take it easy, sonny. This old body ain't what it used to be. Uh, you haven't got an old body. The doc says your body's doing fine. All it needs is lots of muscle stretching exercises. Come on, let's do three blocks today. Okay. I can take the three going all right, but I don't know about the three coming back. Oh, you'll make it all right. If you can't, I'll carry you. <laughs> It'd be like a cold carrying an old horse. <laughs> you do half mile walk plenty of good now. We try three quarter mile today. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I could do a three quarters of a mile on a dead run. No, I'm not sure I can do it on a slow walk. Oh, you stretch muscles plenty good, and they get strong and healthy. Yeah, but if I stretch them too much, they'll snap like rubber bands. Hey, Paul, where's the fire? Breathe deeper, Stumpy. You gotta push your ribs back out where they belong. Okay, but I don't want the air pump to blow a gasket. You're doing the mile walk in fine shape, old timer. Yeah. Pretty soon I'll be ready to race Bill up the nearest mountain. <laughs> Henry, get the doc. I got a terrible pain in my chest. <sighs> Don't waste your time on me, fellas. I'm just an old fossil. Nonsense. The doc says all you had was a muscle spasm in your chest muscles. Here, are these hot packs will straighten it out quick as a bunny. <laughs> I'm beginning to think Bill's right, just like he always is. Stumpy, you not talk like that. Discouragement is Satan's best weapon. I know, but what's the use of avoiding the facts? My bag of bones just can't take it anymore. Come in. Oh, Mr. Stewart. How are you, sir? Just fine, Henry. Uh, hello, Stumpy, you gray wolf. Good to meet you. Sir. Howdy. Stumpy had a Charlie horse in his chest muscle. That's why we're baking him in hot towels. He'll be all right shortly. Oh, glad to hear that. For a moment, I uh, I thought my trip was wasted. Huh? What do you mean by that, Mr. Stewart? Well, Stumpy, I've uh, heard the news about your retiring from the ranger service, and uh, well, I want you to come and work for me as chief ranger. I got a lot of private forest that, uh, well, needs expert care. You can name your own price, Stumpy. 
I want your experience and knowledge to protect the thousands of dollars I got tied up in trees. You ain't joking, are you, Mr. Stewart? Oh, I don't joke about things like this. What do you say? Well, I don't know what to say. I'm sure tempted. Give me a week to think it over. By that time, my 30 days will be up. You do fine, Stumpy. We walk three miles at almost double time. Yeah, I'm kind of pleased with myself. You keep wind good after you run block. I think you make fine recovery. Thanks, honey. Hey, here comes Henry like a bunny with a burr in his toes. I wonder what's up. And we know plenty quick. Boy, boy, am I glad I found you guys. What's up, Sonny? A big brown envelope just came in the mail for Bill. It's from Washington. And this is the 29th day. Well, now's the time for a showdown. Let's go. I'm ready. Well, hello, fellas. Hey, Stumpy, you're looking fine. Never mind the hogwash. Tomorrow's the 30th day, and that's why I'm here. You're still gonna throw me out of the Forest Service? Well, what's the big grin for? Yeah, I don't see anything funny about this. Stumpy, you're not going to be retired. Huh? The papers are still here in my desk drawer where I put them after I talk to you. Here, take a look. Uh, but... But what was in the big brown envelope? Just a supply of new reports. While you're catching your breath, let me explain. Regulations say that when a man Stumpy's age is disabled 90 days or longer, he must be retired for safety reasons. I didn't want this to happen. But I knew if I extended sympathy, it would happen. Because you were hurt pretty bad. So I had to put the old fighting spirit back into you, old friend. The doctor gave up, but I didn't. Well, I'll be a horn-toed polecat. How'd you know I could get fit as a fiddle in 30 days? You're a ranger, aren't you? Oh, boy, that was a rough one. Bill sure knows how to handle his men. Yes, sir, even after they've been gored and rolled on by a buffalo bull. See you next week for more adventure with Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill! Warrior of the Woodland! Ranger Bill, Warrior of the Woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Have you ever thought about the water that comes out of the faucet in your house as you fill a glass for a drink? I doubt that many of us have. We take the precious liquid for granted because every time we need it, it's there, and a good supply of it at that. But when there's a drought, the world seems to shrivel up. That's just what's happened around Knotty Pine. There hasn't been more than a half a dozen drops of rain in three solid months. The forests and prairies are so dry that Bill has put out a warning to the farmers and ranchers. There's danger of prairie fire. Grave danger. Let's find out what happens as we hear the story, The Flaming Grass. (laughs) Hal Nessel, the government agricultural agent for Naughty Pine County, visits with several of the key ranchers and farmers in his office. Their topic of discussion is the same as it has been for weeks. When will the rains come? Luther Aiken, Rudy Nichols, and Jason Manders lead the conversation, and the discussion is getting somewhat heated as Hal stands his ground and backs Bill's warning. Now I think you and the rangers are all wet. I wish we were, Luther. 
Bill and I and the prairies and forests. I wish we were soaking wet from rain. That's not what Luther is talking about, Hal. I understand as much, Jason. But you fellas forget one thing. <laughs> Bill Jefferson is a skilled and experienced forest ranger. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Well, maybe he does when it comes to forest and ranger work. But who does he think he is to tell us ranchers and farmers how we should run our affairs? Yeah, yeah. yeah all the newspapers and magazines are carrying articles written by Ranger Bill Jefferson. And they're written for our benefit. We're not novices at this game. No, I've been ranching for 30 years, and my dad ranched before that. And my grand-grandfather. Why, he settled out here. That's right, Jason. And Bill would like you fellows to keep your ranches and farms. He doesn't have to write those articles, you know. Yeah, we know. But does he? Now, listen here, gentlemen. Yeah, that's right. I'm getting a little tired of your criticisms of a man who is trying to help you. Yeah, well, that's too bad. Because we're sick and tired of a forest ranger telling us how to farm our ranches. Yeah. 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 Wh who ever heard of a prairie fire anyway? My grandpa, why, well, he talked to one. That was 80 years ago when the buffalo run the prairie. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, you go right ahead and laugh. But there's an old saying, he who laughs last laughs best. I just hope and pray that Bill and I don't have the last laugh. Because it won't be a funny laugh. It'll be a laugh of despair and anguish. I don't know, fellas. Before it gets much drier, it'll catch fire from our breath. You ain't just joking there, sonny. To dry out here, that even a cactus would shrivel up and blow away. Boy, if a fire ever got started, we wouldn't be able to stop it. The thing would spread faster than you could run, and then some. That's right, pal. Well, this is just like having a lot full of unsold Christmas trees and keeping them until spring. Hey, there's Tom, flying patrol. Yeah. I think I'm going to get more planes in the air today. The only way we can play it safe is to increase our patrolling in the air and on the ground. Ah, uh, here, Prairie. Farmers and ranchers not do yet what you asked them to do, Bill. Yeah, they're just plumb foolish, Gray Wolf. They must think Bill's telling them how to prevent prairie fire just for laughs. Every blade of grass in the prairie is a torch. Look at that long, dry grass along their fence line. Well, the grass in the pastures and ranges isn't so short either. But it sure is dry as an old onion. Say, Bill, how do you pound horse sense into people's heads and make them realize what you tell them is for their own good? Well, I've almost given up, Stumpy. But I think I'll have one more meeting of the county agents in the morning. If that doesn't work, I don't know. You see, this is private property. We've got to stay out. Yeah, I know what you mean. But if this catches fire, though, we'll be invited in pretty quick. Bill, the rangers and state troopers here at the meeting. I thought you said it was only going to be extreme heat. Snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions... Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Have you ever thought about the water that comes out of the faucet in your house as you fill a glass for a drink? I doubt that many of us have. We take the precious liquid for granted because every time we need it, it's there. And a good supply of it at that. But when there's a drought... The world seems to shrivel up. That's just what's happened around Knotty Pine. There hasn't been more than a half a dozen drops of rain in three solid months. The forests and prairies are so dry that Bill has put out a warning to the farmers and ranchers. There's danger of prairie fire. Grave danger. Let's find out what happens as we hear the story, The Flaming Grass. Hal Nessel, the government agricultural agent for Knotty Pine County, visits with several of the key ranchers and farmers in his office. Their topic of discussion is the same as it has been for weeks. When will the rains come? 
Luther Aiken, Rudy Nichols, and Jason Manders lead the conversation, and the discussion is getting somewhat heated as Hal stands his ground and backs Bill's warning. Now, I think you and the Rangers are all wet. I wish we were, Luther. Bill and I and the prairies and forests. I wish we were soaking wet from rain. That's not what Luther is talking about, Hal. I understand as much, Jason. But you fellas forget one thing. <laughs> Bill Jefferson is a skilled and experienced forest ranger. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Well, maybe he does when it comes to forest and ranger work. But who does he think he is to tell us ranchers and farmers how we should run our affairs? Yeah, yeah all the newspapers and magazines are carrying articles written by Ranger Bill Jefferson. And they're written for our benefit. We're not novices at this game. No, I've been ranching for 30 years, and my dad ranched before that. And my grand-grandfather. Why, he's settled out here. That's right, Jason. And Bill would like you fellows to keep your ranches and farms. He doesn't have to write those articles, you know. Yeah, we know. But does he? Now, listen here, gentlemen. Yeah, right. I'm getting a little tired of your criticisms of a man who is trying to help you. Yeah, well, that's too bad. Because we're sick and tired of a forest ranger telling us how to farm our ranches. Yeah. 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 Well, who ever heard of a prairie fire anyway? My grandpa, why well, he talked to one. That was 80 years ago when the buffalo run the prairie. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, you go right ahead and laugh. But there's an old saying, he who laughs last laughs best. I just hope and pray that Bill and I don't have the last laugh. Because it won't be a funny laugh. It'll be a laugh of despair and anguish. I don't know, fellas. Forest gets much drier, it'll catch fire from our breath. You ain't just joking there, sonny. To dry out here, that even a cactus would shrivel up and blow away. Boy, if a fire ever got started, we wouldn't be able to stop it. The thing would spread faster than you could run, and then some. That's right, pal. Well, this is just like having a lot full of unsold Christmas trees and keeping them until spring. Hey, there's Tom flying patrol. Yeah. I think I'm going to get more planes in the air today. The only way we can play it safe is to increase our patrolling in the air and on the ground. Ah, uh, here, Prairie. Farmers and ranchers not do yet what you asked them to do, Bill. Yeah, they're just plum foolish, Gray Wolf. They must think Bill's telling them how to prevent prairie fire just for laughs. Every blade of grass in the prairie is a torch. Look at that long, dry grass along their fence lines. Well, the grass in the pastures and ranges isn't so short either. But it's sure as dry as an old onion. Say, Bill, how do you pound horse sense into people's heads and make them realize what you tell them is for their own good? Well, I've almost given up, Stumpy. But I think I'll have one more meeting of the county agents in the morning. If that doesn't work, I don't know. You see, this is private property. We've got to stay out. Yeah, I know what you mean. But if this catches fire, though, we'll be invited in pretty quick. Bill, the Rangers and state troopers here at the meeting. I thought you said it was only going to be county agents. I did, Henry. But I changed my mind later on. Might as well kill three birds with one stone. Yeah, I see your point, all right. Why go through the same thing three times if it isn't necessary? Yeah, not only that, but it'll save time in the long run. Well, better get started. Right. I'll park myself in this chair. Gentlemen, will you please come to order? Thank you. I thought it best that we meet... And I'll bring you up to date on string heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Have you ever thought about the water that comes out of the faucet in your house as you fill a glass for a drink? I doubt that many of us have. 
We take the precious liquid for granted because every time we need it, it's there, and a good supply of it at that. But when there's a drought, the world seems to shrivel up. That's just what's happened around Knotty Pine. There hasn't been more than a half a dozen drops of rain in three solid months. The forests and prairies are so dry that Bill has put out a warning to the farmers and ranchers. There's danger of prairie fire. Grave danger. Let's find out what happens as we hear the story, The Flaming Grass. Hal Nessel, the government agricultural agent for Naughty Pine County, visits with several of the key ranchers and farmers in his office. Their topic of discussion is the same as it has been for weeks. When will the rains come? Luther Aiken, Rudy Nichols, and Jason Manders lead the conversation, and the discussion is getting somewhat heated as Hal stands his ground and backs Bill's warning. Now, I think you and the rangers are all wet. I wish we were, Luther. Bill and I and the prairies and forests. I wish we were soaking wet from rain. That's not what Luther is talking about, Hal. I understand as much, Jason. But you fellas forget one thing. <laughs> Bill Jefferson is a skilled and experienced forest ranger. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, maybe he does when it comes to forest and ranger work. But who does he think he is to tell us ranchers and farmers how we should run our affairs? Yeah, yeah all the newspapers and magazines are carrying articles written by Ranger Bill Jefferson. And they're written for our benefit. We're not novices at this game. No, I've been ranching for 30 years, and my dad ranched before that. And my grand-grandfather. Why, he settled out here. That's right, Jason. And Bill would like you fellows to keep your ranches and farms. He doesn't have to write those articles, you know. Yeah, we know. But does he? Now, listen here, gentlemen. Yeah, I'm right. getting a little tired of your criticisms of a man who is trying to help you. Yeah, well, that's too bad. Because we're sick and tired of a forest ranger telling us how to farm our ranches. Yeah. 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 Well, who ever heard of a prairie fire anyway? My grandpa, why, well, he talked to one. That was 80 years ago when the buffalo roamed the prairie. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, you go right ahead and laugh. But there's an old saying, he who laughs last laughs best. I just hope and pray that Bill and I don't have the last laugh. Because it won't be a funny laugh. It'll be a laugh of despair and anguish. I don't know, fellas. Before it gets much drier, it'll catch fire from our breath. You ain't just joking there, sonny. To dry out here, that even a cactus would shrivel up and blow away. Boy, if a fire ever got started, we wouldn't be able to stop it. The thing would spread faster than you could run, and then some. That's right, pal. Well, this is just like having a lot full of unsold Christmas trees and keeping them until spring. Hey, there's Tom flying patrol. Yeah. I think I'm going to get more planes in the air today. The only way we can play it safe is to increase our patrolling in the air and on the ground. Ah, uh, here, Prairie. Farmers and ranchers not do yet what you asked them to do, Bill. Yeah, they're just plum foolish, Gray Wolf. They must think Bill's telling them how to prevent prairie fire just for laughs. Every blade of grass in the prairie is a torch. Look at that long, dry grass along their fence lines. Well, the grass in the pastures and ranges isn't so short either. But it's sure as dry as an old onion. Say, Bill, how do you pound horse sense into people's heads and make them realize what you tell them is for their own good? Well, I've almost given up, Stumpy. But I think I'll have one more meeting of the county agents in the morning. If that doesn't work, I don't know. You see, this is private property. We've got to stay out. Yeah, I know what you mean. But if this catches fire, though, we'll be invited in pretty quick. Bill, the Rangers and State Troopers here at the meeting. I thought you said it was only going to be county agents. I did, Henry. But I changed my mind later on. Might as well kill three birds with one stone. Yeah, I see your point, all right. 
Why go through the same thing three times if it isn't necessary? Yeah, not only that, but it'll save time in the long run. Well, better get started. Right. I'll park myself in this chair. Gentlemen, will you please come to order? Thank you. I thought it best that we meet, and I'll bring you up to date on string heat. Snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Have you ever thought about the water that comes out of the faucet in your house as you fill a glass for a drink? I doubt that many of us have. We take the precious liquid for granted because every time we need it, it's there and a good supply of it at that. But when there's a drought, the world seems to shrivel up. That's just what's happened around Knotty Pine. There hasn't been more than a half a dozen drops of rain in three solid months. The forests and prairies are so dry that Bill has put out a warning to the farmers and ranchers. There's danger of prairie fire. Grave danger. Let's find out what happens as we hear the story, The Flaming Grass. Hal Nessel, the government agricultural agent for Naughty Pine County, visits with several of the key ranchers and farmers in his office. Their topic of discussion is the same as it has been for weeks. When will the rains come? Luther Aiken, Rudy Nichols, and Jason Manders lead the conversation, and the discussion is getting somewhat heated as Hal stands his ground and backs Bill's warning. Now, I think you and the rangers are all wet. I wish we were, Luther. Bill and I and the prairies and forests. I wish we were soaking wet from rain. That's not what Luther is talking about, Hal. I understand as much, Jason. But you fellas forget one thing. (laughs) Bill Jefferson is a skilled and experienced forest ranger. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, Maybe he does when it comes to forest and ranger work. But who does he think he is to tell us ranchers and farmers how we should run our affairs? Yeah, Yeah, all the newspapers and magazines are carrying articles written by Ranger Bill Jefferson. And they're written for our benefit. We're not novices at this game. I've been ranching for 30 years, and my dad ranched before that. And my grand-grandfather. Why, he settled out here. That's right, Jason. And Bill would like you fellows to keep your ranches and farms. He doesn't have to write those articles, you know. Yeah, we know. But does he? Now, listen here, gentlemen. I'm getting a little tired of your criticisms of a man who is trying to help you. Yeah, well, that's too bad. Because we're sick and tired of a forest ranger telling us how to farm our ranches. Yeah. 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 Who ever heard of a prairie fire anyway? My grandpa, why, he talked to one. That was 80 years ago when the buffalo roamed the prairie. (laughs) 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 Well, gentlemen, you go right ahead and laugh. But there's an old saying, he who laughs last laughs best. I just hope and pray that Bill and I don't have the last laugh. Because it won't be a funny laugh. It'll be a laugh of despair and anguish. I don't know, fellas. Before it gets much drier, it'll catch fire from our breath. You ain't just joking there, sonny. To dry out here, that even a cactus would shrivel up and blow away. Boy, if a fire ever got started, we wouldn't be able to stop it. The thing would spread faster than you could run, and then some. That's right, pal. Well, this is just like having a lot full of unsold Christmas trees and keeping them until spring. Hey, there's Tom, flying patrol. Yeah. I think I'm going to get more planes in the air today. The only way we can play it safe is to increase our patrolling in the air and on the ground. Ah, here, Prairie. Farmers and ranchers not do yet what you asked them to do, Bill. Yeah, they're just plumb foolish, Gray Wolf. They must think Bill's telling them how to prevent prairie fire just for laughs. Every blade of grass in the prairie is a torch. Look at that long, dry grass along their fence line. The grass in the pastures and ranges isn't so short either. But it sure is dry as an old onion. 
Say, Bill, how do you pound horse sense into people's heads and make them realize what you tell them is for their own good? Well, I've almost given up, Stumpy. But I think I'll have one more meeting of the county agents in the morning. If that doesn't work, I don't know. You see, this is private property. We've got to stay out. Yeah, I know what you mean. But if this catches fire, though, we'll be invited in pretty quick. Bill, the rangers and state troopers here at the meeting. I thought you said it was only going to be county agents. I did, Henry. But I changed my mind later on. Might as well kill three birds with one stone. Yeah, I see your point all right. Why go through the same thing three times if it isn't necessary? Yeah, not only that, but it'll save time in the long run. Well, better get started. Right. I'll park myself in this chair. Gentlemen... Will you please come to order? Thank you. I thought it best that we meet, and I'll bring you up to date on... string heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Have you ever thought about the water that comes out of the faucet in your house as you fill a glass for a drink? I doubt that many of us have. We take the precious liquid for granted because every time we need it, it's there, and a good supply of it at that. But when there's a drought, the world seems to shrivel up. That's just what's happened around Knotty Pine. There hasn't been more than a half a dozen drops of rain in three solid months. The forests and prairies are so dry that Bill has put out a warning to the farmers and ranchers. There's danger of prairie fire. Grave danger. Let's find out what happens as we hear the story, The Flaming Grass. Hal Nessel, the government agricultural agent for Naughty Pine County, visits with several of the key ranchers and farmers in his office. Their topic of discussion is the same as it has been for weeks. When will the rains come? Luther Aiken, Rudy Nichols, and Jason Manders lead the conversation, and the discussion is getting somewhat heated as Hal stands his ground and backs Bill's warning. Now, I think you and the rangers are all wet. I wish we were, Luther. Bill and I and the prairies and forests. I wish we were soaking wet from rain. That's not what Luther is talking about, Hal. I understand as much, Jason. But you fellas forget one thing. <laughs> Bill Jefferson is a skilled and experienced forest ranger. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, maybe he does when it comes to forest and ranger work. But who does he think he is to tell us ranchers and farmers how we should run our affairs? Yeah, yeah. yeah all the newspapers and magazines are carrying articles written by Ranger Bill Jefferson. And they're written for our benefit. We're not novices at this game. No, I've been ranching for 30 years, and my dad ranched before that. And my grand-grandfather. Why, he said a lot here. That's right, Jason. And Bill would like you fellows to keep your ranches and farms. He doesn't have to write those articles, you know. Yeah, we know. But does he? Now, listen here, gentlemen. Yeah, I'm right. getting a little tired of your criticisms of a man who is trying to help you. Yeah, well, that's too bad. Because we're sick and tired of a forest ranger telling us how to farm our ranches. Yeah. 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 Well, who ever heard of a prairie fire anyway? My grandpa, why, well, he talked to one. That was 80 years ago when the buffalo roamed the prairie. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, you go right ahead and laugh. But there's an old saying, he who laughs last laughs best. I just hope and pray that Bill and I don't have the last laugh. Because it won't be a funny laugh. It'll be a laugh of despair and anguish. I don't know, fellas. Before it gets much drier, it'll catch fire from our breath. You ain't just joking there, sonny. To dry out here, that even a cactus would shrivel up and blow away. Boy, if a fire ever got started, we wouldn't be able to stop it. 
The thing would spread faster than you could run, and then some. That's right, pal. Well, this is just like having a lot full of unsold Christmas trees and keeping them until spring. Hey, there's Tom, flying patrol. Yeah. I think I'm going to get more planes in the air today. The only way we can play it safe is to increase our patrolling in the air and on the ground. Ah, uh, here, Prairie. Farmers and ranchers not do yet what you asked them to do, Bill. Yeah, they're just plumb foolish, Gray Wolf. They must think Bill's telling them how to prevent prairie fire just for laughs. Every blade of grass in the prairie is a torch. Look at that long, dry grass along their fence line. Well, the grass in the pastures and ranges isn't so short either. But it's sure as dry as an old onion. Say, Bill, how do you pound horse sense into people's heads and make them realize what you tell them is for their own good? Well, I've almost given up, Stumpy. But I think I'll have one more meeting of the county agents in the morning. If that doesn't work, I don't know. You see, this is private property. We've got to stay out. Yeah, I know what you mean. But if this catches fire, though, we'll be invited in pretty quick. Bill, the rangers and state troopers here at the meeting. I thought you said it was only going to be county agents. I did, Henry. But I changed my mind later on. Might as well kill three birds with one stone. Yeah, I see your point, all right. Why go through the same thing three times if it isn't necessary? Yeah, not only that, but it'll save time in the long run. Well, better get started. Right. I'll park myself in this chair. Gentlemen, will you please come to order? Thank you. I thought it best that we meet... And I'll bring you up to date on string heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Every year at this time, Bill goes to the State University to lecture. Bill's lecture is given to the student body as a whole, but it's directed toward those studying geology and anthropology. The lecture is on the science of staying alive in the mountains and forests. You see, many of the students go into the mountains and forests to gather material firsthand under the leadership of competent guides and with the rangers constantly checking on their well-being. What Bill is trying to do is prevent the isolated adventurers from going out into the wild country and becoming casualties because they haven't the knowledge of survival. Say, we'd better perhaps get into our story. This one is called Fossil Canyon. We're ready to begin the second hour of your lecture, Bill. That's fine, Dean Sands. How's your voice holding up? <laughs> as long as this pitcher of water holds out, I'll be able to keep my windmill running all right. <laughs> Who ever heard of a, of a windmill run with water? <laughs> yeah, you're looking at one, sir. <laughs> I hardly think that. But I'm enjoying your sense of humor. I never tire of hearing you talk about survival in the outdoors. I'll never forget your first lecture three years ago. My, little did I realize how much knowledge and experience a man must have to, to stay alive when meeting nature face to face. 
But, well, we're not here to listen to me. I'll make a few introductory remarks and turn the rostrum over to you. That'll be fine with me. Uh, perhaps they have some questions first. Attention, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jefferson suggested that uh, you may have some questions before he begins this second half of the lecture. If you have, uh, then you can ask them now. Yeah, I have a question, Dean Sands. I'll yield the rise from to Mr. Jefferson, Bob. Then he can answer you direct. Uh, Bill, if you please. Thank you, Dean. Now, Bob, fire your question. Uh, your first hour lecture was interesting, but... I object to the inference you made that we're not able to take care of ourselves. Are you making that inference, Mr. Jefferson? Yes, Bob, I am. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson, I think you're underestimating our ability. We're adults. It's been my experience that college students are the hardest to convince that they should keep out of the wild country. Also, it's a statistical fact that college students are highest on the casualty list. And I might add, on the mortality list. I can't swallow that, Mr. Jefferson. Why should we be the highest on the casualty list? Because you let your zest for scientific data run away with your common sense. You wander into places that even experienced guides and rangers avoid, if at all possible. You mean to tell me that I couldn't go out into the boondocks and survive? You've hit the nail right on the head, Bob. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Perhaps a true story will convince you. Oh, it'll have to be a good one to convince me that I or any student couldn't go out into the wild country and come back alive. I'm sure you'll be convinced, Bob. Members of the faculty and student body, the story I'm about to tell you is true. It illustrates to perfection what I've been telling you. Dean Sands remembers this tragic story very well, even though it happened several years ago. Virgil Adams and Stanley Grimshaw, both State University students, decided to go into Fossil Canyon. Virgil and Stanley didn't know that it's 115 degrees at the bottom of Fossil Canyon, and there were a lot of other things they didn't know about that death trap. I'd sure like to find a good fossil down here, Stan. So would I. They've been found here before, only last year, as a matter of fact. Huh? Well, Professor Glomkin would give us a good boost toward our degree if we made a real find. I'll say you would, Virg. Yeah. I'm going to make as good a collection of the, all the fossils I can find, mm. even if we don't stumble onto the big one. Mm, so am I. I'd rather find a good specimen prehistoric age. Hey, uh... We're only halfway down to the bottom of the canyon. Let's step it up and get down there before it begins to get dark. Then we can do some work. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Let's go. What's the matter, Stan? I guess it's the heat, Verge. I didn't think it was this hot down here. I didn't either. I, I'm beginning to feel the heat myself. Look at my shirt. It, it's wringing wet. Let's stop and rest a while. Yeah, sure. I could use a rest, too. Boy, there isn't a breath of air moving down here at all. You said it. We've still got another third of the way to go. Let's, let's stop. I'm really getting sick. Yeah, well, let's try to make the bottom. Then then we'll rest a long time. It isn't far. I don't know if I can make it, but I'll try. Man alive, it's, it's miserably hot down here. I'm beginning to feel lightheaded. Let's stop and leave our packs and gear here. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Feel any better, Stan? No. You? No. Hey, Stan, let, let, let's try to cross the canyon and get in the shade. This sun is terrific. Go ahead. I'll follow you if I can. Verge, I can't make it. I'm 
I'm going to faint. Burge, do you hear me? Uh, I hear you, Stan. You, you got to make the shade. Uh, I can't help you because I can hardly stand on my feet myself. I can't see you, Burge. Burge, I can't make it. Help me. Don't don't leave me out here in the heat and sun. Oh. Oh. Stan. Stan, try to get up. You hear me? I'll try to help you. Where are you, Stan? Stan, I, I can't see you. Water. I, I gotta get water. I... It, Virgil and Stanley made many mistakes on their trip to Fossil Canyon. The reason Virgil couldn't see Stanley was that Stanley had fallen behind a large rock. It had also fallen into quicksand. Real quicksand. He was never seen again. Bill, uh, will you point out the mistakes that the two young men made? I'll be glad to, Dean Sands. First of all, Virgil and Stanley never should have entered the canyon in the heat of the day. They should have waited until sunset, or early in the morning is even a better time. Dean, I think continuing the story will drive home the mistakes more strongly than if I were to talk on them now. Perhaps you're right, Bill. Do as you wish. Thank you. My rangers and I were at our headquarters when we found out about this whole thing. You want me to get the phone, Bill? Thanks, pal, but I'll take it. Okay, it's probably for you anyhow. Hello, Ranger Headquarters, Bill Jefferson speaking. Mr. Jefferson, this is Dean Sands over at State University. Oh, yes, Dean. How are you? Physically, I'm fine, Mr. Jefferson. Mentally, I'm worried. Oh, is that right? What's on your mind? One of our students, Virgil Adams, is missing. He hasn't returned as scheduled. When was he supposed to be back, Dean? Yesterday morning. Well, perhaps he'd been delayed somewhere and couldn't get word to you. You've spoken more truth than fiction, my friend. What do you mean? Well, his classmates say that he told them he was going to Fossil Canyon. Fossil Canyon? What's the matter, Mr. Jefferson? Why, we just brought out the remains of a human being from Fossil Canyon three days ago. The week before that, we lugged out another. <sighs> this could be tragic. Glad I called you. Will you please check the canyon for Virgil Adams? We most certainly will. I'll call you as soon as we know something definite. Bill, you got an angry look on your face. I get scared when you get that gleam in your eye like you've got now. I am angry, pal. I'm going to get a letter off to Colonel Anders when we get back. A good, strong letter. Now, will it be about Fossil Canyon? Yeah. Something's got to be done about that place. What? I don't know. Stumpy, how many times have you been down there? Well, not any more than I have to, sonny. The only time I go into that miserable hole is to bring out greenhorn tenderfeet lashed to the back of a horse. No man in his right mind would go in there. Here's the canyon rim. Let's hold it up, fellas. Oh, 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 oh boy. Now scan the canyon floor with your glasses. You might see Virgil and save time. Oh, not plenty of good idea. Yeah, there's lots of rocks and boulders down there that could hide him. You said a mouthful there, sonny. But as big as the canyon is, we might spot something that'll tell us where he's at. Well, I don't see anything. How about the rest of you? Uh, I can't see anything but rocks and more rocks. That goes for me, too. Lots of rocks, but no human being. You spotted something, Grewal? There. Vulture flying over top of canyon. Ah, oh, yes, I see him too. Look to your rifles, fellas. We gotta keep these terrible birds off the ground. If you see him dive, then open fire. Oh, boy, you said it, Bill. Those birds give me the shivers. They're only 
we fly around the dead. Let's go. Get him, get him, get him. Come on, Jimmy. Let's take it easy going down, fellas. When we get to the bottom, we'll stop and rest before going on. It's 115 degrees down there. <laughs> Bill, uh, will you tell the student body what preparations you made before going down into that uh, natural oven? Gladly, Dean Sands. First of all, each man had four canteens of water, two for himself and two for his horse. If needed, a third one could also be used for his horse. The horse is doing all the work and needs the water. If the horse collapses, the man's in a bad way. We keep a close watch on the animals to be sure they perspire freely. That's a healthy condition and means that their bodies are cooling. On the trip into the canyon, we stopped frequently and rested the horses. Also, each man swabbed his animal's mouth to keep it moist. We kept our sun helmets pulled down, our sunglasses on, and our shirts buttoned up to the neck to keep the sun's rays off our bodies, especially the backs of our necks. After about two hours, we reached the bottom of the canyon. Now, oh, that hot air. Yeah, man, why? We go west. This heat is murderous. That's putting it mildly, pal. Let's hold up, fellas. Oh, King. Easy, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. Loosen the cinch straps and give the horses a chance to relax a bit before we go on. You better give him a small amount of water, too. Uh, okay, we Bill. Bill. <sighs> you pour the water, Henry, and I'll hold this here bucket. All right, Stumpy. Yeah, just a little bit now, Henry. You only need enough to wet their mouths and throats. We'll give them a good drink after dark. How's that? Yeah, yeah just dandy. Well, give them each a mouthful, then we can go on. Bill, I not see any signs of man here yet. I know. I've been looking around, too. Actually, we're not sure Virgil's down here. The dean said it's only supposition. But we'll have to look thoroughly anyhow. Ah, uh, not right. All right, let's get ready to ride, fellas. Henry and I'll take the west end of the canyon, and you two will take the east end. Give a yodel if you find anything. Yeah, we do. We'll, right, we'll, we'll get right at it. Sure is hot down here. I'm really beginning to feel it. Take a drink of water, pal. Not too much. You'll get a waterlogged feeling. It isn't good. Just enough to keep your body from dehydrating. Oh, okay, Bill. Let's ride a long way to the West End. There's another trail leading into here. Virgil may have come down it. Uh, okay. How do you feel now? Oh, much better. That's fine. Keep a sharp eye out for anything that belongs to a man. Uh, we find nothing, old-timer. I'm glad for that. Yeah, me too, young feller. It's so hot down here that I could fry an egg on my saddle horn. If Bill and Henry don't find anything, that means this Virgil feller ain't down here. Uh, that make me happy. Hello! Stumpy! Gray Wolf! Hello! We found him! Okay, Bill, we hear you. <laughs> Guess we talk too soon, Gray Wolf. Not what I'm afraid of. We better ride and join Bill and Henry. Ah, 
in plenty bad shape. No, Almost say dead. he is. Another hour and be all over. Let's get him into the shade and give him first aid, fellas. Henry, get a canteen on the first aid kit off a of storm, will you? Yeah, sure, Bill. Right away. All right, let's lift him together, fellas. Carry him over in the shade. Okay, Bill. Uh, I ready. Say when. You all set, Stumpy? You sure am. On the count of three. Okay, one, two... Help, Bill! I'm stuck in quicksand! Quicksand? Let's go, fellas. Henry, don't move. Right. You'll go down faster. Gray Wolf, Stumpy, hold my feet. I'm going to stretch myself out and grab him. Okay, make it fast, Bill. Not real quicksand. Hurry, hurry, Bill. Keep your arms up so I can grab him, Henry. He sink plenty quick. I'll start to sink myself soon. When I grab Henry's hands, you fellas pull away. I'll have to hold my breath because my face will be in the sand. Oh, we do that. Couple of inches more, Bill. There, you got him. Gotcha. Hold tight. We're going to pull you out. Pull, Stumpy. Pull. Pull it out, fellas. Pull harder. Hey, I'm free. How your face feel now, Bill? You have it plenty far into quicksand. I feels okay, Gwilf. But my lungs would burst before Henry hollered he was free. Yeah, it was quite a scare, all right. How'd you get into that there, St. Cole, young feller? Oh, I suddenly got off your light-headed. Must have staggered into it. Boy, that was close. That's real quicksand. Well, thank the Lord that you're safe. I know somebody that wasn't as fortunate as Henry was. Uh, what are you ta- Virgil. talking about? I'm not talking about Virgil, fellas. Well, you, mean, you mean there was another man and he fell into oh, the quicksand? Well, yeah, that's what I mean, pal. Oh, well, boy, who, who this? Boy. Well, uh, how'd you find this yeah. out, young feller? Yeah, how come you didn't say something about it before? Yes, Bill. Well, I wasn't sure for a while. Both men wear the same size shoes. I thought that Virgil might have been doubling back on his own trail because he was delirious from the heat. Then I found definite trail signs that there were two men. Oh, not very tragic. One of them died in quicksand. Yes, it is tragic, Grey Wolf. He must have wandered into the death pit. But we can't worry about him right now. We've got to get Virgil out of here and get him to Naughty Pine Hospital. <laughs> Boy, am I glad to get out of Fossil Canyon. That place gives me the creeps. It even smells like death. Hey, you can say that again, youngster. That there hole in the ground reminds me of an open grave. Hold it up here, fellas. Okay. Whoa, whoa, Easy, boy. Boy. whoa, Storm. Whoa, oh, Matilde. Henry, unpack the radio. I'll help Gray Wolf and Stumpy lift Virgil off of Storm. You not take Virgil out by horseback, Bill? No, Gray Wolf. I'm afraid the long ride might do him in. I'll have him picked up by helicopter. Dean, this is Bill Jefferson. Yes, Mr. Jefferson. Have you found him? Yes. He's in Naughty Pine Hospital right now. We flew him back by helicopter. The doctor says we got to him just in time. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Uh, are you going to be at your office for an hour, Dean? Well, um, I was going home, but uh, I can wait for you. Will you please? It's extremely important. 
While you're waiting for us, will you find out if anybody else went to Fossil Canyon with Virgil? I certainly will. I'll see you in an hour. Right. Goodbye. Let's pile into the car, fellas. We're going to college. That's the story up to date, Dean Sands. Gruesome as it is. Oh, it's terrible. Why can't these young men learn by other people's experiences? We didn't take time to check for more evidence as to the identity of the other man because I was primarily concerned with saving Virgil's life. Yes, I understand, Bill. I began checking carefully after you called, and I find that Stanley Grimshaw is missing. Oh? Whether or not he went with Virgil can't be determined. Thanks, Dean. We'll check with the hospital and let you know what we find. Perhaps we can talk with Virgil. I'd like to talk with Virgil, Doctor. I'm sorry, Bill. I can't allow it. But I thought you said we got to Virgil just in time. I'm sorry I made a misleading statement, Bill. What I meant was that life was just about gone, and you found him before it was too late. He's suffering from shock, exposure, heat exhaustion, and sunstroke. I'm sorry, but you can't talk to him. Well, this is extremely important, Doctor. We're sure that another man lost his life in the canyon, but we don't know who this man is. I'd like to help you, Bill, but I've got to think of my patient first. Perhaps in a day or so you can question him. Okay, Doc. I know you would if you thought it was all right. Let's go out and talk to the students, fellas. Say, young feller, can you tell me if Stanley Grimshaw hung around with Virgil Thompson? Well, they're a friendly, Ranger. I'd say they palled around together. Did Stanley say anything to you about going to Fossil Canyon? Well, no, he didn't. He's my roommate, too. However, I went home over the weekend. Professor, you hear anything about Stanley and Virgil going to Fossil Canyon together? I don't recall hearing anything about that, Ranger. If I did, I would have warned them against going through with it. We're up a tree, Bill. Nobody knows a thing about those two. What now? Well, let's go back to the hospital, Henry. Perhaps we can talk to Virgil now. I'm sorry, Bill. Virgil's not responding the way he should. I'm afraid it'll be three days before he's out of the woods. Okay, Doc. But we can't wait three days. Fellas, let's saddle up and go out to the canyon and do our own sleuthing. Virgil and Person X had horses when they got here, fellas. That's right, Sonny. But they let the horses get away. Those two fellas are real tenderfeet. Uh, two men get off horses and walk down into a canyon. Yeah, I wonder why they did that. They should have ridden down into the canyon. Well, perhaps they weren't experienced enough to handle the horses on a steep down grade. Let's ride down and watch for some of their gear along the way. Plenty of trail sign along here. Shouldn't be hard to find some of the gear. Are uh, you plenty right, Stumpy? Hey, look up ahead there. There's some gear alongside the trail. Come get on, Get him, get him, get him, get him, boy. Whoa, Oh, boy. I'll take this pack. Stumpy, you take the other. Henry, Gray Wolf. Look through the other gear. Oh, we yeah, do okay. Well, let's see. You hold it. I found something, I think. Yeah, what is it, Bill? Here's a notebook with a name in it. Stanley Grimshaw. Bob, 
I hope you and your fellow students are now convinced that it takes knowledge and experience to survive out in the wild country. Uh, you're right, Mr. Jefferson. I'm thoroughly convinced. Well, I'm glad to hear that I've driven my point home. That's the sole purpose of this lecture. <coughs> if I can save your lives by talking to you, then my time is well spent. Uh, one more question, please. Go right ahead, Bob. Uh, how'd you close off the canyon? Well, we've put up a fence and a gate around both entrances to the canyon. On each gate is a sign. It reads, Keep out of Fossil Canyon unless you want to become a fossil yourself. <laughs> That's really sound advice, Bill. Certainly the students of State U should learn from their classmates' tragic experiences. I know that I wouldn't go into Fossil Canyon if I was paid to do it. See you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Sometimes young people make mistakes, and one big mistake is that of getting in with the wrong crowd. This is the story of young George Bruce. It's a story of how George made a very serious mistake and was sent away for a while to think about it. And when he came back to Naughty Pine, the good folk there didn't think they should let George forget that he's been away to reform school. It's also a story of how Ranger Bill tried to help young George make the grade, and then got in the middle of what looked like a double cross. But let's go back a couple of months and look inside the office of the principal of the reform school. He's talking to young George Bruce. Now, George, you're going back out into the outside world to try to live a normal life again. Yes, sir. You got to try hard, my boy. But it isn't going to be easy. Too many folks know about you, and well, they don't forget. Yes, I know. You know, society is very quick to call for punishment on the heads of those who make mistakes. But sometimes they're slow in offering a helping hand to those who've paid for their mistake. Well, I'll try my best to make the grade, sir. I don't want to come back here, ever. <laughs> That's the spirit. I don't want you to come back either. This is one place where I don't extend a return invitation. Well... Goodbye, George. Goodbye, sir. And thanks for helping me. <laughs> That's quite all right, son. Keep your chin up and look them square in the eye. You've nothing to be ashamed of. You advertise for an office boy here, mister? Uh, why, yes. Come in. We'll talk it over. What's your name, son? George Bruce, sir. Oh, yes. Uh, you uh, were in the papers, weren't you? Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, we can't use you right now. Maybe some other time. I see. All right. Thanks anyway. Say, mister, you advertise for a gas station assistant? Yep. Want the job? Yes, sir. Yeah, you look like a strong, intelligent lad. Not afraid of work, are you? Oh, no, sir. All right. When can you start? Right now, if you want me to. Okay with me. Grab a rag and get them coveralls on over there. Sure, right away, mister. Or say, uh, what's your name? My name's George. George what? Did you have a last name? Yes, it's Bruce. George Bruce, eh? 
Oh, uh, say, you, you ain't the kid that just got out of reform school, are you? Yes, sir, I am. Oh, I'm sorry, boy, no job. Bad for business to have you around here. Got to think of a business. <laughs> Bill, you know who I am, don't you? Sure, you're Wayne Bruce, uh, George Bruce's dad. You sure got a head for remembering. Well, I uh, guess I've got a head, all right. <laughs> Place to hang my hat, anyway. <laughs> uh, can I help you, Wayne? Yes, Bill, you, you can. It's, it's about George. He, well, he's not doing so good. Can't get a job, is that it, Wayne? That's right, Bill. Nobody will give the boy a break. Trouble is, they'll be sending him back to reform school if he doesn't get work pretty soon. You know, people are cruel, Bill. Just downright cruel. Yes, Wayne, a lot of people are. But it may make you feel better to know that I want to help the lad make a clean new start in life. Now, you tell George I want to see him tomorrow afternoon. And not to worry about getting a job. Oh, Bill, you're a real friend. I won't forget this, believe me. Not in your life. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Hey, Bill, wait up, will you? Sure thing. What do you want, Cal? Where you been keeping yourself, boy? I haven't seen you for a coon's age. <laughs> the question is mutual. I guess the sheriff leads a busy life just like the rangers, eh? <laughs> boy, you're not joking. Right now I'm checking on the Bruce lad. See if he's behaving himself. George Bruce? Hmm. You needn't worry about George. Boy hasn't been able to find work yet. That won't be for long. I'm going to talk to a friend of mine about giving the fella a job. Ugh, wasting your time, Bill. Once these kids turn bad, they stay bad. I've seen it happen too often. Yeah, maybe you have, Cal. The thing is, I never see anybody giving these fellas a hand. Oh, we all make mistakes. Some make worse mistakes than others, that's all. They need help to get on their feet. But nobody wants to help them. Now, look, Bill, you take it from me. I know about these things. The sheriff, I've seen a lot of them come out of reform school, and they always go back. Only when they do, they go to prison instead. We'll see that this doesn't happen to George, Cal. Take it easy on the kid and give him his chance to make good, will you? Oh, sure. Sure I will, Bill. Well, got to run along. <laughs> Same here. Uh, drop around the office when you get time. Yeah, first chance I get, Bill. So long. So long, Cal. And uh, don't believe the worst about George. We'll see if we can make him an exception to the rule. Hello, Frenchie. How you doing, big fella? <laughs> oh, Bill, my friend. It is so good to see you. That's yeah, good to see you too, Frenchie. How you doing? Still cutting them down to your size? Oh, Frenchy, <laughs> he always swings the ox. Uh, what you say, uh, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> say, oh, by the way, uh, you come up on the social visit or business? Well, uh, a little of each. Mostly business, Frenchy. And uh, what kind of business you want with Frenchy? You buy timber? No, Frenchy, uh, I want to build some. Hey, what you mean, Bill? Frenchy, uh, there's a young friend of mine. His name is George Bruce. George got into a little trouble a while back. Made a mistake, but he's paid for it. Now he's trying to start over again. Only the folks in town won't give him a break. He just get out of reform school? Yes, a couple of months ago. And he hasn't been able to land a job yet. How about it, Frenchy? You give this boy a break, I'll vouch for him. Oh, you no need vouch for him, Bill. Frenchy, remember when he not so hot himself some time ago now. Bring the young fella around. Frenchy, do shall give him job and give him good name again. Thanks, Frenchy. You're an understanding man. If the world had more people in it like you, it would be a lot happier place to live in. I'll bring the boy up in the morning. A 
do you feel about this, George? Great. I sure owe you a lot, Bill. And you won't be sorry. I'll make good. I know you will. Frenchie will see to that. Now, I don't want you to be afraid of Frenchie. He's a big bulk of a man, a French-Canadian. He's got a heart as big as his body. He'll understand. You see, George, Frenchie's made some mistakes, too. You mean that, Bill? Yeah. And he's made good, especially since he became a Christian. Oh? He's the top foreman of this big lumbering outfit. He's doing very well. So you see, young fella, it can be done. Sure it can, Bill. If they'll only give a fella a chance. That's right. They'll only do that little thing. Let's see. We'll be at the camp in about ten minutes. <laughs> I'm glad Bill helped young George Bruce. It makes big difference, all right. Yeah. The way these people in town act, they'd just as soon send him back to reform school. Uh, Tom, uh, we ought to send some of them pumpkin heads off the clink. Maybe they wouldn't be so snooty when they got out. Well, some of these eggheads here in town ought to be glad it ain't raining. What's rain got to do with it, Stumpy? Why, they'd all drown because they got their noses turned up so high. <laughs> Old-timer, I think you've got something there. <laughs> well, thank you, Gray Wolf. Them's mighty kind words. Hey, Bill should be back soon. We'd better pack up. You know, he says we're going out on the trail for a couple of weeks. Yep. We're going to look for a big diamondback rattler for the zoo. They need one, you know. The old one died. Now, I've got a feeling that I shouldn't ask this question. I can kind of tell by the look in Stumpy's eye. <laughs> you might as well ask it, because he'll tell us anyhow. Yeah, that's right. He can't take a hint. Okay, Stumpy, tell me how the old rattler died. Well, sir, <laughs> he got caught in the front door of the snake house. Thought he was a doorbell and buzzed himself to death. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> hey, hey, just a minute. Hey, listen. I think I hear the boss man driving up out front. Oh, good. Now we find out how young George made out on his first day on new job. Hi, Bill. Hello, fellas. How's Trent? What's the good news about George, Bill? Well, it's all good, I'm happy to say. He's doing fine. Even better than I expected. Great. Yes, sir, it sure is. Just shows that if you have faith in human beings, they won't let you down. That is, the Lord's guiding them. You say, George, uh, maybe you like to run the errand for Frenchy, eh? Huh? Well, sure, Frenchy. Anything you say. <laughs> that is a good boy. Look, uh, I want you to take the ton and a half truck into town. Uh, drop the saw at the freight depot. I send it back for repairs. Anything else you want me to do? <laughs> More work, eh? Uh, we, you can do something else. Uh, go over to the bank and pick up the payroll on your way back. You mean me? You trust me with the payroll, Frenchy? No, oh, you tell Frenchy why not. The Frenchy trusts you. The big boss, he trusts you. You bring the payroll back, huh? Eh? Well, sure, Frenchy, sure. Is there much money? $2,500 in the manila envelope. Whew, that's a lot of money. Maybe I should have protection. Maybe you like to take the Count Moscow along, huh? Well, sure, I'll take Blackie along. That's a good idea. Here, Blackie. Come on, boy. Here, boy. Well, go now. I'll show you a buck before dark. Okay, Frenchie. Come on, Blackie. We're going for a ride. <laughs> Well, here's Lumberjack's payroll, young fella. $2,500. Wow, that's a lot of money, isn't it? That's right. Now, I'll put the money in this heavy manila envelope and seal it, okay? There you are. Well, thanks. I'm all set. Let's go, Blackie. <laughs> Thank you. 
Some pretty bad downgrades going back to camp, Blackie, old fella. I sure hope the brakes in this truck are okay. Well, we ought to be back to camp in about half an hour. Say, I'd better slow up for that turn. Hey, this isn't funny. Say, what's wrong? I can't slow down. The brakes. Here, I'll try the emergency. <laughs> Blackie, we'll never make that turn down there. We'll go off the road, sure. Come here, pup. You can't go out through the windshield. Hold it. We're going to crash. Ranger Tom calling headquarters. Tom calling headquarters. Come in, headquarters. Over. Come in, Tom. Bill to Tom. Come in, old boy. I'm flying the copter along the Lumberjacks Highway, and right now I'm looking at a ton and a half truck. Crashed into some trees on a curve. Better take a look, Bill. Right. We'll be on our way at once. Any sign of life? No. No, not a sign. driving it. We'll know in a minute. His brakes must have give out. Nobody in his right mind come barreling down here that fast to clip. Here's the driver. It's George. Get a crowbar out of the truck, Stumpy, and we'll pry this door open and get him to the hospital. How are you feeling now, George? Pretty good, Bill. Kind of trembly. Doc says you just got bruised up a bit. Nothing serious. Sure thankful for that. You had close call, George. You said it, Gray Wolf. Boy, I sure was scared when I found out the brakes wouldn't hold. Cal, what brings you here? Checking up on the accident? No, Bill. Something much more serious. Huh? What's the matter? What's wrong? Only this, Bill. My theory's proved itself right again. These reform school kids are no good. Now, just a minute, Cal. We've been friends a long time, but let me tell you... No, Bill. You let me tell you. You know there's a $2,500 payroll missing from the truck this kid was driving? Uh, no. You heard me. George, is this true? I don't know. I forgot about the payroll... It was in the truck when I crashed. That's all I can remember until I woke up here in the hospital. But I didn't take it. Please believe me, I didn't take the payroll. Honest, I didn't. I don't do things like that anymore. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's what they all say when they're caught in a trap. Cal, are you sure the payroll's missing? Absolutely sure. George Bruce, just as soon as the doctor releases you, I'm locking you up. You're under arrest for robbery. <laughs> fellas. Now let's get out and search the whole area around the smashed truck. We've got to find that money. Where that kid's had it if we don't. Yeah. Hey! This is gonna take some looking, young feller. There must be a thousand places that money could be. And every nook and cranny's been gone over already. Not true. Manila envelopes shouldn't be hard to find this time of year. Let's work out from around the truck into an ever-widening circle. Search for about 200 yards around. I don't know, Bill. It looks like money isn't here. I've got to make sure. Let's start all over again. Okay, Bill, you're the doctor, but we looked pretty carefully the first time. Yes, Tom, I realize that. 
The one place we didn't look on the first search may be just the place where we'll find it. Yeah, you could be right. Where are you all down, Sidewalk and Polecat, trying to fight me? With hey, Stumpy's in trouble. Let's go. Stumpy, what matter? What's your shoot? I shot this here sidewinded copperhead. Trying to use my hand for a pincushion, ornery critter. Look at the size of that copperhead. You don't see them that big usually. I'll say not. You were fortunate, Stumpy. They don't give any warning before they strike. Their body coloring perfect for this time of year. Yeah. Well, this one will have to get along without his head for the rest of his life. Come on, fellas. One more careful search, and then we'll head back to town. I want to go over to the jail and have another talk with George. <laughs> George, you're sure you're telling the truth? You wouldn't let me down, would you? Please believe me, Bill. I didn't take the money, and I don't have the slightest idea where it is. I guess you didn't find it either, did you? No, young fellow, we didn't. We didn't leave a stone, stick, rock, or log unturned. I'm certain now that the money's gone. Well, it looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Yes, George, I'm afraid it does look bad for you. All the evidence points one way. And the worst fact of it all is that only you and Frenchy and the paying teller knew you had the money. Oh, if only I hadn't been knocked unconscious. Yeah. Well, there's only one thing you can count on. Well, what's that? I believe you. And I won't rest until I find out where that money went. <laughs> Say, did you hear the story that's going around town about Bill Jefferson backing up the Bruce kid as being innocent in this lumberjack payroll robbery? Yeah. <laughs> I think that ranger's crazy. He'll only get himself in bad trying to defend that boy. Hello, Bill. Hi, Ed. How's the banker these days? Well, I'm fine. But I can tell you of one ranger that's not doing so hot. Huh? What do you mean? I mean this, Bill. You're way off base with the Bruce boy. He's guilty, Bill. And if you're wise, you'll drop the whole business before you get yourself in bad with the folks in town. Thanks for the advice, Ed. I believe the lad's innocent. I aim to prove it. Uh, how are you going to do that? Right now, I don't know. But I'm going to do it, and I will. <laughs> You know something, fellers? I'm just a mite bit worried about Bill. I think he's jumped on the wrong wild horse this time, and he's liable to get thrown. Mm, I think maybe you right, Stumpy. Now, wait a minute. Bill's never wrong about one thing, and, and that's his judgment of human nature. No, that's right. But, uh, young feller, a man has to be wrong sometime in his life, and I'm beginning to believe this is it. I'm afraid Stumpy right, Tom. After all, look how carefully we searched the area of crash and found nothing. George says he was knocked out all time until we got there. He could be stalling behind good excuse like that. No, I don't agree with you. There's some other answer to this whole thing. An easy answer, maybe. But where it is, I don't know. I don't either, Tom. But I'm going to find it. <laughs> now, Bill. Bill. Hey, how'd you get in here, Bill? I didn't hear the door open, and I ain't deep yet. I reckon you heard what we said. Yes, fellas. I can't say that I blame you very much. Only I'm sorry you don't have more faith in George. Well, I hope we're wrong, Bill. But it's beginning to look like George took the money. Hey! Carl, what's the matter? What's the matter? Look at this newspaper and you'll see what's the matter. Huh? Great Scott. Look at those headlines. They're really out to get me, aren't they? Well, you're the whole front page. Everybody wants to know what's wrong with Ranger Bill Jefferson. This proves it, fellas. Proves what, Bill? We've got to find that missing money. And remember, 
In this country, a man's innocent until he's been proved guilty. I don't want to make you keep going over and over this story, George. It's no more pleasant for me than it is for you. Sure, I know, Bill. You're trying to help me. Now, think hard. What little detail have you missed that might trip the answer for us? Um, start from the beginning. Well, let's see. Frenchie told me to go to town, and I called Blackie, and we got in the huh? truck. Blackie? And... Who's Blackie? You never mentioned anyone else in the truck besides yourself. Well, there wasn't. Blackie is the lumberjack's mascot dog. Oh, that's it. That's the clue we've been waiting for. You mean the dog might have something to do with it? Well, it's possible. But how would he... I don't know, George. I don't know anything. But I'm going to find out. I'm going to the lumber camp right now and have a talk with Frenchie's boss. You've got a lot of nerve, Bill. You and my big-hearted foreman. Why, if he wasn't so essential to my operation, I'd fire him right now. Not only have you been responsible for the loss of my payroll, but you want me to take part in some crazy harebrained stunt. Uh, well, you through ranting and raving now, Jim? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. What are friends for unless they understand one another, huh? You haven't hurt my feelings just because you let off some steam. I'm glad you did let it off in front of me because I understand how you feel. You really mean that, don't you? Yes, I do. Then that rates you my cooperation. Let's get the dog and make the test. Wonderful. Now, you say the dog has taken messages back and forth from time to time. Then this has got to work. Now, here's a manila envelope. Just like the one the bank teller put the money in. Okay, let's go. You get the idea, don't you, Jim? Just take the dog to the scene of the crash, put the envelope in his mouth, and see where he goes. Mm -hmm, if you want it that way. Sounds crazy to me. Here, Blackie. You got it? Atta boy. Great Scott, Bill. You may be right. He's heading right for the camp. What'd I tell you? But we still haven't got the money. Just be patient for ten more minutes. I think we'll have the answer to that one. Let's get in the car. Well, here we are, Jim. Bill, I can't believe it's that simple. Well, maybe not. There's a kennel right over here. Blackie? Give me that envelope, Blackie. Come on, boy. Atta boy, thank you. Well, there's one envelope, Jim. Ah, uh, that's the one we just gave him. It's empty. Yeah, I know. Blackie, the other envelope. Come on, boy. Bring it out here. Come on, boy. Atta boy. Well, Jim, there we are. The lost payroll. Bill, that's wonderful. Oh, the most beautiful $2,500 you ever saw. Jim, there's something more wonderful than that. The reputation of an honest boy. <laughs> You're free. And let me be the first to apologize for being a stubborn fool. It's all right, Sheriff. You were only doing your job, I guess. Come along, son. Let's go home. Sure, Dad. But just a minute, please. Uh, all right, son. Bill, I want to thank you for all you've done for me. You've proved to me that it pays to be honest and straightforward. You've shown me that the truth always wins out in the end.
You can't always believe the facts, can you, boys and girls? That is, not unless you're absolutely certain you have all the facts. Because one missing fact can throw the whole truth out of balance. We'll see you next week for more adventure with Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Hello, boys and girls. I've been thinking about the story I'm going to tell you today. In fact, I have several I'd like to tell because so many interesting things happen in a ranger's busy life. Well, I sure know what this story will be about. How'd you like to hear of the trouble I had with yo-yos and shot rotting? <laughs> Don't look so puzzled by the lingo I'm using. It's really on the up and up. All the trouble started when an elderly gentleman by the name of Ezra Newcomb decided to sell his property to an Easterner by the name of Todd Stone. In fact, we could start our story in the Naughty Pine Bank, where the business transaction took place. Hold on to your hats for the story, The Broken Promise. Ezra Newcomb, Todd Stone, Ed Banker, and their attorneys are sitting around Ed's desk in the bank. Ed has the legal papers spread out for the signatures of the two men. Ezra hesitates before picking up the pen. What's the matter, Ezra? I hope you haven't changed your mind about selling your ranch. No, I haven't, Todd. I gave my word that we'd make a deal, and my word's as good as gold. <laughs> well, that's fine. For a moment, I thought you had changed your mind. There's only one thing that bothers me. What's that? The drag strip. You sure you're going to let the youngsters use it after you own the property? Yes, it's part of the deal. If I thought for one second that you'd break your promise, I'd call this whole thing off here and now. You have my word that the drag strip will be left open for the youngsters to use. All right. I'm sorry now that we didn't put that in writing, but it's too late to draw up another set of papers. Where do you want me to sign, Ed? Right here on the first line, please. Put your signature on all copies. There you are. All signed. I hope you realize the property you've bought is the best ranch land around these parts. Put your John Henry on there, Todd. Hmm. On the second line? Uh, yes, on an all copies. Then I'll see you the paper is and you can endorse Todd's check, Ezra, and we'll get it in today's deposits. That suits me just fine, Ed. Well, from now on, I'm a man of leisure. No more getting up at four in the morning. That'll seem strange after doing it for nigh under fifty years. I guess it will. Well, I wish you the best of everything in your retirement. I'm leaving on the next plane for the east. My foreman, Lefty Roberts, will be out first thing in the morning to take over. That'll be mighty fine. The moving van's coming to move Ma and me into town bright and early. And don't forget your promise now about the drag strip. I won't. How can I? You won't let me. <laughs> No, what? Ezra sold his ranch to some guy in the east. Hoppin' toads. What about our drag strip? Yeah. Yeah. What about it? Hey, you guys, pipe down. 
Let's give Larry a chance to tell us a hot scoop. Go ahead, Larry. It's the truth, and also it's no secret. I read about Ezra selling his ranch in the afternoon paper. The deal was closed this morning. The paper's got a whole column about it. Did the paper say anything about the drag strip? Not a word, Shorty. Oh, oh now where are we going to test the zoom in our cars? I thought Ezra was our friend. Sure looks like he sold us oh, out. Oh, he's not our friend. Anymore. Don't go spouting off like a cheap carburetor, fellas. I think we should go out and talk to Ezra. Yeah, that's okay. that's a good good idea. idea. When are we going? Well, it'll have to be right now, Muff. The paper said that Ezra's moving off his ranch first thing in the morning. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go. Okay, Let's go. Come on. Let's go. I'll take you, Bill. Right. Oh, yeah. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Well, this isn't the usual time to come out here. You must have something on your minds. <laughs> well, we didn't come out to test our cars, Ezra. We came out to find out what's going to happen to the drag strip now that you've sold out. <laughs> yeah, what's coming I guess you've been reading the newspapers, eh? We sure have. What's the scoop as far as we're concerned? Do we still get to use the test track on Saturdays? Yeah, that's what, no, what do you say? Well, I should say so. The man who bought the ranch, Todd Stone, promised to let you still use the racetrack, just like you've done for the past couple of years. Hey, that's oh, right. 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 hey, you're really a solid fella, Ezra. Sure we is. thought you'd forgotten about us. Ah, uh, don't talk nonsense, Muff. How could old Ez forget about you youngsters? I'm sorry the ranch is getting too much for me to handle, but I wouldn't have sold it unless that Mr. Stone had promised to keep the drag strip going. Hey, you feel better now? Oh, yeah, we sure do, Ezra. That's all right. Right. You know, it always makes me happy to see young folks with joy in their hearts. I'll come out and watch you test the Zoom in your souped-up cars. Won't be often, but I'll come when I can. You let us know when you'd like to come out, and one of us will pick you up. Sure, anytime. You expect me to ride in one of those speed jobs? (laughs) We'll keep it down to a crawl. We'd like you to come out often. Anytime, Ezra. Well, thank you for the invitation. You make an old man's heart feel warm and pleased. Well, I guess I'd better get back in the house and help the missus with the packing. Okay, Ezra. And thanks for remembering us. We really appreciate it. That's all right. You just keep right on developing your mechanical genius on those cars, even if I'm not around to watch you. Well, goodbye for now. Bye, Ezra. Hello, Lefty Roberts speaking. Lefty, this is Todd Stone. Yeah, Mr. Stone. How are things? Well, Ezra's gone. The moving van pulled away about an hour ago. Boy, they sure left this place spick and span. I could eat off the floor. <laughs> well, that's fine. Uh, the furniture I ordered in Naughty Pine will be out this afternoon. I'm leaving here and uh, going on a business trip for several days, so uh, don't try to call me. You um, have all the arrangements made to take care of the stock? Yep. I got a couple good cowpokes coming out today and a top horse wrangler. Mm, Fine. I'm glad everything's going along well. I'll call you when I return from my trip. All right, Mr. Stone. Is there anything else? Not that I can think of, um... It seems as though I'm overlooking something, though. Um... Oh, yes. Uh, uh, close the hot rod track. Uh, the kids uh, call it... Um... A drag strip, uh... ain't it? Yes, that's it. Uh, close it off for good. Okay. Uh, the boys and I will sink some fence posts and put up a gate. Fine. Be sure and get it done before Saturday. That's when they race. Yeah, we'll take care of it. You just leave everything to me. That's what I'm paying you for. And it's good pay, too. Goodbye, Mr. Stone. Goodbye. Hey, you guys. Don't any of you get it in the head to make like a yo-yo and shot right out to the drag strip. You tell him, Shorty. 
We don't want any goofers in this gang. You guys That's can right, burn all sure. and test your Zoom when you get out there. How about right. the three new guys? This is their first time out to the drag strip with us. Uh, we'll keep an eye on them, Muff. I think they're solid kids, but we'll soon know if they're shot riders or not. Yeah, and if they are, out they go, right on their pointed heads. Our club's got a good reputation for safe driving, and I don't want it spoiled by a couple of goofers. Right. I feel the same way. Let's go. It's getting past time to start. Okay, guys. Let's roll. Look at the gate. Let's open it and go in. Yeah. Ezra said the new owner promised we could use the track. The gate isn't for us. I'll open it. Don't touch that gate. Who says so? I did. Who are you to tell us we can't go in? I'm the foreman on this spread, Sonny, and I say you can't go in. Yeah? Well, for your information, we were told we could go in, and that's what we intend to do. First one of you guys to touch that gate gets his face pushed in. (laughs) We don't know that he really is the foreman. I think he's a wise guy. Let's jump him. Hold it. We don't win battles with our fists. Well, what do you know, a kid with brains? Yeah, we're leaving, mister. But you had better be the ramrod of this spread because we got ways of finding out. That's right. Wise guys don't get far in this part of the country. Don't threaten me, buster. I'm not making threats. I'm telling you facts. We were promised the use of this drag strip. My boss didn't tell me about any promises. So go on and beat it, the whole bunch of you. When you see your boss, tell him we have ways of dealing with people who break promises legally. Let's go, guys. Uh, Where to? Larry, you, Muff, and I are going to see Ezra. He'll know what to do. Okay. Well, that's the whole story, Ezra. Of all the underhanded tricks I've ever heard of. That man told a lie right to my face and in front of witnesses, just so I'd sell him the property. I suppose he would have promised me the moon, if necessary, to close the deal. What can you do to help us get the drag strip back? Yeah, it's the only good place around here for us to test Zoom. I know. You let me see what I can do about this. may take a couple of days before I have an answer, but I'll let you know as soon as I do. Thanks, Ezra. In the meantime, I don't want you fellas to race on the streets or highways. Don't worry, we won't. We've worked a long time to get folks to look at us favorably, and we don't want all that feeling to go sour. Yeah, we'd only be hurting ourselves. We'll be waiting for news from you, Ezra. Yes, I can imagine. I'm anxious to get a hold of Todd Stone and give him a piece of my mind. too bad that the solid kids in the hot rod club have to suffer because of the carelessness of the three new members. Muff would say that a couple of yo-yos are shot running. Now, listen to the goofers burn would you? But Muff, Larry Shorty, and the rest of the lads in the club don't know that the law is being broken right now as two of the newcomers race through Knotty Pine and out onto the highway in the middle of the night. But there are some people who know... Right now, they're making plans to catch the shot rodders. Car one to O'Rourke. Go ahead, car one. There's a hot rod heading down the north road and trying to get out the highway. We can't possibly catch that souped up job. I understand. Don't be risking your necks trying to catch those wild men. Set up a roadblock on the highway right outside of town so they can't get back in. Right, we're on our way. Car three. Come in, car three. Car three to headquarters. Philip, me boy, take the old dirt road and cut around in front of the hot rod. Right. Now, don't be foolish enough to try and beat them. Take your time. They'll be racing up and down the highway, and when they get tired, they'll go home. That's when we'll put the squeeze on them. They'll find out the road's blocked front and back. I've got you, Sarge. We'll get them. While Pat scratches his Irish head in wonderment, another man tries to sleep but can't. Finally, the long night ends, and Ezra puts a phone call through to Todd Stone. Hello, Ezra. 
What's on your mind? Stone, why have you put a gate across the test track? <laughs> Is that what's bothering you? I thought it was something important. Well, are you going to answer my question? Well, it should be obvious why I had the gate put there. I don't know why you wasted your money to call me. I wouldn't worry about that. It's my nickel. But I'll tell you something you'd better worry about. What's that, Ezra? Your broken promise, that's what. And as far as I'm concerned, it's important enough to call to China if need be. <laughs> well, promises don't mean a thing to me. It's, it's what's in black and white that counts. I don't want those backyard mechanics on my property. They'd just be a nuisance. You made a verbal agreement, and you're going to keep it. If you don't, then we'll have to ask the court to make you. <laughs> don't make me laugh. There isn't a thing you or anybody else can do about it. Now, don't bother me anymore. I'm a busy man, and I don't go for sentimental nonsense. Please, Lord, don't let me hate that man and try to seek revenge. I most certainly can understand your anger, Ezra. Even my temperature is rising at the idea of Todd Stone not keeping a verbal agreement. Rising temperatures don't do a bit of good, Ed. What can we do about it? I don't know. I'd like to see that gate come down just as much as you do. But to do it legally, I, I don't know. If I weren't a Christian, I'd sue Todd Stone. He'd have to admit that he made the promise or perjure himself in court. And why let the fact that you're a Christian stop you from taking him to court? Because, my friend, I have a higher court to which I can take my problem. In fact, there isn't any higher court than the one the Lord presides over as judge. Well, how do you propose to take this matter to God's court? Through prayer. I think after I get through praying, I'm going over to see my young friend Bill Jefferson. <laughs> what can Bill do? Ed, I'm surprised at you for asking a question like that. <laughs> I guess you're right, Ezra. It seems it's hardly anything that Bill can't do. You said it. Don't forget, he's got the Lord on his side, too. Well, now I've said my piece. I'm afraid that the lads in the Hot Rod Club feel that I let them down. Well, you can't help it that the ordinary polecat didn't keep his promise. Maybe. But if I hadn't made such a blunder in my judgment of character, and if I had made this part of the written sale agreement, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, I don't know if you can draw that conclusion, Ezra. It appears to me that Todd Stone probably would have tried to wriggle out of keeping the drag strip open, even if it was in the written agreement. I don't think black and white would stop a man as unscrupulous as he is. Well, maybe you're right. But what can I do about this? Uh, that's plenty of good question. Anyway, you try to force him to open drag strip, he fight, and draw a fight out plenty long time. Yeah, Grey Wolf's right. Something's got to be thought up that'll make him act in a hurry. A big hurry. The fat's in the fire now. Huh? What do you mean by that, pal? Uh, Pat and his boys picked up a couple of yo-yos last night, shot riding through town and out onto the highway. Uh -oh. I told those youngsters not to go off half-cocked and get themselves into trouble. Oh, it wasn't the older club members like Shorty, Muff, and Larry and the rest of the careful drivers. The Speed Demons are the newest members in the club. Yeah, Patrick and his boys didn't try to catch them on the fly, did they? <laughs> not on your life, Stumpy. They roadblocked them. Ordinary car couldn't catch those souped-up jobs. One of the deputies figures the yo-yos were shot riding about a hundred miles an hour. Whee! That's what you call moving. Not for that them there jet planes, but it sure is for automobiles. Bill, can you help me with this? Uh, let me answer your question this way, Ezra. I don't know yet what to do to solve the problem, but I'm sure going to give it a try. While you're thinking, I'll be praying. You won't be alone there. Sonny, we need the Lord's help real bad. Uh, I think the pressure's perfect now in all cylinders. Larry, 
You're a genius with a high compression head. Hey, you talking about the head on his shoulders or the one on the motor? <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good, Muff. I'll say. What do you guys think about my idea of racing on the old mill road? I don't know, Larry. We promised Ezra we'd sit tight until this mess gets straightened out. Right, and I'm going to keep my promise. But the old mill road isn't used hardly at all during the day, and not at all at night. It's a good road, but everybody uses the new highway now. I don't see where that's breaking our promise. Oh, I don't know. We've got enough trouble now with the two goofers in the clink. I know, Muff, but the old mill road's deserted and way out of town. We can't drive fast on it anyhow. It's not a drag strip. We could post guards at each end just in case somebody comes along. Then we'll stop our cars and let them through. Well, maybe you've got something there. We don't all have to go at once, and we don't have to burn o. Just warm up our cars. What do you say, Muff? It sounds good to me, Shorty. If the law stops us and says no, then that's what it'll have to be. Right. We're not yo-yos. Hello, Ranger Headquarters. Bill Jefferson speaking. Bill, this is Ezra. Yes, how are you? Not so good. Oh, what do you mean? Pat and his boys spotted Shorty, Larry, and Muff crossing town in their hot rods. They followed them, and the boys are heading way out of town. You know where? No. Pat's going to keep following them. He says if we'll come out, he'd rather have us handle it, since the boys haven't broken any laws okay, yet. Okay, we're on our way. I'll stop by and pick you up in five minutes. Goodbye. There's Patrick's car up ahead. Oh, why's he stopped there? Uh, maybe Lance go to race on Old Mill Road, just around Curve. Yeah, you might have something there, Grey Wolf. Pull alongside Pat's car, pal. Where are they, Patrick? They pulled into the Old Mill Road, Bill. Oh, uh, don't tell me they've broken their promise, too. I don't think so, Ezra. They've got a lad standing guard where the road meets the highway. That's to warn anybody turning into the Old Mill Road. Sounds like they're out to warm up their cars, not burn them up. Uh, we'd better find out. Let's pull up to the road and have a talk with him. Right. You heard the man, Henry. Right. I'm sorry, Ezra, if you feel that we broke our promise. I don't feel that way now, Shorty. I can see that you mean well, and you're being as careful as you can. I'm sure glad you feel the way you do about this. We didn't want you to think we'd let you down. Like I've done to you. No, sir. We haven't even thought that since you told us Mr. Stone promised to let us use the drag strip. I think you fellas better give up the idea of using this road... This is a good road, but not good enough to test the zoom in your car. We're not going to test zoom or burn -o. We're just going to make warm-up runs, not speed. Well, I understand that you're not yo-yos and that you don't shot rod, but I'm thinking of your own safety. Suppose you blow a tire on a sharp stone going about 50 or 60 miles an hour. Yeah, I sure hate to see your cars end up in the junk heap after all the work you put into them. Yeah, I guess you're right. We'll go back to town. Just be patient a few more days, fellas. I have an idea how to get our promise-breaking friend to keep his promise. Great. That's so good. What are you going to do, Bill? First, we're going back to town. On the way in, we'll stop at the telegraph office. I'm going to send Todd Stone a message that'll have him out here pronto. <laughs> Larry, Shorty, Muff, uh, this is Mr. Todd Stone. Hello, Mr. Stone. Hi. Welcome to our shop. Hello, Mr. Do, Stone. Mm -hmm. Have a look around, won't you? Thank you. I will. I think you'll find that these lads are master mechanics, Todd. They build their own motors and carburetors. We've had experts out here from the automobile makers and... 
They've been amazed at what these young fellows are doing. They seem to know what they're doing. I'll say they do. Now, look at this carburetor here on the bench. You'll notice the special butterfly valves and the rest of the unique construction. You mean to tell me that one of these lads made this? I sure do. Here you see automotive genius in the making. These fellows haven't had any formal engineering training. They just read books, create the ideas. They make the parts, test them in the shop, then they try them out on the drag strip. Hot rodding isn't all speed, Todd. It develops mechanical ability. These lads know how to think and create. I guess they do. Look at this high-compression head. Why, it's a beautiful piece of work. Bill, I've just put a new gadget on my car. I'd like to show you and Mr. Todd how it works. Well, I'd be glad to see how it works, Shorty. Fine. Hop in and I'll take you for a spin. Okay. Let's take Todd home. Don't get any notions about my opening the drag strip. Perhaps you think that by taking me home, you can soften me up. We're taking you home, not for the reason you think. We've some business to attend to, as per my telegram to you. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> yes, well, all right, Shorty. You can take us out to my ranch. We want to take a look at the drag strip. But you park your hot rod outside the gate, understand? Oh, yes, sir. Hop in and we'll be off. <laughs> acting up. Why, that's my son riding the horse. He knows how to handle a horse better than that. That's not a bridle path horse he's riding now. He's riding a western animal with plenty of spirit and fight. It's a runaway and he's going right down the drag strip. Can you catch him? Like nothing if he stays on the drag strip. All right, let's go. Christ to the gate. Hey, what are you doing? Trying to save your son's life. Keep going, you've almost caught him. Slow down now. I'll jump on. Get closer. Hold it now. Pull away. Whoa, boy. Easy, fella. Whoa there. look pretty happy, Ezra. I hope I look as happy on the outside as I am on the inside. Seeing the youngsters testing the zoom on their cars again on the drag strip makes me real pleased. It makes us all happy, especially the hot rodders. What made Todd Stone change his mind? Well, he thought the ride he had in Shorty's hot rod was quite an exciting experience. He was also impressed by the mechanical genius of the hot rodders. Say, you never told us what you put in the telegram. Uh, whatever you say, it worked plenty good. I happen to think back about an agreement that Ezra and I had made some time ago. You're not talking about the drag strip acting as a fire lane, yes, are you? Yes, I am, Ezra. Actually, the fire lane should be closer to the forest boundary by about 300 yards. Ezra and I agreed that the drag strip could be the fire lane even though it wasn't right on the line. I told Todd that he didn't have a fire lane, and he'd have to get one made in five days. If he didn't, I'd serve a warrant for his arrest. You not serve warrant now, Bill? No, we have the same agreement as I had with Ezra, as long as the drag strip remains open to the youngsters. If he closes the test track, then I serve the warrant. And that's a promise that won't be broken. Well, there's more than one way to skin a cat, isn't there? And you can see why I made it rough on a man who refused to keep his promise. Ezra showed, too, that the Lord has ways of getting wrongs made into rights for those that love him. Well, see you next week for more adventure with... Rain! 
جان